So good morning, everyone. Welcome you all in second international e-conference on the theme DNA forensics. I, along with my co-host Kritika Mishra and Aarti Vasne, welcome you all in this second conference 2021 on DNA forensics. I request Kritika to read the aims and objective of this conference. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning to all the respected dignitaries and all the enthusiastic forensic learners. I, Pratika Mishra, on the behalf of International Association of Scientists and Researchers and all esteemed organizations, welcome you to the SIN International E Conference on DNA Forensics 2020. Thank you to each and every one of you being here with us today. We are very pleased to be able to welcome those of you that have been for a long time now, as well as those who are new to the connection. As per the request, I continue with the aims and objectives of the e-conference. Forensic science plays a very significant role in untying the mysteries in crime with the motive of creating a peaceful society, being the multidisciplinary effort that embraces several fields of science for the advancement of the justice system, and hereby forensic science is still actively identifying itself in the larger landscape of sciences. The International E-Conference is planned with a motive to welcome all the budding minds and professionals of numerous disciplines of forensic science, which also aim to focus on sharing ideas, techniques, and advancement through the eyes of admissions, research scholars, and experts contributing into forensics and taking it to a great height. Thank you. Thank you, Kritika. I also thanks to all my associate uh, organization and those who helped us for organizing such uh, conferences and connecting more and more people for uh, so by that we can enrich our knowledge related to the DNA forensics. I thank you, Rashtri Raksha uh, Sakti University, Rashtri Raksha Sakti University for uh, being an associate and active uh, involvement, National PG College Lucknow. University of Philippines Maklu for Evidence Foundation, Sketchcock Academy, International Association of Forensic Investigators, Federal University of Technology, and Falcon Bureau of Investigations. Thank you all for being uh, such an active uh, association with us. I welcome you all along with my organizing team uh, in this uh, DNA conference. I request Kritika. Uh, to, is, um, to give introduction about today's speakers, Kritika. Thank you, sir. Before we get started, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all of you who generously helped us to make this conference come together to become a success. Thank you so much. We have eminent speakers with us today in this virtual space to deliver such intellectual and informative talk for all the forensic learners waiting here. We have with us Dr. Ranjan Darsa, Tiffany and Roy Ma'am, Hanan Ahmed Alhunda Ma'am, Abby Joseph Sir and Dr. G. Goswami Sir. Thank you sir for taking time for us and giving, uh, giving your knowledge and sharing your ideas with all the, with all the learners waiting here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kritika. I welcome my chairperson. We have our, we have our esteemed chairing panel today. And with, with, with that, I, st with the I start with the discussion of our chairperson, Professor Mukesh Kumar Thakkar. Profe professor Mukesh Kumar Thakkar, sir, is currently working as a professor in the Department of Forensic Science, Punjab University, Patiala. His field of research includes forensic biology and serology, criminalistic, print, and crime scene investigation. He has been the head of the Department of Art Forensic Science in Punjabi University and also as a scientist in charge at Field Mobile Laboratory, Bulanshir District of Forensic Science Laboratory, UP Lucknow. He has profound organizational skills, which he has flown in organizing various symposium for, for faculty and police officials. He has contributed to John Billy Encyclopedia of Forensic Science and to the EPG Patshala Project and Academy Advisory Committee of the NHRD. He has, he has reviewed the book Indian Civilization and Science of Fingerprinting by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting Government of India. Thank you, sir, for accepting our, uh, accepting our invitation and here with us. We have 
we have our next chair person dr ankit shrivastava sir dr ankit shrivastava sir is really providing this service to dr ap jabhul kalam institute of forensic science and criminology bundelkhand university chansi in uh, india as, as an assistant professor he has 14 plus years of teaching experience and has award and has awarded a phd in the field of forensic science from bundelkhand university chansi he is a member of various renowned organizations such uh, such as american academy of forensic science indian society of forensic genetics and a reviewer in various organization yes he also has co-authored two books in the science during his 14 years of journey he has authored several research papers published in different journals uh, of national and international repute has been invited and visited various country namely us uk netherlands singapore thailand etc especially he has field of forensic dna typing forensic ballistic forensic biology and serology forensic chemistry and forensic anthropology thank you sir for accepting our invitation thank you kritika i request our chairperson to take over the session sir over to you mukesh sir and dr ankit shivasto sir okay thank you dr ranjit uh good morning to all first of all i would like to uh, congratulate and thank to dr ranjit and his team for uh, organizing an e conference on very very important topic uh, dna forensics which is a need of the hour and uh, definitely there is a lot of uh, deliberations are required on this topic and particularly to update whatever his app happening in the field of dna fingerprinting okay and also i would like to thank the organizer for giving us chance to chair the very very important session uh we i would like to invite the first keynote speaker dr hiran rajan dash he will be speaking on technological advancement in forensic dna analysis the need of the r and uh, and uh, he is uh, uh, just give a brief introduction about dr hirak ranjan dash is currently working as a scientific officer and assistant chemical examiner at at madhya pradesh fsl he he has completed his phd in life science from national institute of technology rurkela he has an uh, an outstanding research experience of more than 10 years on molecular biology and dna fingerprinting at nit rurkela institute of life sciences bhuneshwar and in national institute of cholera and enteric diseases kolkata he has examined more than 1050 forensic cases by the technique of dna profiling and there are number and numerous national and international research paper published under his name he has written seven books on various fields of biotechnology inclusive of uh, forensic dna analysis he is also considered as one of the pioneer in india to work as a uh, work on ngs ngs based forensic dna analysis so without without wasting time i would invite dr heren Eric Ranjan Das to present his talk keynote talk Dr Ranjan please thank you so much sir here uh, ranjan sir here ranjan das sir uh, session over to you sir good morning everyone dear participants and esteemed chair person thank you ranjit sir for uh, inviting me to this second international e conference on dna forensics based upon my experience i would like to share some of the recent advancements and technological advancements and how we can proceed with the current day forensic dna analysis in future so if we talk about forensic analysis of forensic practice or forensics 
it's all about comparison and the basic fundamental thing about forensic science is that we explore some characteristics first of all we explore the class characteristics class characteristics it is suggests the evidences that can only be associated with a group which is not a unique source similarly there exists some unique individual characteristics mm -hmm. such evidences that can be attributed to a unique source with high degree of certainty those characteristics are called as individual characteristics or unique characteristics coming to dna technology what we require is our prime aim should be individualization so we should go for individualization then how can we achieve individualization through dna analysis the basic forensic dna analysis workflow goes like this we have some forensic sample from those forensic samples first of all extract dna for the extraction of dna we may employ various techniques that may be a manual dna extraction technique or automatic or static dna techniques after extraction of dna we need to quantify it quantification can be of uh, many types we can employ agro gel electrophoresis we can go for uv visible spectrophotometer we can go for rt pcr based dna quantification also after quantifying we need a an optimum amount of dna for further analysis that is the purpose of dna quantification so after obtaining an optimum quantity of dna we go for pcr amplification we perform multiple pcr that share with you on my next slide after amplification we go for capillary electrolysis during this process of capillary electrolysis what we do we separate all the amplified products on the basis of their size as well as on the basis of their dyes that are associated with each and every dna fragment and finally we obtain a dna profile so my basic aim to explore and to share with all of you that at which level we obtain a unique profile at which point of time we call a dna profile to unique see we generally do in a routine forensic dna analysis we perform y chromosome str analysis in this y chromosome strs along with the y chromosome itself they are heard in petal linear linear so they are not unique they are the same the y chromosome str profile will be the same for all petalineal lineages in a population similarly if we talk about x chromosome str analysis though it is not associated with any lineage but cannot be considered as unique because you see the male individual any male individual it will be having only one x chromosome and the female it will be having two sets of x chromosomes so it can be either or or both so it can never be a unique if unique profile if we consider amplifying or analyzing x chromosomal profiles but x chromosome str analysis it is highly useful in sample limiting conditions such as uh, in the first instance of this can be very useful for identification of a disputed female child when mother sample is unavailable similarly for the disputed male child with father sample is unavailable uh, in the third case when the disputed female child with father sample unavailable and one more interesting fact about x chromosome str analysis is that if it is a female child where both the parent sample is not available by analyzing or by comparing comparing the x chromosome str profile of a female child with its paternal grandmother this can also solve the purpose of identification 
Similarly, we also go for mitochondrial DNA analysis. All of you must be knowing that mitochondrial DNA, it is inherited in the material lineage. So again, it cannot be considered to be a unique profile or unique characteristics. So now we came to know that monosomal and extra, extra nuclear DNA analysis that doesn't, uh, they never lead to individualization. So they can be considered as the class characteristics. So now the question comes when and which label we go for uniqueness or individualism. Here comes the role of autosomal STR marker. Screen is visible. So auto, when we go for autosomal STR analysis, all of you must be knowing there are many STR markers, autosomal STR markers at different chromosomal positions. And after PCR amplification and selective amplification of such DNA fragment, such number of chromosomes, we obtain a DNA profile. This is called an autosomal STR DNA. This is a representative image that I have given here. To understand the profile, I will share with you some of the uh, uh, terminologies. STR markers, these are STR markers. And uh, this, this uh, D3S1358, D8S117, and these are called as autosomal STR markers. The characteristics of these autosomal STR markers are polymorphic, they are present on all humans, and they are selectively neutral. And these are the alleles, these numbers, whatever you can see on the screen, on the respective STR marker, they are the alleles. These 14, 17, 15, 17, 11, 12, they are called as alleles. That, and the characteristics of these alleles are that they are co-dominant in nature. And it can be homozygous or it may be homozygous. There may be some common alleles, there may be some rare alleles. And it, uh, what do we consider when we talk about the genotype? See, this is the genotype. When both the alleles on a STR marker are put together, this is called as a genotype. This is individual allele, 10 is an individual allele, 17 is another individual allele. When both the alleles, 10, 12, are put together, that is called as the genotype. And when uh, all the genotypes of the STR markers analyzed are put together, they are called as the DNA profile. So now the question comes, whether the STR label, whether the allele label, whether the genotype label, or whether the DNA profile label, at which level we achieve uniqueness for the purpose of individualization. Now coming to the fundamental rule of genetics, which is uh, Mendel's first law. This Mendel's first law it is said that uh, each pair of alleles segregate from each other in the formation of gametes that may be a spermatozoa in the form of a oocyte. Half of the gene gametes, they carry one allele and the other half of the uh, gamete, it carry another allele. Similarly, if, if we consider about the second law of Mendel, the independent assortment, the segregation of each pair of allele is always independent of the segregation of other pair of allele during the formation of gametes. And this Mendelian inheritance of genes, they can be measured using the rule of probability. And when more than two factors are taken together, there comes the rule of product rule of probability. That means when the probability of two independent events, they occur simultaneously, the probability can be measured by, uh, by simply calculating the product of each of the individual probabilities. Coming, to, coming back to my previous slide, we have achieved this DNA profile. Now we have to calculate what is the random match probability of this DNA profile. If we consider frequency of the genotype, then Again, this is the basic fundamental rule of Mendelian genetics that to calculate the frequency of a genotype for heterozygous allele, for heterozygous genotype, we should calculate it as 2pq. For homozygous alleles, it should be calculated as p square, where p and q are the, are the allele frequencies. 
and for the calculation of random mesh probability of a dna profile so we need to go for the product rule product rule that means the individual uh, genotype probabilities they must be multiplied so after calculating and multiplying each individual genotype frequencies i found the random mesh probability of this uh, population of this dna profile to be 177 into 10 to the power minus 29 you imagine this value how small it is 1.77 into 10 to the power 29 if we compare it with the current world population current world population is around 7.8 billion that means at the level of at the magnitude of 10 to the power 9 and the current indian population is around 1.3 billion all of you must be knowing it so now see now imagine how discriminatory how discrimination uh, of a dna profile can generate so by considering all the statistical probabilities we have achieved such a value that can match nowhere to the current world population or indian population put together so this means the unique profile this is a unique profile which has been used for the purpose of individualization and it can be achieved only by analyzing autosomal stia analysis now see uh, if we analyze three loci then uh, the discriminatory power may be 1 in 500 individual if we increase the number of loci to 6 it may give you a resolution of 1 upon 200000 then as you keep in the number of loci the discriminatory power increases that is the basic rule but what next should we keep on increasing the number of str markers should that be our aim definitely not so what should be the criteria the criteria should be we should search for the quality str markers and which are population specific in nature for that all of you must be knowing that us it has a uh, recommended set of core str loci similarly Euro european standard it has some str loci recommended uk german interpol and china they have their recommended core str loci but what about indian population we don't have any of our studies which shows that which marker is more useful in our population which marker is less useful and which marker set is more useful in our population to assess the quality of a str marker any str marker there are some analyzed parameters uh those parameters may be total allele number in that po particular population total possible genotypes what is the homozygosity level what is the heterozygosity level, is the polymorphic information content besides that some forensic parameter paternity parameters are also considered when when examining a str marker parameters may be matching probability of that str marker or its power of discrimination a power of exclu exclusion if we consider about the fraternity parameter and typical paternity index this is this is the list of the 20 codis str marker this is this is the str markers and if we talk about the currently available uh, available kits that uh, kits and mostly uh, in all of the labs uh, throughout the globe they use either promega uh, fusion 60 kit or uh, global feller kit or pan global kit from sure id or investigator 24 plex kit so all these kits they are the new gen kits all are the six dye all work on six dye chemistry and they have the 20 codis str markers what i want to highlight here is that besides this 20 codis str markers those recommended codis loci all of them they have some additional markers what are they they may be pentadi pentai or ac30 and they are included in the kits but they are not in the list of recommended kits uh yes this is the this is the example of uh, str marker looks like and uh, here uh, we know they uh, they exist in the head and tail arrangement and in this example uh, there exist 12 gata repeats and uh, generally we use uh, 
for forensic practice, we use the STR markers. Those have uh, two to seven nucleotide repeats. They are in the genome. They occur on an average of around 10,000 uh, 10, nucleotides in the genome. They are very polymorphic. They are stably inherited, and they are well studied, very well studied. If we talk about again the those 20 recommended STR loci, these are the these are their repeat units, and they may be complex, simple, or compound. And if we talk about the repeat units, the repeat unit may be tetranucleotide repeat or nucleotide repeat, uh, trinucleotide STR repeats. I am talking about the 20 codis loci, those are the recommended loci. But I have already spoken about some non codis loci which are already there in the kit in the form of either penta D, penta E, or SE33. If we talk about penta D, is a pentanucleotide repeat. Similarly, penta E is also pentanucleotide repeat. But AC33, it is a tetranucleotide repeat, uh, repeat in nature, but it is it is a complex form of STR markers. So I uh, it formed on study where I compared the U of the pentanucleotide repeat and the nucleotide repeat. So for the example, I have given here uh, two tetranucleotide that is 2S, uh, D2S1338 and D19S433 and two pentanucleotide STR markers that is penta D and penta E. So when we compare these four markers, two repeat marker and two pentanucleotide repeat marker, you see this is the total allele number that observed in our population. For the, for the tetranucleotide repeat STR marker, we observe the total allele number as 11 and 17. 11, 11 and uh, 6. But for the pentanucleotide repeat marker, you see how the total allele number has been increased 17 and 10. And all the all of a sudden, when we analyzed other forensic parameters and paternity parameters, this pentanucleotide STR marker it shows huge increase or huge evidence value in the form of all the forensic and paternity parameters analyzed in this study. So now we have found that in our population, these tetranucleotide markers, those uh, have been included in the recommended set of loci, they work, but this pentanucleotide STR mark, they work even better. They have a huge evidentiary value, they have a huge power, they have a high heterozygosity content in our population. So we can, it can be considered to be more useful in our population. F when we analyzed all the forensic and paternity parameters of all the STR markers, you can see Penta E, AC33, FGA, D21, AC11, they have a huge power. They have a huge power in our in comparison to other STR markers which are recommended but not useful in our population. Then I performed another study to, come, uh, to uh, see which marker set is more useful. For that, what we, uh, what we did, we had some sets, set of STR markers. Those are commonly available in the, uh, in the those may be recommended or may not be recommended. So for this, this is the parameter on the basis of which we uh, grouped all the STR markers, commonly available STR markers together. Uh, for example, set one, we consider all the uh, STR marker and set two, we consider all the mass markers listed in expanded codes that is 23 mark, uh, 20 markers. Similarly, uh, for set 19, all markers which are having the matching probability of uh, less than 0 0.08, in that way we grouped uh, the marker sets in 19 sets. And you see, now you see the difference in our population. This is set three. Set three, what it says, it says all the 23 markers grouped together. It has, it has the total possible genotypes uh, label at 1.85 into 10 to the power 40 and 1.16 into 10 to the power minus 20. But two, another two marker sets, that is set 14 and set 17, you can see, uh, the value says uh, it is as 4.67 into 10 to the power 30 through and 2.50 into 10 to the power 30 pro, 34. But what I want to highlight here is that this is not recommended. 
what is recommended currently is that this set two that is the 20 crore str marker what is the value the value is 2.33 into 10 to the power 10, 33 whereas this uh, set 14 and seven, set 17 they are showing a huge value a higher value but the most peculiar thing about these two sets is, are that set 14 and set 17 is that they include only 19 markers whereas the recommended current currently recommended str sets it is says you must include 20 str markers that means now we can be pretty sure that we do not need no, uh, an increase, increased number of str marker what we need is that the quality marker they may be lesser in number and more suitable in our population uh, this this is the uh, this is the set of markers that is set 14 and set 17 we analyzed here. Here we included three good SSTR markers actually, Penta D, Penta E, and AC33. And uh, for this uh, study, uh, the marker sets which were found more useful, uh, the set 14 and set 17. In mm -hmm. set 14, what the, what was the parameter used? The parameter used was all markers with polymorphic information content is more than or equal to 0.7. In set 17, all the markers with power of exclusion then 0.50. Yes. Yeah, this is the publication based upon this study what we published uh, in this current year only. And one more aspect what I want to highlight over here, this is a common STR profile. Now see here is another marker besides this autosomal STR marker, all the kids they will be having some extra markers that is extra mining marker all of you must be knowing that is amylogenin. What the amylogenin shows, if it is shows only one uh, one peak, that means X, it is a female. If it is of X and Y of equal head, then it is a male. And if it is X and Y both with the, with the, with the, uh, with the imbalance, then it is a mixed profile. You see, this is a simple STR, autosomal STR profile with only X amplified. So what we can consider, consider it as a female profile. But now when we amplified a, a, uh, when we amplified Y chromosome, here you can, there is an amplification. Where from it comes? This is X, only X. That means it is supposed to be a, but here at the Y chromosome STR analysis, it is so a, that means Y chromosome is present. But another peculiar observation is, it lacks six Y STR markers. This six at this six point there was a deletion, but rest of Y STR markers they got amplified. Deletion uh, at D Y S five seven zero five seven six four five eight four four nine uh, four eight one and six twenty seven. So what is what is if we look into the literature? Amyl Y deletion. This this phenomenon is called as Amyl Y deletion, and it is a global problem. And if we look into the Y chromosome map, this is the amyl Y region actually. In this amyl Y region, in addition to the amyl Y marker, there are some others that is uh, DYS 570, 576458481. All these markers, they got deleted in addition to the amyl Y. In that process, all other STR markers, they get amplified, but these six markers, they do not get amplified in addition to the amyl Y. So uh, the event can follow such a path where both X and Y can be amplified or only X can be amplified, X can be amplified. This is a normal, this, in, in this phenomenon, this can be a normal female. In this, can, in this case, it can be a male with amyl Y deletion. Similarly, amyl X deletion can be found, both amyl X and Y deletion can be found, and female with X deletion in one chromosome, this can also be found. So in that way, we propose some alternative markers, sex-determining uh, sex mark, sex mark in addition to the amylogeny. You see, you can see uh, all the new generation kit, in addition to the amyl uh, marker, they have some extra, uh, extra sex-determining marker in the form of either DYS391, y -indel, or DYS570, or DYS576. Uh, but what we suggest is that 
there should be some alternative STR markers in the form of either DXYS156 or STS. What is the advantage is that you see amelogenin we do not have a control there. If it is a female, only X is amplified. If it is a male, both X and Y is Y are amplified. But in case of female, we do not have another control to ascertain that whether it is of whether it is uh, from pure female or it is from Asian in nature. So for that purpose, we can use, we can direct some other alternative markers in the form of either STS, SRY, TSPY, DXYS156, DYZ1, or ATHZ1. <clears throat> so after uh, talking all about these uh, points during my lecture, uh, the following takeaway notes I want to highlight that autosomal STR analysis is, a prefer is preferred for individualization over X, Y, or mitochondrial DNA analysis. With the increase in the number of STR markers, the resolution of a DNA profile increases. We should use population-specific markers uh, in the form of quality markers. And pentanucleotide repeat STR markers were found to be more useful over tetranucleotide STR markers uh, if we consider about our population. And three non codis STR markers, that is the PentaD, PentaE, and AC33, they were found useful in our central Indian population. And amyloid relation is a global problem. Addition of uh, DYS391 and Y indel only may not provide the solution uh, to amyloid deletion detection. Alternative sex determining markers such as uh, steroid sulfatase STS and DXYS156, they can be used for a proper diagnosis of amyloid deletion cases. Finally, uh, I would uh, like to quote, not knowing is always a blessing. It gives you ample of opportunity to feel that you know everything of this world, but knowing thing is always a pain. This leads uh, you to feel that how ignorant you are because you are in an ocean. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for uh, sir, for such a knowledgeable lecture. I uh, request our chairperson to give the yeah. conclusion about the such a wonderful lecture. Okay, <clears throat> Doctor Herak Ranjan, uh, it's a wonderful uh, lecture. We have uh, uh, enjoyed, or you can say, you have added to the existing knowledge that uh, some of the markers. Uh, which are uh, one thing is related with the Indian population that has not been fixed, but uh, time is there and, and we, we are feeling unfortunate, but at the same time, the fortunate that we have a scope for uh, fixing and uh, some of the marker which can be used to identify the Indian population. That is wonderful. And uh, you, you have also mentioned about the STR markers for solving paternity and particularly the 20 str and 14 and 17 group set is not included or but now they can be used for determination of paternity or solving paternity cases uh, by adding the three marker you have mentioned and you have also shared valuable information about determination of sex um, in addition to the amelogenin uh, markers so overall, it was wonderful and uh, all the facts, whatever you have pre presented with the uh, data, that, that is uh, great. We, we have learned a lot. I think uh, that will add to the knowledge. And uh, hopefully, we will have more studies on Indian populations and uh, definitely we will fix the STR markers which can be used to identify Indian population. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Thank you so much, sir. Now I hand over session to Kirk. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, it was really a very informative and intellectual lecture, and I'm sure the audience really enjoyed it. Now, on the behalf of entire organization, International Association of Scientists and Researchers, kindly accept our certificate uh, from sir for grateful scientific uh, contribution and, and invaluable insight as a keynote speaker on technological advancement in forensic DNA analysis, the need of the uh, International Conference on DNA Forensics. Thank you, sir.
Thank you, Kritika. Now I request Chairperson to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Ankit will be. Okay, thank you, sir. Our next speaker is Ms. Stephanie Ann Roy, uh, and her talk is in Emerging Technologies in Forensic DNA. So I request to all the speakers, because we have a limit of 30 minutes time, so please wind up uh, early because we have uh, lots of waiting and all. And Ms. Stephanie Roy is a forensic DNA expert with over 14 years of forensic biology experience in both public and private laboratories in the US. She holds degree from St. Croix University, Massachusetts School of Law, and the University of Florida in the areas of biology, law, and forensic science. She has processed thousands of DNA samples and thousands of cases over the course of her career. She has provided expert witness testimony in more than 100 cases in state, federal, and international courts. She instructs undergraduates at the University of Maryland Global Campus and Southern New Hampshire University. Roy is a member of American Academy of Forensic Sciences, the Northeastern Association of Forensic Scientists, and the Massachusetts Board of Bar Examiners. She is a certified diplomat in the area of forensic biology by the American Board of Criminalistics. She currently acts as a consultant for attorneys and the media in the area of forensic biology through her firm, Forensic Ed LLC. So thank you, Ms. Stephanie, for sharing your valuable time. I would like to invite Ms. Stephanie for her presentation. Thank you. Over to Ms. Stephanie. Uh, just give me one second, sir. I think there's some technical issue. Sorry, we are facing some technical issue from profiles that can be obtained from blood or semen um, that are very descriptive and that tell us a lot about the person who may have left their DNA behind at that location. Um, but then also we can get some low-level mixed DNA profiles that don't tell us a whole lot about who the person is that may have left their DNA behind or who, even whose DNA could have been transferred whose DNA is in that mixture at all. So uh, for some background about some of the challenges that we face when we're interpreting mixed evidence, you can take a look at this TED talk by Dr. Dan Crane. Um, I have the link here in, 
in the presentation. But the, the base problem here is how will we translate to the judge or the jury or whoever the trier of fact is in your system? How are you going to let them know which type of DNA profile you have in your case? Is it the type that's very strong evidence? Um, where we can say a lot about the person who left the DNA behind? Or is it a mixed profile that doesn't tell us a whole lot? Um, which end of the scale does that piece of evidence fall? Um, and we have to have some way of communicating this to the trier of fact. Is this good, strong evidence where we feel um, a high amount of confidence in the decisions we're making, or is this you know, not, so, not so good? So in the United States, we have used in traditionally uh, methods that were manual, where an analyst would make a visual comparison between the peaks in the evidence DNA profile and the peaks from a person of interest DNA profile, and just see where the consistencies were or inconsistencies were. Um, and sometimes that can work depending on the quality of the DNA profiles. If you have very clean DNA profiles with a lot of DNA, um, and they're not too heavily mixed and we don't have um, complicating factors like allelic drop-in or allelic drop-out, then um, you can look at a DNA profile and sometimes be able to tell the genotypes of the individual who may have contributed. But sometimes we can't tell that clearly. Um, in, in this image, I show a picture of a DNA profile that has some peaks where there is consistency with the person of interest DNA, but there is also some inconsistency. And we really don't know which scenario is correct to explain the evidence. Um, is, it, is it evidence that's appearing by chance? Um, or is this truly some similarity between this person of interest and the evidence profile? So with our manual methods, when we make comparisons, we would assign some type of statistical weight to the association. Anytime we say a DNA profile matches a person, or anytime we say a person is included in a DNA mixture profile, we have to attach a weight in the United States to be able to tell the judge or the jury if this is a strong association to that person or not so strong, and that many other people might also be associated. Um, traditionally, we use a quantitative estimate to give our associations using the random match probability, where we take the frequencies of the alleles that we find in our mixed profile, and we multiply them together to get the profile frequency. It's usually reported in language that says the chance that a randomly selected unrelated person will match this evidence is X. Um, we, for mixed evidence, we use the combined probability of inclusion. Um, and so that also uses the product rule and we take all the alleles that we see in the profile and we multiply the frequencies in any combination. So it's focused only on the evidence alleles that we see in the evidence profile and the chance that um, anyone could have any combination of those alleles. It's still reported the chance that a randomly selected unrelated person will be included. Random match probability is primarily used for single source profiles where the combined probability of inclusion is for mixture evidence. Um, and we've started to move away from those based on their, their uh, limitations. Um, the probabilities that we traditionally used do not address the uncertainty that comes with the DNA profiles we're obtaining now from very small amounts of DNA, from very complicated mixtures that come with a lot of uncertainty. Um, the random match and the combined probability of inclusion do a poor job of addressing the uncertainty that's associated with some of those profiles. So we can sometimes get over or under weighted evidence, and that's not ideal. Um, to address this, the field started to move toward the likelihood ratio to uh, assign a probability to the evidence and that's expressed as a likelihood of the evidence or the probability of the evidence given um, some set of hypotheses that we're going to propose. So we're looking at propositions that usually are mutually exclusive. And in general, we usually propose 
what is the likelihood of the evidence if the suspect is contributing to the DNA profile uh, compared to what is the likelihood of the evidence if a, a random person is contributing and see which one is greater. Um, so the limitations to these that I just described are that it doesn't account for the uncertainty that comes with low level mixed profiles. Um, when there's allelic dropout, it's not going to, the calculation can't take into account, you know, the probability of any other allele being there when we don't know what we don't know. We don't know what's missing. So we, we wouldn't really be able to properly address this missing information using um, random match probabilities. We have to be able to tell some genotype information um, when we're looking at a mixture in order to use a random match probability. So it's really limited to single source profiles or really clear major profiles. Um, and probabilities of inclusion have a lot of limitations. They don't address the low level data and the possibility of dropout. If we have mixtures of evidence that has related individuals in it, mother, father, child, um, or, or brothers, um, then this calculation cannot apply. It doesn't apply to mixed evidence where related individuals are um, present or, or believed to be present. It only calculates the chance of a randomly selected unrelated person also matching. Um, we need complete data. If we're missing data and we don't know what we're missing, then there's a high chance that we could overweight the association of the profile to the individual. And we are underestimating the percentage of the population that would also randomly be included. And um, this calculation also has to assume that all of the contributors in the mixture are from the same ethnicity. So in situations where that's not occurring, we can't use the likelihood, uh, we can't use the combined probability. The likelihood ratio, a binary likelihood ratio has the same types of limitations. It doesn't work with the same if the mixture has calculate, has uh, close order relatives in it. Um, it needs complete data and it also assumes that all the contributors are from the same ethnic background. But to overcome um, the, the limitation as to the uncertainty in the data about the contributors. Um, there have been software programs developed, and this one is from Australia or New Zealand. This is from the Environmental Science and Research um, in New Zealand. Um, so they've developed these software programs to address when we may be seeing dropout of peaks in a mixture, um, when, when we could be affected by drop-in. It's able to take into account probabilistically some of the uncertainty that we see in today's modern DNA profiles. So um, this program, StarMix, is one of the premier programs that's being used in the United States. Um, I would say it's the, major the majority of public government laboratories are using this program. Um, if they are using probabilistic genotyping software, this is most likely the one. Um, it uses computer alg algorithms to deconvolute mixtures and it makes adjustments for you know, uncertain data. It uses a mathematical algorithm called the Markov chain Monte Carlo in its analyses, which is a sort of hot and cold guessing game to model the data that's in the DNA profiles. Um, and it deconvolutes the profiles into its component parts and assigns likelihood ratio. It was developed, um, I, as I said, in New Zealand. And there's another program that also does something similar um, where it, it uses a computer program and algorithms to deconvolute DNA profiles. Um, this program is called the Trulial program. It's developed by a cyber genetics corporation and they're a company from um, the US and Pennsylvania. And it makes adjustments for our uncertain data as well. And it's a it's different than the first program because it wasn't developed by a government agency. It was it's a private company that developed this, and there are some privacy issues associated with um, some of the algorithms and the computer mechanisms. So it's, I don't know as much about it as I would know about the StarMix program. Um, but 
people who have developed the program, there's a lot online about it. They've made many videos and um, they have a lot of training material for free on YouTube and on the internet if you want to learn more about what the program does and how it can help with uh, your profile interpretations for mixed profiles. Um, Euroformix is a free open source software that is widely used in Europe. And it was developed by a grant from the EU. Um, so it's totally free. Uh, there, it also applies a likelihood ratio and it uses computer algorithms to deconvolute the mixture and break it into its component parts. It is able to make adjustments for the uncertain data where there might be dropout and it uses a maximum likelihood estimate, not the Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, that's used by the StarMix program, STRMix. Um, so this is important in the United States because we are required to give a, a statistical weight, an estimate of weight to the jury whenever we associate a person who can, you know, can or cannot be included to a DNA profile. So if we're going to say a person cannot be excluded, then we have to give a weight. If we say a person is included, we have to give a weight. If we say a person matches, we have to give a weight. So without that estimate of weight, the DNA profile comparison results would not be admissible in our court system. Um, and so we have some guidance, the international, um, there is some international guidance, ISFG, which is the International Society on Forensic Genetics. They published some guidance on doing this in 2006. Um, we have in the United States, our scientific working group on DNA analysis methods. They published some guidance in 2010 on doing this. And our accreditation bodies um, have also published some guidance requiring the need for the, the statistical weight to be associated. And um, for the purposes of what we're doing, mixture deconvolution, interpretation of mixed DNA profiles tends to be very subjective if we're not using these computer programs. So the use of these computer programs to aid in the interpretation of the DNA profile is a much more objective analysis for mixture samples that can help prevent some errors. There are some limitations to the programs um, where it underperforms um, what, you know, maybe even a human could do. Um, so it's very important to understand what those limitations are, but it's a very helpful tool to assist in the interpretation of complex DNA mixtures and also to assign statistical weight to any matches or inclusions. Um, another interesting development in our forensic DNA system here in the United States is the use of genetic genealogy to solve crime and to identify um, unidentified remains, previously unidentified human remains. So this involves, um, you know, searching through private databases that are, have accumulated from private companies doing DNA testing like 23andMe and Ancestry.com, the type, that type of testing to demonstrate one's ethnicity, um, health screening, um, things that are available to the general public through that kind of testing. One thing I would want to point out um, is that the type of DNA testing that's being offered by some of these private companies who, who are involved in genealogy is not the same type of DNA testing that we use in forensics um, presently. So presently in the United States, we use short tandem repeat testing. And this is looking at short segments of DNA that has code that repeats a variable number of times. Um, these pieces of DNA are usually about two, three, four hundred base pairs long. Um, it's referred to often as junk DNA and that it's not been linked to any disease um, inheritance. We really don't know what the STRs, what the purpose of those non-coding regions are. So they're not affiliated with anything that might uh, reveal any private information about a person except for this unique identifying code. It's not linked to any physical appearance, health information, or ancestry. Genealogy testing is linked to that. So it's actual sequencing, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Um, and some of the providers of this 
type of uh, analyses. Parabon Nanolabs is a company that contracts out the testing um, for genealogy and for phenotyping, um, and they use the Illumina and Finium Cytosnip feed chip for their SNP testing. So this type of testing, the SNP testing needs a larger amount of DNA for the chip. Um, the call rates for the actual SNPs can be low and it's not the best for samples that are degraded. So when we're going back to some of these cold cases, they're finding that they're having difficulty um, in getting all of the profile information that they need for the genealogy stuff searches. Um, it contains approximately 850,000 empirically selected SNPs, and these are located throughout the entire genome. Also, uh, as opposed to the SNP chip test, you can opt for whole genome sequencing of the evidence profile information. So you can take your piece of evidence that has um, the DNA that you're interested on it and send it to a laboratory that can sequence it. Um, and then you need a bioinformaticist to go through and mine the data that you're going to be using to upload to your genealogy database. There are several labs that perform this testing here in the United States. I have them listed here. One of them's Ophrom, one of them's Hudson Alpha. This type of whole genome sequencing is actually beneficial for the older samples, highly degraded samples. So it needs less input DNA and you get more information from degraded samples if you whole genome sequence rather than SNP chip. Phenotyping is looking at the SNPs and trying to derive physical information about the person who left the DNA behind from the single nucleotide polymorphisms. And so some of these SNPs have been associated with hair color, eye color, and skin color. Um, Parabon Nano Labs also asserts they can tell other information about face shape and freckles and um, you know body mass, things that you know are less well understood in the field and have less of a scientific foundation for. Um, but there is a scientist who also performs um, the three um, really well understood SNPs for hair color, eye color, and skin color at the University of Indiana at Purdue University. Her name is Dr. Susan Walsh, and she provides SNP testing um, for free for individuals who need that for their cases um, and subsequent genealogy searches. So the difference now is that in these genealogy investigations, we are focused on um, private databases, and we're using DNA information that contains a lot of sensitive information about the person. Um, so it can give us information about their relatives. It gives us information about their ancestry and their hair color and their eye color. So it's, it's more sensitive data. We, for the genealogy investigations, um, we search different databases. So for our government and STR testing database, it's called CODIS, and it's maintained by the federal uh, Bureau of Investigation um, and each state. And so in order to have someone's DNA profile put into our government database, there are laws that require that when someone is arrested or convicted, they have diminished privacy rights. And so we enter their DNA profile into our government database. They don't get to decide whether they want to participate or they don't. Um, we just take their DNA once they violated the law and we put it into our database. Um, and they can't opt out or they can't remove their data. But in contrast, these new genealogy searches that we're performing with the SNPs, um, those are on privately controlled databases. One of the larger ones is owned by a company called Verigen now. Um, and this is consumer driven. They put their DNA profiles in there to search for their relatives or to learn more about their ancestry. Um, and there aren't any laws or regulations regarding government access to those privately held databases where people voluntarily take part in them. Um, private citizens are, have full privacy rights. They haven't violated the law. We don't force them to put their DNA into these private databases. The participation is voluntary. 
and the consumer can opt out and remove their data at any time. So I know I mentioned 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Those companies do not allow law enforcement access to their databases at this time. Um, the only ones that allow law enforcement access are um, what's called Dead Match, which is owned by Verigen, and Family Tree DNA. Um, that's a database that has a working relationship with the federal government. Um, and you can take your DNA profiles from 23andMe and from Ancestry, and you can enter them into these searchable databases if you wish to, um, you know, they call it opt-in. If you want to assist law enforcement in these types of investigations, and private individuals can opt into these databases. Uh, it was most recently used in a, in a well-publicized case. I know this in 2018 was the DNA hit of the year. And um, the Golden State, State Killer is a prolific rapist and, and murderer that was active in the 80s, late 70s and early 80s um, in California. And through the search of uh, the DNA of some of his relatives, we were able to identify the DNA profile from some of the crime scene samples as belonging to this person. So they investigated, um, you know, some people that had close relations and demonstrated um, genetic linkage to him. And then they looked to see in his family tree and in his family line, any individuals who could have fit the profile. Um, and then they investigated those individuals and took their DNA, performed STR testing to compare to the crime scene evidence. So this is an area of forensic science that's really up and coming. Um, we're really waiting to see how this will be used and what regulation it will be placed on this type of investigation and what types of privacy concerns um, the government's going to express, um, you know, constitutionally. So we're really waiting to see if it's being used. It's been used in many cold cases and it's generating many leads. It's, you know, I, at least once a day I find an article in the newspaper about a new case that's been cracked by this forensic genetic genealogy searching. So definitely in the United States right now, the two most emerging technologies are the genealogy searches and um, probabilistic the use and um, employment of probabilistic genotyping software to interpret mixed DNA profiles and help us to overcome some of the limitations with that. So. Um, these are the two emerging topics I wanted to present to you here today, of sort of where DNA is going in the US, forensic DNA. If you have any questions about any of the information I've presented during this talk, I encourage you to send me an email. My email is listed on this last slide. It's tiffany.roy at gmail.com, and you can feel free to um, reach out and send me an email with any questions you might have if you should want some additional information about these. Um, these technologies. So thank you very much for your time and thank you for the opportunity for me to present here today to you all and have a great day. Thank you so much Tiffany ma'am. I'm sure this lecture is really uh, really informative and all the DNA enthusiastic learners in the conference present here must have enjoyed every single uh, every single topic you have covered in your presentation thank you so much ma'am i i am really i'm really i'm extremely excited to listen to your uh, session even from even from here itself i request uh, mukesh sir to give a concluding remark for tiffany ma'am sure thank you so uh, she has uh, shared very very crucial information with the audience on emerging technology in forensic science. First of all, she has emphasized on the DNA profiles created. Uh, they are not equal. That is the uh, first thing. And then further, she has elaborated on random matching probability, combined probability, and livelihood ratio, which are very, very important topics. And uh, uh, without, the, without which we cannot give uh, uh, opinion on DNA, which is very, very important. And she further uh, elaborated on uh, basically 
हर टॉपिक वॉज रिलेटेड विद द मिक्सड प्रोफाइल केसेस ऑफ डीएनए तो हाउ टू जनरेट हाउ टू सॉल्व द मिक्सड प्रोफाइल्स ऑफ डीएनए एंड एंड शी हैज आल्सो एम्फेसाइज ऑन द टू प्रोग्राम्स पर्टिकुलरली एस टी आर मिक्स एंड ट्रू अलील and then she talk about uh, genealogy which which is how it is different than the str so she has elaborated on that and and finally she has uh, elaborated phenotyping and proper parabon snapshot which is a uh, upcoming technology and and then she uh, finally concluded with the genealogy database and privacy so it is really information for us that uh, in usa beside government even the private companies are uh, storing the data and and i think that is a good thing about that is that uh, they can be used to find out the ethnicity if required so wonderfully we enjoyed a lot and and definitely it was very very informative and hope uh, these things will be useful in the future also thank you very much thank you so much sir now i request if ni ma'am to accept our uh, our gratitude in the form of certificate of excellence for your grateful scientific contribution and invaluable insight as a keynote speaker on emerging technologies in forensic dna at second international e conference on dna forensics your appreciation plays a significant role in enriching the knowledge of the participants thank you so much ma'am thank you so much kritika now i request our chairperson to introduce our next speaker sure uh, our next speaker is hanan ahmed almula she will be talking on rapid dna analysis validation of ace and intel rapid hit hd id sorry so another interesting talk uh, let me introduce uh, uh, hanan ahmed um, uh, almula is a she is a forensic dna expert at dubai police she attained her bsc in biotechnology from the university of sharjah in uae and her msc in bioinformatics from the university of birmingham uk she is currently a member of dubai police scientist council and arabic uh, speaking working group offer on forensic science uh, international journal for genetics working on uh, genetic research and development developing procedures that would serve the industry in the united arab emirates so i would request uh, hanan ahmed almula to please uh, share his uh, her valuable uh, talk with us thank you so much sir ma'am over to you Hello everyone. Um I'm very delighted to be here. Um as you've mentioned my name is Hanan Ahmed Almula. I work with uh, Dubai Police as a uh, DNA um forensic analyst and today I will be sharing my uh, validation study of the rapid hit ID system by Thermo Fisher for rapid DNA analysis. Uh Uh, and two of its available systems so we have ace for the reference buckle samples and then we also have uh intel for evidence samples so my presentation will be split into two main parts first i will give a basic introduction on the instrument their software and uh the basic setup and use of the system and then i will go into the results of the validation for both uh reference and case work samples So let us start by answering the question of what is rapid hit ID system. So basically it is a rapid DNA analysis workflow. So instead of working for a couple of days in your laboratory to analyze a forensic DNA sample, what you can do with this instrument is only spend 19 minutes or 1 hour and a half uh to do it to get the profile. And on top of that it is a fully automated system. It is very user friendly. It is already uh, FBI approved and also approved by the National DNA Index System or the NDIS. And the chemistry that it uses is Global Filer Express, which is already the chemistry that most laboratories around the world use. 
And as you can see in the picture here of our setup, uh, the setup is very um, simple. You can do this not only in a lab, but also in an office, for example, in a police station on any desk surface. On the left hand side here, you can see the instrument and it is very compact. It does not take a lot of space. And in addition to that, you have the laptop that has the softwares that you require. And you turn on the machine only once, which is when you install it in your place. And then after that, you can leave it open for 24 hours uh, day after day. And to show you clearly how to use it, I have a demonstration video here. So the machine is already turned on for you. And then the first thing you will do is log in with your credentials. So this can happen with um, uh, by many things. So first of all, you have biometrics. There is a fingerprint scanner at the bottom of the screen here. And on the top of the screen in the corner, as you can see here, there's a camera for facial recognition. And you can also use the keypad in the screen to enter your PIN number or your password. And then you take the sample that you want to take. In this case, it is an example of a reference buckle swab, which means that the cartridge that you will use is ACE instead of Intel. And uh, the next step is that you want to enter the name of your sample. So again, you can do this e either using the keypad on the screen by manually typing the name of your sample, or you can use the same camera to scan the barcode that you have in your sample if you have one. So this is the ACE cartridge. You close the lid and then for both ACE and Intel, you insert it into the same slot here in the machine. And then immediately the 90 minute timer will start. You can come back after one hour and a half. And then when you come back, you will see a very primary result. So on the screen here, you will see a, a green tick if the profile was successful, the run. So that, that means you will have a single sourced, well-balanced um, profile, full profile. If you have a yellow tick, that means that the profile is there. It just needs um, uh, some minor reviewing by a forensic expert. And if the fail had, uh, and if the run had failed, you will see a red X. And comparing this workflow to the normal DNA analysis workflow, it is very compressed. So in the cartridge itself, you have tiny chambers and spaces where the PCR and cell lysis solutions are present. So these happen here. And then in the primary cartridge at the bottom of the instrument, uh, the DNA fragment detection happens here. And the primary cartridge is enough for about 100 runs already. So these are the two ACE and Intel cartridges. You can see that um, from the get-go, they look very similar. Uh, they're only color-coded with different labels. And this is very convenient because this means that you can use for any types of sample that you have the same instrument. The ACE works with reference buckle swabs and the Intel works with um, evidence items of abundant amount of DNA, which includes basically blood and saliva samples, such as blood stains, cigarette ends, swabs from drinking containers uh, and chewing gum, in addition to other abundant DNA uh, evidence items like face masks and uh, hair. And also um, some studies worked with bones and profiles were good as well with that. So let us talk about the two softwares that come with the Rapid Hit ID system. So first of all, you have the Rapid Link software, which is a data management software. And for example, if you have access as an administrator, what happens is that every single instrument in your region, um, the information for them will be centralized to you. So in this screenshot, you can see here the Rapid Link software, you can see a map that is similar to Google Maps where every single instrument that is connected to you uh, in your specific region or area is pinpointed on the map. And you can see which user has access to which instrument and you can edit that if you want. You have the bar graphs at the bottom of the map here that shows um, the total number of runs per instrument or per day. And you can track that. 
And uh, on top of that, if you're a forensic um, uh, expert and DNA analyst, you'll have access to four applications that are present in the software, which you can see down here below. And this enables you to do many things with the samples that you have just run in the instrument. So first of all, you can do, uh, if you have a database that you uh, that is connected to your system, you can do match searches, you can do staff elimination if you have a staff elimination database. What you can do also here is familial and kinship analysis between the samples that you have run. And what's also very useful is that upon request, you can very quickly and very simply produce a final PDF report containing the results and the statistical figures of the analyses that you have requested. And the second software that we have is the gene marker software. So again, you will have access to this if you are a forensic uh, DNA expert. And this is basically equivalent to the gene mapper software that is used with uh, most um, capillary electrophoresis instruments that is used around the world. And because they are equivalent and very similar in use, this makes the gene marker HID software very simple to use. Of course, between the two softwares, there is some slight differences um, uh, in some vocabularies, for example, um, out of ladder and out of bin and other things. And uh, so when you have access to this software, you can liken gene mapper, look at the raw profile, you can edit the profile, you can interpret and print the profiles that you want. And Again, this is not accessible to the basic user who, for example, works in the police station, who has the instrument on his desk, who is not really authorized to interpret or even see the profile. So in both softwares, you have a very good level of user management and accessibility. A very good way to summarize this is by using the expression sample and profile out system because it is that easy and really the hands on time as an employee there is one minute or even less. And I have here a series of photos just to recap everything that I did in my lab. So first of all, you log in using the pin code and then you enter using the keypad the name of your sample. And then you put your swab into the cartridge, whether it is ACE or Intel. And as you can see here, you want, uh, in this example, I have a cotton swab with a wooden stick. And what you wanna do is you wanna cut the stick to fit the entire length of the chamber because the solution for cell lysis and PCR goes into the swab from the bottom. So when it does that, you don't want it to push the swab away from the solution. You want the solution to be integrated into the DNA sample. So you do that and then you can close the lid and then you insert it into the slot the timer will start, you come back after one hour and a half, and then immediately in the rapid link software, you will see that your sample name is um, listed along with your previous runs. And then simply by clicking on the name of your sample, the gene marker um, software will open up immediately showing you the profile that you have. And that concludes the uh, instrument, their software and how to use and set it up. So now we have a four hour validation experiment for, the, for both ACE and Intel systems. We have our preliminary results and we can start by looking at the uh, reference buckle samples. So we had 35 samples uh, from 19 donors. We did notice that one of the donors gave two samples that um, showed some outlier behavior. So we excluded one of them because the system I personally did for this is that I let them take the swaps by themselves rather than me doing it. Uh, and right off the bat, you can see that the results here are quite good. So for each marker, what we did is we looked at the peak height ratios. So we looked at how balanced the two alleles are for each marker in all of the samples. And we can see that the, they range from 78% all the way to 92%, which is a um, very excellent result because if you compare that to the cutoff that um, most laboratories use for their normal DNA workflow, which is 60%, you can see that this is uh, very much above it. The maximum peak height ratios range from 98% to 100%. And if you look at the minimum uh, peak height ratios, you can see that out of all 20, uh, 22 loci, only four showed at least one sample that uh, had a slight imbalance at around 50%. 
We also calculated the peak height ratios uh, in addition to the average peak height this time per sample. So you can see it for all of our 35 samples. Here are the two that showed um, uh, some outlier behavior. And uh, also you can see that similarly, the peak height ratios are quite high compared to the 60% uh, cutoff. So here you can see it's between 75% to about 90%. And the majority of the data for the average peak height goes between 500 RFUs and 3,500 RFUs. And these, if you compare the 90 minute uh, rapid DNA analysis, to the normal workflow uh, that include, includes many detailed steps, this is actually um, quite good results. And uh, seeing the profiles that I've uh, run in the system, uh, the profiles were very, uh, very good. So um, I do want to note that I tried to work with refer reference blood samples, but no profile showed up. So uh, the ACE samples uh, with the rapid hit ID system shows very promising results for the uh, reference samples. And then now we can continue to the Intel casework samples. As I've mentioned before, they are uh, recommended to be used on saliva and blood containing evidence items. So we did that for both instances. In saliva, we worked with cigarette ends, drinking uh, containers, including plastic water bottles and soda cans. For the chewing gum, we tried two things. We tried to either take a swab from the gum or cut a piece of the gum itself and put it into the cartridge. For the blood samples, we tried blood on different surfaces, blood stains, so wood, tile, cement, uh, tar road. And then we also did it on uh, fabrics. And with the fabric experiment, we uh, included a lot of variations. So first we um, compared cotton and denim. Uh, the idea behind this being that theoretically denim has the indigo dye, which is an inhibitor. We also tried two microliters of blood versus four microliters of blood. And then we also, like in the case of the chewing gum, either cut out the fabric itself and put it into the chamber or we took a swab of the blood and did it. And I do have to mention that the rapid hit ID system um, for the Intel casework samples is not yet recommended to be used on touch samples because even with the normal um, workflow of the DNA, we know that there are much weaker and more challenging samples to produce a full profile uh, for, but nonetheless, I still tried it. Previous studies uh, on other version, versions of the Intel samples worked with CAPS. And I also did personal items here, but I had several criteria to choose the personal items to work with the rapid DNA uh, analysis. So first of all, these items are personal, meaning that you would not expect a, mi a mixture to be there. You would expect it to be a single source profile. And the other criteria is that um, it is used frequently so that compared to other touched items, you would have uh, more amounts of DNA on that. And these personal items included a leather strap of a watch that was used for two weeks, a laptop uh, keyboard, a computer mouse and a mobile phone. So here I have collected for you some pictures that I used um, with the different evidence items. So if you look here, these are the uh, pieces of paper cut from the cigarette ends. And to weigh them down to the bottom of the chamber, what I did is I used a lancet, which is basically a small needle with a plastic grip just to weigh it down to the bottom where the solution can reach it. And then we have the piece of gum here weighed down by its own weight. And this is the um, blood experiment on the different fabrics. So we have denim and cotton, we have two microliters, we have four microliters, and then we either took a swab, for example, to bypass the, inhibit, the inhibition that you might find in the indigo dye, or we took a cutout of the fabric itself. And as you can see here, um, similar to the cigarette ends, I uh, used the lancet to weigh the fabric down to the bottom of the cartridge. The blood stain samples included those that were on tiles, on wood, on tar road, and on cement. And the one on the road, I just let that um, 
uh, quickly dry under the sun for only about 20 minutes. Okay, so let us start by looking at our results that we had for the drinking containers with regards to the saliva samples. So right off the bat, when you compare the results of Intel samples with the reference A samples, what you can see with the Intel is that you have a much greater variation in the data. So for example, here for the drinking containers, we had, as mentioned before, soda cans, three of them and three plastic water bottles. And you can see that the um, uh, PCAT ratios average between 25% and 100%, which is a great variation. And the uh, peak heights, uh, peak height average uh, went from about 1,000 to about 3,500, uh, which uh, generally showed uh, good profiles. But again, you can see the variations that is present here. And these are the results for the chewing gum. Again, we had three pieces of the gum itself, and then we had two swabs that were taken from the pieces of the chewing gum. Um, you can see that the same variation is present, but if you actually look closely at the data, you will see that um, the samples that have most of its markers above the 60% cutoff is actually the piece of the gum itself and that the data points, uh, the majority of the samples that go under the 60% cutoff is actually uh, the swabs that are taken from the chewing gum. But even with this uh, variation, you can see that the um, uh, uh, average peak heights are still good. So it goes from about 1,000 to about 6,000 RFUs with some variation there. And if you split the data uh, more appropriately and compare, for example, the way we lifted the DNA from the gum, so if you have the swab here versus the piece of gum, you can see that uh, it is definitely much better to run the piece of gum. And the reason I did this comparison is that I heard that some laboratories would rather take a swab from the gum just to bypass some of the inhibiting chemicals that could be present in the gum itself. And you can see that for the pieces of gum, the RFUs go from around 2,000 to about 9,000, and that the variation is not even that big. Okay, so for the cigarette ends, um, for, in my personal experience, the cigarette ends showed the most unpredictable and the greatest variation in the data compared to all evidence item types. And I don't think it is, so as you can see here, it goes from about 20% uh, to 100% with regards to the peak height ratios. And you can see the variation that is present uh, in the average peak heights, even though generally the peak heights are good, starting from above 1,000 RFUs. But I don't think it was because of the nature of the cigarette ends itself. Uh, it was challenging for me to place the, um, samples properly into the chamber because I had a challenge of getting a big enough piece of paper from the cigarette end that would contain enough DNA in it, but at the same time be small enough to uh, be put properly into the chamber. And I think that is where the challenge comes from because I've heard that other labs used different methods of uh, inserting their samples into the cartridge and their, uh, and their results were a bit be better than mine. And the way I got my results here is that in some instances, for example, the orange data point here, we had a very good full single, single source profile that, is, uh, that has its markers above 60% with the peak height ratios. But for some profiles, the, uh, the markers looked pretty weak with regards to its peak. But even with this variation, you can see that the um, average peak heights are still very good. They go above 1,000 to about uh, 3,500 RFUs. Uh, caps showed good profiles as well. So these are the uniform caps. Three of them were cloth, one of them was leather. So they are basically used five times, uh, five days a week, uh, hours on end. And um, most of the data, as you can see, also lies above the 60% cutoff. There is um, relatively some variation in the data, but the peaks are still good going uh, from above 2,000 to about 6,000 RFUs. And these are the results for the touched items. So like I said, the touched items are not really recommended yet for use with the Intel samples. Um, uh, I chose 
things that is frequently used and expected to show a single source profile, as you can see here. Um, uh, but we were still actually very surprised to see that we had a lot of partial profiles with attached items, which was something that was not expected. And you can see that the variation here is not even as much. And the RFUs go from uh, 500 to about uh, 1500 RFUs. And there is a great variation of um, range in the peak height ratio going from about 20% to 100%. But what this actually showed us was that um, the Intel sample in the rapid hit ID system shows very good future promise to be used with touch items, especially with future development uh, on uh, specifically the touch items of evidence. Okay, now we can go to the blood on the fabric. So you can see here that also there is a variation in the results with the peak height ratios and also with the average peak heights. But again, this is because with the blood on fabric, we uh, used a lot of variation with the conditions. So we had two microliters of blood, four microliters of blood. We had cotton and denim. We took a cutout of the fabric. We took a swab. And that is why you see the variations here. Uh, it's good to know that even with the variation, the RFUs go from above 1,000 to about uh, 2,500, which is still good. And here is a more informative comparison. So if you compare the blood samples taken from cotton versus denim, you can see that there is really not much difference, which means that the system did not really um, uh, suffer from any inhibition from the indigo dye that comes with the denim. And similar to the chewing gum, if you compare using a cutout directly from the fabric placed into the chamber and taking a swab of the blood, you can see that it is much better to use a cutout. You can see that the RFUs go from about 1,000, excluding the uh, male alleles, to, about, to above 3,000 RFUs, and that the variation in the uh, data is not um, even that great. And with regards to bloods on surfaces, uh, they showed very, very, very good results as well. So generally with all of the um, evidence sample types, blood with regards to Intel samples showed the best and most reliable results, especially those on surfaces. So you can see here that the majority of the data for the peak height ratio um, falls above the 60% uh, cutoff. Uh, the five markers that show a single sample um, uh, with um, a peak height ratio slightly below 60% were actually the ones on cement and roads, so they're more exposed to outdoor environment versus the tile and wood. And you can see that the um, peak height, the average peak heights were uh, relatively higher. So it goes from about 1000 to about uh, 4500 RFUs with little variation in the data. So to conclude the study with regards to the Intel samples, what we can say is that um, as, as uh, recommended, it is used for blood and saliva samples. That is where it showed it be its best results, especially with blood. It uh, shows some future promise with touch items, again, with some criteria that you have to keep in mind when you choose the uh, evidence item to run uh, in your rapid hit IV system. And even though this is a fully automated uh, system, your role as a forensic DNA analyst is still crucial because you have a lot of decisions to make when using the system. Uh, how would you like to deal with your uh, sample? So for example, at a crime scene, if you have the choice to run a sample between the rapid hit ID system, which could be next to you in the crime scene um, or, um, versus running the sample in your central lab, you can ask yourself, do I have a backup of the sample? Can I lift an identical sample from the crime scene as a backup? Um, you can ask if um, you want to run the test on the rapid uh, ID system, rapid hit ID system, but then go back to the central laboratory and do some more confirmatory tests. You wanna see if you might for now to get some more intelligence, uh, rapid intelligence for the investigation, 
if it would be enough for now to have a partial profile with enough number of markers that would cover some degree of statistical confidence um, to be used uh, for the investigation. And uh, also when the profile comes out, compared to the ACE reference, uh, you would need uh, your um, expert opinion on the interpretation of the profile. Uh, it is very important to know that the rapid hit ID system is not meant to be used as a replacement of your central laboratory. It is meant to be used as an extension of it. So that means that you do not run uh, samples on the rapid uh, DNA analysis workflow to base crucial judgments upon, but you do that to quickly steer the um, investigation to the right direction. So to conclude, the uh, rapid hit ID system is a rapid 90 minute fully automated sample and profile out system. There is a very good um, uh, user management uh, availability here because you have your basic user who is not a DNA expert, who um, does not have access to the profile, who works, for example, in the police station and just run these samples into the instrument. You have the administrator who can oversee and manage all of the basic users. And then you have the forensic DNA expert who can look at the profiles and have access to the softwares and the applications. And again, this is an extension of the central laboratory uh, for forensic DNA analysis and a great investigative lead uh, in this regards. Um, finally, I would like to thank, uh, well, I'd like to thank you for having me and I'd like to thank Thermo Fisher Scientific UK and Integrated Gulf Biosystems uh, and my colleagues at Dubai Police for their great help with uh, the validation study that I've presented for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, as we all know, technology plays a very significant role and uh, understanding the concept of uh, DNA analysis with the help of this technological point of view, I think it's going to be very useful for all the uh, DNA enthusiastic learners present in the e conference. They, they'll definitely learn a lot from you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Now, I request um, Ankit sir to give a concluding remark of Hanan ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Hanan. You have delivered a wonderful talk on rapid DNA analysis or rapid head system because uh, we know that uh, technological advancement is very much necessary in the field of DNA too because DNA has a uh, lot of time taking techniques in earlier days. Now that time moves and I'm sure who want to purchase or who are, want to update their laboratories of DNA, they are uh, eager to learn your, uh, your lecture. So on behalf of organizers and myself, I'm thankful for your uh, lecture and, uh, and you share such a wonderful time for us. Thank you, Ms. Han. Thank you so much, Ankit sir. Now I request Hanan ma'am to kindly accept our certificate, uh, kindly accept the certificate from our end for great, a grateful scientific contribution and invaluable insight as a keynote speaker on rapid DNA analysis, validation of ACE and Intel rapid HIP ID system at second international e-conference on DNA forensics. Your scientific views plays a significant role in enriching the knowledge of the participants. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, Kritika. Now I request chairperson to introduce our next speaker. Sir, over to you. Okay, sir. Uh, Ankit will be doing the job. Okay. Dr. Ankit. Thank you, uh, thank you sir. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. A.B. Joseph, assistant professor and forensic DNA consultant, MIT University, EAE, UAE. And his, uh, he has an assistant professor of forensic science department at MIT University, Dubai is an internationally recognized forensic science consultant with 23 years of experience with Abu Dhabi and Bahrain Police Forensic Science Departments. His areas of expertise are crimes in investigation, biological evidence examination, and DNA analysis. During his career, he had screened, analyzed, and interpreted thousands of DNA evidence of complex 
sexual assault cases, human remains, and homicide evidence, and post blast basically touch DNA cases. He is a licensed molecular biologist, Ministry of Health, UAE, a professional member of the Chartered Society of Forensic Science, UK, and honorary fellow of European Society of Forensic Science. Also serves the advisor of the Indian Association of Criminology and Forensic Science and ambassador Wildlife Forensic Academy, South Africa. Joseph holds a master degree in forensic science with DNA specialization and professionally trained in crime scene investigation, DNA interpretation, DNA mixture analysis, ISO IEC Satrajiro Pachis and Satrajiro B's QMS Laboratory Information Management System limbs. So I invite Mr. Joseph for his talk is quality compromised in forensic DNA. It's over to you, Dr. Joseph. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, it's greetings to you all. Uh, it's a, an honor to present my topic in the International League Conference 2021. Let me directly go to my screen. Is it visible right now? Yes, sir. Yes. So my topic is, is quality compromised in forensic DNA. So we all of, uh, know that 362 DNA extrorations in US. So basically, how did these 362 innocent DNA get there? So how they were wrongly convicted? So there are some issues there. So reform criminal justice policies, we need robust guidelines and robust analysis and what went wrong, how it can be prevented. So DNA technology is so advanced today, but there are a lot, lot of uncertainty or wrong, wrongful convictions are there. So our top priority to improve the accuracy and reliability of forensic DNA. So Iatrogenesis, or most of you heard about it in medical system, what is that? Actually, in a patient is going to a hospital and approaching a doctor and is prescribing a medicine or a treatment. After that, he is not or she is not having 100% confirmation that whether the patient is going to cure or not. So it is either because of the, the competency of the doctor or the medical system or the instrument which we, he used for his, his examinations. So this is actually right now it is in place. But the same thing which is happening, uncertainty of forensic DNA typing or iatrogenesis, I don't know how you can use this term or not. So there is no guarantee. So we know that the process which start from crime scene, evidence collection, uh, storage, preservation, analysis. Then we are going and submitting the samples to the crime lab, then presenting the evidence to court. But how many forensic DNA experts can guarantee they can provide justice to the victim? So there is no guarantee because that's the reason there were 362 exonerations in the US. So there is a mystery of DNA transfer. How the DNA is getting there in the crime scene or the evidence. So how many DNA experts can say how or where the DNA was deposited there? Answer, it depends. Are we dealing with body fluid right now? No, we are also dealing with touch DNA or trace DNA. So how many of us are confident that the sample is pure and it has not been mixed with other sources of DNA evidences? So do we have a full profile or a major contribution DNA in the profile? So if yes, we can attribute the DNA body fluid that is detected. So in biological evidence process, which is in basically in DNA analysis, Crime scene to court, we have several steps. Crime scene investigation, crash in, crash out. This is what is happening right now. Our crime scene investigation, which is not properly doing the trash, which is coming in the end, the interpretation stage, we all forensic analysts or experts, we are facing mixture profiles. We are getting extra DNA, 
in the profile. So after crime scene investigation, serology, collection, sample storage, how it is stored, whether the sample is stored properly, whether it is collected in a DNA-free or ISO 18385 certified evidence container or packet. So all matters. Oh, sorry. All right. Now we are going to the biology next step, extraction. In the forensic DNA lab, if the extraction environment is properly controlled, the environment is DNA free or not, how many labs can assure these things? Quantitation, to optimize the amount of DNA which you are going to add to the PCR kits, whether it is ID plex, identifier, global filer, mini filer, whatever it may be, are you properly quantifying the DNA samples? Then STR technology where we are detecting the DNA profile. So here you know what is happened during this whole process. When you do the data interpretation, you will may you may getting a lot of artifacts, mixed profile, low profile. Then basically the which is coming to the next step is genetics the statistical interpretation. The previous speakers mentioned about the importance of the statistical interpretation, likelihood ratio, combined probability, etc. So before that, we have to know what and how we are doing in the DNA analysis. So now we know how much do DNA we need to know or to analyze. So all the multiplex kits is able to generate good profile with the very good, very less starting material. So even picograms, we can get good DNA profiles. And how much optimum amount is required for a particular amplification multiplex kit? So that we have to decide in the quantitation stage. So the technology is so advanced and what is happening right now, we are actually analyzing or testing very low trace amount of DNA. And along with that, we are adding the substrate DNA or background DNA along with that. So that's why we are getting a lot of touch DNA evidences. And after that, after the analysis, we are getting these three possible out outcomes of evidence examination. One is exclusion, and another is non-exclusion, match, or inclusion or inconclusive result. For example, a known sample of a suspect, which is 11, 12 in a particular law set, which is matching with the question evidence sample. So we can exclude, we can include most of the time, which is inconclusive, particularly today, we are actually analyzing with very low profile or low quantity DNA. So let this, let's look at this STR identification pathway, the evidence item, which is you know, a crime scene investigation officer or a forensic analyst is collecting the swab and sending to the lab. So the evidence data, which you are getting and so inferring the, that particular 10, 12 of the peaks, and comparing with the known genotypes or the suspect or victim or reference or database samples. So when it is matching 10, 12, so we can say whether it is inclusion or not inclusion. So in this case, you can see it's a good profile. So no deletion, peak head balance is perfect, ratio is perfect, everything is perfect. But in this profile, if it is coming in into a contamination opportunity or a contamination chance, background DNA, which is already present before collecting the sample, which is on the substrate. So which is also added along with the sample and amplified, and we are producing a genotype. And there are a lot of possible genotypes are there. 10, 11, 10, 12, 
there are a lot of combinations. So our known genotype, which is not matching with that. So in this case, we are not able to provide a good results because it is inconclusive. And another scenario, which is polluting the DNA evidence, how we are polluting the DNA. The background, which DNA is they already there in the substrate or in the evidence sample. Either a crime scene officer, a forensic analysis or a lab environment or, uh, environment or a you know, contaminated reagent or a contaminated uh, evidence packaging material or whatever it may be contaminated. It's an external DNA added by the scientist or the analyst or the investigation officer or anyone else. So polluting the DNA. This is actually happening right now. And contamination, which is the background DNA, which is already a trace DNA, which is present there. So it is also adding minor profiles or minor peaks to the our original DNA sample. So contamination, which can happen, you can see in this image, not the the analyst or the crime scene officer not wearing any PPE, any, anything. So he's collecting, he or she can contaminate the evidence or pollute the evidence. An analyst also in the lab contaminate the evidence. And we are getting the evidence data the same. We are getting a mixture profile, which we are not able to compare with the known samples. And these are the main problems currently, which is happening in the may, many DNA laboratories or the crime scene investigation units or in their forensic science system, which actually looking for a good DNA profile. Why are the DNA mixtures difficult to interpret? So at the end, the forensic expert, he or she himself or herself knows while they are generating the DNA data at the end. Before that, we do not know what is happening. And we do not know the quantity of each component in the mixture. And which can lead uncertainty in determining if all alleles are present. We have good technologies, we have good uh, scientists, we have good academicians, we have a lot of research and development, everything is there. But the entire system, there are some uncertainty. That's why acceleration, which is happening, not only in the US and European countries and other part of the world also started this project, Innocence Project. Those who are wrongly convicted based on the DNA result. So where we have to correct this and how we can correct this. The DNA amount, which is very small. So there would be dropout and drop in. There are very difficult, you know, it interpreting because of the many artifacts and noise, which is also coming along with the small amount of DNA. And stochastic effects, DNA profile quality, and quantitation and optimization of DNA for PCR is very important. And pipetting, peak imbalance, sister alleles, loss, loss of data, allele drop, allele drop in everything occurs while we are doing with the or analyzing with the low amount template DNA. So if you look at this, is this a good DNA profile? Of course it is not because there are peak imbalance are there. So in a peak height ratio, when we are interpreting, it should be, you know, should be hundred percent in an heterozygous peak. So, but there are certain cutoff values are there. So based upon the lab protocols, so evaluation of peak height ratio is very important in analysis of DNA results. So are we properly analyzing each low say for the proper peak height ratio and how we are interpreting this result. So uncertainty in mixture because of the starter, that is also another issue which is happening right now. So you can see here the allele 12, 14, 15, 16, the total RFU of the allele, you can see. And the 14 and 15, so the starter peak is masked with the alleles, the proper alleles. So that, that actually varies the peak height RFU. 
So here is there is a problem. So the uh, the peak height ratio imbalance it is not correct because of the stutter. And the stutter you can see clearly see from this profile. So you can see the small peaks which is the left side of the each long long peaks that is the stutter. So how you are you know interpreting the stutter? How are you interpreting the shoulder peaks? That is also very important because this is the peak. The, here you can see there is no optimization in the DNA. So the, P, the, the PCR kits which you are selecting and you have to optimize after the quantitation, calculate how much we require. So according to that only you are getting a good peaks. Pull up peaks, there's another artifacts which is commonly occurs. So when you are analyzing the DNA, or uh, interpreting the DNA results. So you have to remove all the pull-up peaks. This is also another artifacts which is coming. Minus A peaks, this is the another artifacts which you can see in this image. So spikes, this is another issue which is coming normally, which is also affecting our interpretation. And this is generally which is happening with the, with the instrumentation, how we properly maintain the in instrument, the CE genetic analyzer, are we cleaning properly? Are we, do we have a proper cleaning procedure for the instrumentation? Is our uh, instrument have a cleaning protocol? So everything matters. And this all artifacts really affect our results. This is either because of the contamination or the low template DNA. So lab should establish stochastic threshold. So for example, in Indian scenario, the, there are many states are doing DNA analysis. Each lab has their own uh, stochastic threshold. And at the end, we are presenting this result to the court. So whether it is Sessions Court, whether it is High Court, whether it is Supreme Court. So do we have a integrated you know, protocol for DNA analysis? or the DNA data interpretation. So there is any committee to establish this kind of interpretation or standard operating procedure for each lab. So whether we are you know, integrated together to present the result to the court. So we each lab should establish a stochastic threshold and you know, we should form a committee or a scientific committee to you know, to do some validation or studies to present this into the court. Challenges in real world data. So each allele variations are there in the PCR. This highly affected DNA quantity and quality. So quantity is very important and quality also very important. Imbalance in allele sample gets worse, the low amounts of DNA template. So that whenever we are going to analyze touch DNA samples at all, so there is, we can expect the imbalance and higher number of contributors. If it is a body fluid, we can say this has come from this particular body fluid because of the quantity is there already. Degra degraded DNA template may, some allele targets are avail unavailable. PCR inhibitors, may also reduce the sample which is collected from a farm. There is a humic acid present in the farm. So that in the soil that will inhibit. A denim genes indigo dye which is present that will inhibit the DNA. So everything matters. So the forensic DNA expert, he should know or she should know about, about the sample and what she or he is going to analyze and how they are going to interpret. Very important. So overlap of alleles from contributors in DNA mixtures, uh, started products, as I mentioned, it is already masking the minor contributor. And it is the trace DNA and uncertainty. Due to the sample quantity, more uncertainty is there. So due to the artifacts, the presence of DNA of more than one person, we call mixtures. Strignant control procedures are needed on the crime scene and in the laboratory. So are we following proper the you know, control measures to not to not to contaminate the evidence in the crime scene. Are we collecting the samples in a proper DNA-free 
containers or vials uh, or the for the forensic medicine and are they sub, you know, submitting the samples in proper way so do we have a proper evidence management or a uh, quality management system in place is our crime scene is iso 17020 accredited accredited or our lab is iso 17025 accredited so all this matters so we can you know know the dna experts know the results at the end of it. so we face a lot of you know mixture you know we are getting a lot of mixture samples and so most of the time we can give the result to the court or that it is an inconclusive result because of the mistakes which is happening from the beginning so we have to control these things so evolution given to a source level proposition is not the same as given the activity level proposition. So many, um, the activity level is very important. So the, the source, the innocent DNA must might be present in the source or the substrate. The activity level, we should know about this. Well, and what is happening, then only we can you know, create a you know, judgment out of it. So detection of contamination, that is very important. Comparison of DNA profile generated from items against database of preference DNA profiles from personnel from whom this there is a significant risk of contamination. So whether a police officer who is visiting the crime scene, he may contribute his DNA to the crime scene. So are we collecting the elimination data of the, all the people with, with those who are present in the crime scene? Do we, we have a system like that? We have to think about it. Cross-checking the profiles within the same batch of samples with, from different batches of samples processed within the same laboratory. If there is any contamination which is reported, so all that batch samples might be you know, contaminated, whether it is from a reagent. So a sample reagent extraction buffer, which is contaminated, who knows it? So maybe from the centrifuge, because with the other case sample, it is contaminated. So we are getting a mixture sample or an inconclusive result. Investigation of unexpected results. So we are getting unexpected result every time we have to investigate to back to, to find the root cause of it. Segregation of the processing of casework and reference DNA samples. So already there is a system in place. We have to have a crime sample that, you know, lab and a reference sample lab. And one scientist or analyst working on the same sample, which is not advised. Segregation of pre-polymerized chain reaction and the post-PCR should be segregated. Staff may only transfer from post area to the pre area in the same day if the work shower and they change their outer clothing. If the, if, for example, the staff the same day, he is going to the post-PCR, that is the C instrument, which is there, and we are going back to the PCR area, whether it is extraction or pre-PCR area, it is not allowed if you are going, so you should take a shower or change your clothing. Why? Because you are carrying the amplified DNA to the extraction area uh, to another case. Segregation between bulk and trace items at any stage of their examination and processing. So segregation, you have to do with the bulk and trace samples so trace sample uh, samples or touch dna samples you should not take along with the high quality or high quantity dna prevention of lab contamination minimizing the chance of contamination occurring by example staff using barrier clothing pp should be a must restriction access to areas containing exhibits so those who are coming to take exhibits maybe a Pune uh, or the office assistant or a lab assistant, all should you know register their log there. So who touches the evidence that is very important. Cleaning laboratory surfaces that is also very important. Weekly, monthly cleaning protocol should be in place. Rendering consumables from uh, ISO 19385 certified DNA free even. Many labs or many agencies which I have seen, they have the uh, normal, the, the common collection kits 
uh, they, they are all kids. We cannot guarantee about the presence of DNA is there or not. You might heard about the fandom of Haley Burton. So the staff who worked in a manufacturing unit of a swab, so uh, they, he or she contaminated the sample or the, all the cases. So that is very important. So we must procure very good uh, DNA free consumables, kits and you know, samples. Ensuring the equipment used at scenes of crime adequately decontaminated between scenes. Is there is any system in place to you know, check the contamination of the crime scene uh, tools or equipments? Are we doing that? I don't think so. Uh, many of the agencies are doing this. So uh, are we checking uh, the tools? Frequently, it, it's once in a month or you know, once in four months, just randomly take crime scene you know, equipments and tools and check. You can get a lot of DNA on that particular tools. So a crime scene investigation officer is going to collect and use the same tool or equipment to you know, collect another case sample that automatically contaminate the other case. So wear gloves, change them off, often. Always use disposable instruments or clean them thoroughly before and after handling each sample. So maybe sometimes the normal uh, decontamination you know, reagents might not work. So you have to check. So validate which are the uh, present you know, decontaminating reagents which you are using, whether it is chlorex. Dr. Or Joseph, please, yes. please, please bind up as soon as possible. No? Yeah, sure, sure. Like, okay. Avoid talking, sneezing, coughing over evidence. Avoid touching your face, nose, that all of you know because of the COVID situation or we are well aware how the cells are transferred. Air dry evidence before packing. So competence of personnel is very important. Crime scene officers, competence and lab uh, analysts, education, training, equipment, consumables, uh, facilities, equipment, kits validated, properly stored. Collection, DNA analysis, reporting, so written SOP with ISO 17025 accreditation is very, very important. So all labs should you know, actually go for this accreditation process. Scientifically validated protocol standards should be you know, uh, there and nationwide and you know, overseas, you know, overseeing committee in DNA should be established very soon. So with this, I will wind up uh, the presentation here. So we all forensic DNA uh, analysts or you know students or enthusiasts. So we all are going to work with the specimens, which is forensic specimens, which is imperfect specimens. So we should know the art of working with that. So for that, we need more trainings and you know support system. So system only helps you to develop the proper good DNA profile, which is not going to you know, in future, not going to allow the wrongly conviction, wrong, wrongful convictions in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. It was really indeed a very informative lecture. Uh, now, I request uh, Kesh, sir, to give a concluding remark for A.P. Joseph, sir, lecture. Sure. Thank you. So, uh, very, very informative lecture. And... Uh, what I think is uh, after continuous and fast success in DNA technology, these things are very important. Okay, so particularly she, he has mentioned about the innocent. Uh, there is an innocent project which is going on in on 362 persons have been identified. So which is which is a very very uh, you can say disturbing to hear that uh, innocent persons are getting punishment and. Uh, and, and out of uh, 362, I think around 120, 25 people have already been set free based on this DNA technology only. Uh, because earlier there, there was not a perfect type of technology. And moreover, you know, DNA technology was uh, in 1999 onward. Okay, so used to take uh, a month to complete one sample to be analyzed and the results are ready. But now things have improved a lot. Technology has improved a lot. From one month of the uh, period to uh, analyze sample, now it just reaches to 90 minutes. 
and even now we are uh, reading in uh, in the research paper that uh, it is we this uh, facility is available that we can take that instrument to the crime scene and you know uh, generate profile itself there itself and uh, you know uh, this will definitely add whatever the um, uh, and dr abhay has mentioned the contamination and other things that will be uh, uh, sorted out but uh, he has given very good suggestions and uh, and and precautions which are required to uh, in uh, in the laboratory to uh, while analyzing the samples for dna profiling so very good, nice and informative talk thank you very much sir thank you sir thank you so much sir now i request uh, ev joseph sir to kindly accept our uh, certificate for grateful scientific contribution and a very valuable insight as a keynote speaker on it is quality compromise in forensic dna at second international e conference on dna forensics your scientific views plays a significant role in enriching the knowledge of the participants thank you so much sir now we come to our uh, our next session uh, by dr gk goswami sir now i request uh, uh, mukesh sir to give the bio for uh, gk sir sure thank you so next ki our keynote speaker is uh, dr gk swami ips he will be speaking on legal aspect of admissibility of dna evidence so if i have to introduce uh, because i must admire this person that uh, being in the police but he is continuously working on uh, in uh, in forensic dna so dr goswami is an ips of 1997 batch up cadre currently serving as chief of ats uttar pradesh he also served for long as joint director in cbi and an expert uh, on organized crime in un odc he also hold prestigious uh, position postings such as uh, ssp lucknow varanasi moradabad noida itawa etc he is a four time uh, recipient of police medal for gallantry the highest police award of india conferred by president of india he has exceptional academic interest and did phd from jnu and lu uh, lucknow university in chemistry in 1997 and during serving in police did llb llm with distinction and secured gold medals he is a flex he is flex awardee uh, under the fulbright fellowship also did second phd in law and tata institute of social sciences mumbai in in in, in 2020 he become first indian to earn bsc in forensic science and law from nfc nfsu gandhinagar he has been designated as honorary professor of law in various universities such as national law university delhi national forensic science university gandhinagar etc he is an avid writer and creditor credited for more than three dozens of articles in journals of international repute exploring interface of law and science i invite um, mr goswami to present his uh, valuable and informative talk on admissibility of dna evidence thank you so much sir for introducing our esteemed speaker and indeed it's it's going to be one of the interesting talk of the day because we always uh, in forensic we always talk about that legal aspects of admissibility of any kind of uh, evidence so we are uh, uh, great that uh, uh, dr uh, dr goswami sir accepted our invitation and uh, ready to give the talk on such a important topic sir over to you thank you very much indeed it's a great pleasure to be associated with this august gathering and the international fora Uh, where a lot of issues related to dna forensics have been discussed i have joined uh, at the last speaker uh, dr joseph and he was talking about innocence project and other things and i am very happy to say that i am also working and in flex award i am working on the same so that 
innocence project in one way or other may also be introduced to indian climate so thank you very much once again for giving me this opportunity to present my work i have worked as, as mentioned in my intro I, in 2020 i worked on poxo and particularly i have visualized that how forensic evidence can help to improve the quality of of criminal justice system and i will present in two three slides the data which i uh, get my, from my dissertation uh, so so my topic is basically to 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 talk about the legal aspect of dna in criminal justice system rather it justice system whether it is criminal or civil in nature and as I mentioned this jurisprudence, I think many of you might be aware, but I just for the purpose of clarity, jurisprudence means, juris means law and prudence means knowledge. So knowledge of law. So we are going to talk about what law, uh, how law look at the DNA as evidence in the court of law. So briefly, I will touch upon why DNA, what is the purpose of DNA for our justice system and how innocence can be proved in, in addition to proving the guilt then sampling and chain of custody the jurisprudential part which is very relevant uh, aspect in if i talk about the indian constitution article 20 part, part 3 particularly right against self incrimination then privacy and consent these are the twin concept which are intertwined and have very important relevance with DNA sampling, collection of DNA from any living person. Okay. And then something about forensic fraud. In the beginning itself, I must admit that nearly. Science that is called criminalistics so it is the baseline for scientific investigation so forensic evidence whatsoever it may be it brings scientific temper basically in evidence collection and the purpose of this whole exercise is to enhance the probity of evidence and ultimately it leads to towards perfect justice so perfectness is justice system is the ultimate objective of this whole exercise <laughs> If you see, the human identification remains the core work of investigation in general. Not only in criminal investigation, but even in civil disputes resolution, human identification is the keyword. How, if you see in murder case, sometime the, the body of the person may not be identified morphologically because the body may be putrefied. Maybe you may get some body remains, bone, or something like that then on other side even for the accused you have to prove the identity of accused beyond reasonable doubt so both side in criminal law the the victim as well accused has to be proved that this is the actual human being which we are referring to in civil side say for example paternity disputes so again you have to identify the paternity and not only paternity but even maternity may be challenged like in king solomon justice if you remember that two women came quelling in the court of king solomon uh, having claim on a child and he, and he asked to bring a sword to cut the child in pieces and a lady cried and she was identified as the mother so here there is no no scientific tool but it was the scientific brain so basically the purpose of this whole exercise is to bring scientific temper scientific will scientific argumentation so that truth may prevail and for the purpose of human identification right from morphological feature to dna profiling these are various tools in the forensic domain which helps us to identify so it is not only dna many times it may be bundle of evidence which may help somewhere 
the foot fingerprint may be helpful even from the fingerprint or footprint you may even extract dna so the one has to to understand that it is not only one science or one particular area or discipline but we have to see things in entirety this you very well know local exchange principle that when two things comes into contact so it give you where from you can collect the forensic evidence yes this basically i want to flag you why all these evidence that is forensic evidence are important so these figures right from 2014 conviction rate so left side charge sheet in in rape cases in india nearly 85 to 90% cases police file charge sheet but on other side conviction is limited only to 30 to 35% cases and this is a grim scenario police feels that we have done our job but court says that look your evidence are not sufficient not sufficient to convict a person so this is a dilemma and this gap has one side 90 to 95% conviction around 30 35 again the 60% variation this this is matter of concern now this is the result of my research which is available on on internet and you may find it on research gate as well conclusion of my research is that if we conduct dna coupled with other forensic tools and particularly recording the statement before the magistrate under section 164 of crpc then one may get nearly 95 to 100% conviction rate so dna is a very very powerful tool and my research has strongly recommended that dna must be conducted without any doubt or without any fail in all the cases particularly in body offense like rape murder or something where you can collect that the dna sample so that is the recommendation this this again this slide actually prove that if you have conducted dna then the 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 trial get is speedy you get the speedy trial basically so it reduce the time for for conviction or or you can say the completion of trial so dna has very important role not only to prove uh, or disprove guilt but it is speed up the the course of court proceedings so we are actually reaching to the bottom of the truth that is the purpose of investigation and dna certainly helps in this this journey the fairness and other things one thing i want to add here that we have talk about fair trial a lot in legal domain nationally internationally in un covenants and many more but we hardly talk about fairness in investigation but my dear friends let me tell you very clearly that without fairness in investigation probably we cannot achieve fair trial that means that until unless we bring correct and good quality of evidence during investigation trial cannot be fair or effective so in other word that fairness in investigation is the precursor to fair trial i will tell you another facet of innocence project that how right from the beginning in 19 Uh, 84 85 when dna came into court room at that point of time the innocence was proved i will talk about and this is very important and i think india and many other country may must observe uh, this innocence project because lot of innocent get convicted for one reason or other and i think dna is the key to prove innocence in such 
get matters. This is chain of custody. I think a lot of things might have taught, but chain of custody, whether it is DNA or any other forensic sample, or even during, uh, during any forensic analysis in the laboratory, this chain of custody is the focal point. If it is broken one way or other, then definitely the, the defense can challenge that the sample is challenged. It is contaminated. It is fabricated. It is manipulated. So chain of custody is the hallmark, basically, if we want to use forensic science, including DNA. And there are so many, you know, ways and means how these context only the articles or sections may change but these are the global doctrines of law like prospective effect post facto law you cannot uh, introduce a law post facto uh, pros from the prospective effect then you cannot uh, convict a person twice that is called double geopardy and self incrimination one point i want to say that a person cannot be compelled to be the witness against himself or herself what does it mean? That you cannot compel a person to talk about his criminality. It is a very paradoxical statement. Anybody may say that if a person cannot be compelled to speak about his criminality, then how the truth will come out? This is a question. But, but law protect and law give this right as a fundamental right, because if this right is not there, then police will huge third degree and probably they will force a person to confess so that becomes very very important because law says that let hundred and thousands guilty go unpunished but not even a single innocent be punished so with that doctrine in mind this law is very very important and significant i was talking about violence or you can say third degree now the question right if it is third degree there must be first and second degree as well. And what is third degree? Everybody knows it is violence during interrogation or police custody. And it is proscribed everywhere. You cannot touch, you cannot beat, you cannot challenge the body. That means third degree is prohibited. But now the question arises, what is first, second and third degree? If we just conclude in, in few sentences, this first, second, third is the numerical value and degree is quantification of something. Quantification of torture basically we are dealing here and torture is of two types, mental and physical. As I said, physical torture is bodily violence which is proscribed, which is prohibited under law whether it is Europe, whether it is India or any, any part of the world. So third degree is completely prohibited. Now only thing left is first and second degree that is mental torture. Now question arises, what is first and second degree? Suppose if you are calling a person at police officer or any law enforcement agency at police station or any other office, the person get tense. He feel tor mentally tortured. And till time you are asking general questions about the crime, about his, his, his background, till that time it is first degree. But the moment you start confrontation of the facts, then it is start third, second degree. And my dear friends, scientific investigation basically starts with confrontation. Those who, those police officers or investigators who have full spectrum of background note, they are well prepared about the questionnaire to be asked about the subject regarding uh, the crime during interrogation. Then only they can reach to the bottom of the truth. And those who avoid that type of preparation, they generally resort to third degree. So those who do not use second degree properly, they generally jump first degree to third degree. So that is very, very important. These are the case laws, basically Kathi Kullu, Ogad. All these cases are relevant for different purpose. Kathi Kullu was important for fingerprint, Nanni Satpathi, uh, provide right not to speak, that means right to silence. Then shall we talk about 
the consent part of forensics and Ritesh Sinha is very recently about a year back in August 2019 it talks about the bias spectroscopy the Supreme Court of India has empowered the magistrate to order uh, or, or to direct the subject to give via sample so these are very relevant judgments for the purpose of our discussion one thing I want to tell because many of you may not be having the legal background and I, I sincerely request you because I was also a scientist, I was a, uh, having a science background, I never have read law as a, as a student before I started my LLB uh, degree. I was a police officer, I was practicing law but without having the, the, the study of that subject. But I want to flag you one thing only that if you want to read something, you want to know about the legality, please read the judgments. Say for example, if you read, want to understand the medical negligence, please write down medical negligence on Google and put one word Indian Kanun. Indian Kanun is a, is a search engine and they, that you will get so many judgments. And if you read judgments, you will find the law, the one side defending the matter, one side putting the allegations and then honorable judge, whosoever it may be, maybe lower court or higher court, they analyze and based on argumentation they reach to a conclusion so that is a live law and that you understand in a better manner so these are some aspects on, on consent on the left side consent is very very important and there may be adverse possession in case you do not allow somebody suppose in in case of paternity suppose a person refused to give blood sample then under section 114 of indian evidence adverse presumption may be deduced that means that you may may not be giving uh, the sample because you may be guilty so these are certain uh, you know perspective and percept of law and we must be uh, knowing all these things so these are some more aspect of uh, you know uh, consent and uh, different issues and challenges about the, 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 these are the case laws. I can talk a lot about uh, all these things, but I think data privacy and other things. Data privacy, even the DNA. DNA is also a very, very strong source of data. We will talk in, in the next um, judgments. And one another case is very important, Maryland versus King. This is 2013 uh, US case where it permit buckle swab for DNA. No violation of Fourth Amendment of US Constitution. So every case is very important and interesting as well, but because of paucity of time, I am just skipping. Now, as I mentioned, in India, right to privacy has become integral part of right to life under Article 21. So now right to privacy is fundamental right. It can be challenged under Article 32 and 226 of Indian Constitution. My dear friends, please understand that Aadhaar card case, which is the second one, this Putta Swami are two cases. One was decided in 2017, another in 2018. Both cases have dealt DNA at length. Those who have interest may please go through that. These are voluminous judgments running into 500 pages. I understand you cannot read each and every line. But if you just find out the component where DNA is referred to, Please read that and then you can understand why DNA was not permitted uh, uh, for various reasons. Because apart from matching, to help matching of the, the unidentified persons, this also carries so many genetic information. So how to protect uh, misuse of those genetic information remains the focal point of these judgments. A very interesting judgment and not only that, uh, in Indian scenario, I always say that police also deal with right to privacy in a very grave and great manner. And I think we also need to understand these judgments in that respect. But as forensic science sitting here, I would say that you must understand these judgments with reference to how to maintain privacy with respect to the leftover sample. Suppose if you have given some blood sample and you have left it somewhere here and there 
and if somebody picked up and misused, say for example, if somebody want to fix a person for rape, if these samples are picked up and inserted into private part of a female and rape allegations are being labeled, then probably a person may be fixed. So these samples have very important sanctity. How to maintain that privacy part is very important and one must understand thoroughly when we are dealing. Otherwise, as I mentioned, that it is now not only legal right, it is fundamental right. So now it is very rigorous and if anybody falls into trap, he may face a lot of trouble without any reason. Now this is another point, reliability and validity. My dear friends, as I mentioned earlier that, that DNA is a very established science, but to get validity or you can say to accept in the scientific domain as forensic evidence. These are the two main criteria. One is the reliability. What you look under reliability, whether the, the, the technique can be reproduced or replicate, whether the results are consistent and they are trustworthy. So this is first area how a technique, scientific technique enter into forensic domain. Another one is the validity. Validity is the conceptualization or theorization. And DNA has a strong scientific basis for identification. So in my view, and not only my view, it is accepted phenomena that both on the touchstone of reliability and validity, DNA is, is accepted worldwide. So there is no question of reliability and validity of the technique per se, but this but is important that you have to prove that there is no manipulation, there is no other hanky-panky, the, the technique used were accredited, the man behind or the scientist was, was properly trained, and then if all these things, so technique per se is accepted, but man behind or other aspects are very important. I will talk about DNA fraud, there we will talk a little bit more on the subject. These are also some aspects like if you, you probably must be knowing about the Fry test, Dauber test and all, I think uh, it needs some detailed discussion, but time probably may not permit me again, as I, uh, I am aware about the timeline. So I think by 1.30 I have to finish. So now let me enter into the legal framework. My dear friends, we have two type of law. One is called substantive law, another is called procedural law. Substantive law means it talks about substance. That means like in Indian penal code, it talks about the ingredient of crime and the, the, the prescribed punishment. So Indian penal code, POXO act and many more such act, they are substantive law. On the other side, how to implement? We need some procedures. So other side is the procedural law like Indian Evidence Act, CRPC, CPC and all. So Indian Evidence Act deals both criminal matter as well as civil matter. So Indian evidence is both way utilized. On other side, CRPC deal exclusively for criminal matter. So that is applied in criminal courts. So section 45 to 51 it deals about the expert opinion. And interestingly, in this section of Evidence Act, there is no word forensic science. They talk about opinion of experts and expert may be in foreign law, they may be science. So in this second term, science, forensic science laws. So it, forensic science is covered in the second slot. Even in art, art on the art subject, there may be an expert. Likewise, handwriting. And interestingly, our Indian Evidence Act was framed in 1872. So now more than 150 years have been passed, nearly 150 years now. So that time, handwriting was kept separate, finger impression. It was not part of science, uh, but now I think it is very much part of forensic science and it is one of the discipline. So these are different other sections, but for our purpose, we are more concerned about section 45. Although section 46 deals with fact, 
based upon opinion of experts and all. So when in 2000, the evidence, this uh, Cyber Space Act was brought. So we, this electronic evidence came into being. So there are a lot of amendment 45A, 47A and different opinion and experts opinion were also mentioned in our Indian Evidence Act. So now let me talk about CRPC. So you please first see the right side section 291 CRPC. It deals with the medical expert opinion, medical witness. And interestingly, it is not called witness, it is called deponent. So they are free, they are neither for defense nor for uh, accused side, not for prosecution side. So they are basically deponent. So they give the opinion. Now in section 292, that is very, very important. For our purpose, if I say two sections are important, 45 for Indian Evidence Act and 292 for CRPC. <coughs> it talk about witness the, who officer of mint not printing press security printing press any forensic department or or forensic science laboratory here only we get forensic word another is a state examiner of questioned document okay so these are the list and under section 293 subsection 4 there is a list and that list talk about that list talk about various examiners and all examiners are not there my dear friends even dna does not exist here you just see serology is there then fingerprint is there explosives are there chemical examiner but we covered here the dna and other background uh, other forensic science D, uh, are covered under 293 sex, subsection 4 sub clause G. Any other government scientific expert is specified by notification by the government. So DNA is covered by this. But many times if you go to court, people raise, particularly defense raise this question that DNA does not exist in 293 exclusively. So my take here is that now India is actually overhauling the, the criminal law in entirety, whether it is IPC, CRPC, Evidence Act, I think it is the time where exclusive chapter should be dedicated to forensic science, including all possible sciences which are in existence. So this is, let us talk in 5-10 minutes, the remaining time I will just dedicate to DNA. This is the genetic information, genetic witness. And everybody knows about Alec Jeffrey. I have nothing to talk about. But only thing I want to give one anecdote, probably majority of you must be aware about the two girls, though how the DNA was introduced. Two girls uh, were raped. They were minor girls, about 12, 13 adolescent girls in 1983 and 1985. The, the modus operandi of crime was same. They were raped, brutally killed. And they were cold cases, having no clue of the, the, the perpetrator. Police of London, they caught one fellow called Richard Buckland. At that time, he was of age 20, 21. He was little bit mentally challenged. He accepted the second case that I have committed this crime. But somehow or other, the investigating officer of both the cases were same. He was not convinced the, the, the fact revealed by Richard Buckland. He was knowing Professor Alex Jeffrey, who was not dealing any way in the crime matter, but he was actually researching regarding connection of DNA or human identification through DNA. He requested and Professor Jeffrey got uh, this uh, challenge. Nearly 500 samples were collected. When you collect sample of a particular population, it is called DNA dragnet. In that exercise, at one day, if, when this process was going on for collection of blood sample to conduct DNA, one chap called Peter Pitchfork, he revealed 
to his friend sitting on a tea stall that I have sent my friend to impersonify me and to give blood sample on my behalf, who successfully did it. This information was passed on to police and it for was caught and ultimately we got this new science DNA fingerprinting. So at this point, I want to flag that right from its inception, DNA has proved not a potent, potent tool to link crime with criminal, but also help to prove innocence of Richard Buckland. Had this technique was not there, probably in a routine manner, Buckland would have been behind the bar. And my dear friends, country like US, where this innocence project was invented in nine, way back in 1996 by two very prominent advocates. So every year, almost 100, 150 cases of innocence have been proved. And in, in 2018, more than 20 people who were on death row, they were proved innocent. You just see, US has more efficient criminal justice system. They use lot of science, lot of forensics, lot of scientific temper into investigation. Still, they have lot of, you know, proved cases of wrong conviction, wrongful conviction. So you consider in Indian context, not only Indian, in Asian context per se. So I think we need such type of tools in our domain as well. Now, let me talk where this DNA word appears in our CRPC. Only in 53A and 164A, these two sections had only footprint of DNA. 53A deals with accused. When you conduct medical examination and the investigator or of the rank of sub-inspector and above has requested you to collect blood sample for DNA, then as medical practitioner, you have to collect DNA sample. On other side, for the victim, medical examination is conducted under section 164A. There, you may collect DNA sample, that is blood, apart from vaginal swab and other things, but with the consent of the victim. In this case, 53A, you need not to have any consent. Whether he refused or not, you can take the sample. But in, in 164A, in case of victim, to conduct medical examination as well as to collect DNA sample, that is blood or maybe saliva or something, whatever is the new technology, then you need consent. And very uh, important judgment, Lilu alias Rajesh, is a very significant case of Supreme Court on this aspect. These are various important judgments on civil matter on the left side, yellow color. Gautam Kundu probably very, very important. Five guidelines were issued where DNA can be conducted because when DNA came, I think initially DNA was more used for the determination of paternity. So five guidelines were used, given. Then Sarda, then Nandlal Vadbik and, and Deepan Vitarai. All judgments are very important judgments. I am a regular writer on forensic law for the Supreme Court in Annual Survey of Indian Law. So I extensively write on these and those who have interest may go through uh, my articles on ResearchGate. On the right side, there are plethora of judgments. I have just picked up three, four, like Susil Sarma case, Nana Sahani probably you might be remember. And DNA was very important to establish the charred body of the young girl. Then Sunil Kumar Singh, he was the son of an IPS officer. This case, Priya Darsini Mattu case, if you remember, she was the last student and he was having one side love with that girl. She was the classmate and he went there and the, the, the DNA ultimately helped and very beautiful judgment of the High Court as well as Supreme Court. It was basically in this case, the trial court uh, has extensively discussed about DNA. And because it was in the formative stage, probably judge was not aware of the nuances of DNA. And the, uh, the, the court I do not have here, but it says that I know that Mr. S.K. Singh has done this, but I have no evidence and I am acquitting. So that was the state of affair and how DNA was 
established. I think this judgment is a hallmark judgment to understand that how DNA was established. And I must praise the, none other than uh, Professor Dr. Lalji Singh, who fought day in and day out to establish DNA in courtroom. Fortunately, he was my co-guide in my research from Tata Institute of Social Science. I pay my homage and regard for him, the late soul. Then Dharmendra Dev Yadav, in the beginning itself, DNA has been appreciated by Supreme Court in a very big manner. I think one must read this judgment. And ultimate hallmark is the Mukesh versus the state of Delhi, where beautiful, you know, praise have been made in, in favor of DNA. How potent this DNA is. So I think you are all scientists probably have these judgments and then you will find that how the legal fraternity has accepted the the, 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 the evidentiary strength of DNA in, in courtroom. I think this is the last slide. I, I am at the concluding side. I know I have I almost to the closure side. I have already mentioned about the contamination, loss, degradation, manipulation, tampering, and so many things. But I will just talk about the forensic fraud. And if you see the right side of the last line, the state of NCT Delhi versus Khursid. This is very, very interesting case of 2018. And I will just give anecdote. The same bench of Honorable High Court Delhi was actually dealing the POXO cases, POXO, the child sexual abuse. And other evidence, like medical injury on the private part of the victim, many other circumstantial evidence, they were crying, saying that, look, this is the, this is the culprit. The accused is the culprit. But DNA was negative. And that was the reason the lower court, the trial court, made acquittal. And it was not the one case. In, in consecutive three case, where appeal were sent, appeal were dealt by the high court, the same scenario. This was the fourth case, Khursid. Court get doubt. Court sent the samples to uh, laboratory for re-examination, re-conducting the DNA test. And to utter surprise and horror, the DNA was matched. That means it proved that culprit is connected with the crime through DNA. And other three cases were also sent later. It got the same fate. That means there was forensic fraud. And it is same to say that Honorable Court ordered CBI inquiry. At that point of time, I was serving in the, that organization. And you know the fate. So what I mean to say that, that science, whether it is DNA or other, cannot speak like but man behind can do any wrong, any fault, any fraud. So we have to be very, very cautious and careful while dealing forensic science. Because it is matter of life and death. So we should not be any, you know, uh, fancy about any science. We have to be very cautious and particularly the forensic fraternity, prosecution, as well as the judges. So with this, now I conclude my... Uh, discussion so if thank you so much sir thank you so much sir i must appreciate uh, this uh, with such an insightful session now i request our honorable chairperson to give the concluding remark for for the session sure. thank you so uh, we have a very very elaborative talk by dr gk swami ips so he emphasized on the relevance of scientific evidence to be used in the investigation of crime. And he emphasized on the crime scene itself from where the, all the evidence originated. And if, they are, if that has been done properly, then definitely many important conclusion can be, uh, you, know, you can take from that, from the examination. So he also talked about in detail about the legislation uh, you know, and different uh, cases. And he also emphasized on the first, second and third daily uh, methods which have been used by. And he also tried to uh, uh, talk in detail about the consent and right of privacy, different uh, 
sections of the cases which have been enforced and finally uh, he has also uh, discussed about the reliability of the uh, reliability and the validity of dna evidence in crime investigation of course uh, it's very very serious because when we are using this uh, these type of evidence definitely we have to be very careful like he has mentioned in the last about the forensic frauds we have to take care we every ev everybody has to be careful while using the scientific evidence of course we don't have a legislation like uh, fry and daubert like uh, usa have okay but still we are using it uh, i must congratulate that um, uh, in the in the indian popular uh, government has enacted first dna legislation which is just a beginning and hoping to have a more and more and more evidence uh, legislation which can help the forensic scientist in taking the correct decision so uh, and hope to have a scientific uh, all the uh, we we can avoid the third degree method and can shift it successfully to the scientific investigation and uh, the last and important in information is uh, like uh, if we are able to have a new police act the guidelines given by the malimat commission if they are in, implemented then definitely many thing can be done and we will have a, a fair and fair uh, investigation and only the culprit will go behind the bar that is the most important thing i wish thank you very much we have a elaborated talk thank you very much indeed sir it's a pleasure to hear uh, goswami sir again and again and uh, as sir explained is from uh, either any kind of evidence either is a dna or any evidence he uh, thoroughly explained about the salvi versus the state of karnataka and he threw a light that how the ethically one should practice once they are going to deal with such kind of uh, delicate evidence because on the basis of such analysis uh, uh, life of person is on the stake so thank you so much sir for your valuable talk and uh, uh, giving a uh, opportunity to all the learners to hear from you as we have the um, participant not from only india but from if you can see in the chat we have from the south africa we have from the us uk many other international participants and they are appreciating a lot about your talk so thank you once again sir and as you mentioned that alex jeffrey sir we invited alex jeffrey sir also but due to his uh, prior commitment he was not able to uh, join us uh, in this talk but he wrote a good message for us that uh, he is giving a, a best wishes for this conference and uh, as we have a, such a, a good quality of this speaker in our conference so we are completely uh, you know delighted to have the, you all all three notice speakers in our this conference so thank you once again uh, sir for uh, giving such a wonderful talk kritika over to you thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir as rightly said uh, by dr ranjit sir that it was extremely a very knowledgeable as well as a very interesting session by dr gk goswami sir thank you so much sir and we request you to kindly accept our gratitude by this token of certificate for grateful scientific contribution and invaluable insights as a keynote speaker on legal aspects of admissibility of dna evidence at second international e conference on the theme dna forensics your scientific views play a significant role in enriching the knowledge of the participants thank you so much sir now with this we uh, we are here to please our thankful gratitude to our cheering for cheering cheering panel and with this we are extremely thankful to Prof, uh, professor mukesh kumar thakkar sir for handling the entire session in such a um, amazing way thank you so much sir uh, kindly accept our uh, certificate of appreciation on behalf of international association of scientists and researcher in sincere acknowledgement for the outstanding service as chairperson of the panel at second international e conference on theme dna forensics thank you sir thank you thank you very much Also we are extremely thankful to Dr Ankit Srivastava sir in sincere acknowledgement for the outstanding service as chairperson of the panel at second international e conference on the theme dna forensics thank you so much sir and also we are thankful to Dr Vivek Sahajpal sir 
uh, in sincere acknowledgement of the outstanding service as co-chairperson of the panel at Second International E-Conference on DNA Forensics. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, chairperson and co-chairperson. Uh, now we are <clears throat> moving to our next session. And uh, the next session will going to be presentation related to the uh, paper, uh, professional category. So next session is a paper presentations in professional category. Thank you, sir. Now we move to our, uh, our second part, which is these paper presentations of professional category. Before this, I would like to uh, introduce you all with our chairing, uh, chairing session of the paper presentation. And with this, we have we have with us Dr. Anna Barbaro, ma'am, as um, as chairperson of the paper paper presentation professional category. Dr. Anna Barbaro, ma'am, is currently uh, currently serving as president of Worldwide Association of Women Forensic Experts (WAWSE) and serving as forensic genetist and hold European PhD in forensic genetics. She has done academic diploma at School of Specialization in Applied Gen Genetics. She is seen as teacher for forensic genetics at second level of Masters in Forensic Science, University of La Sapienza in Rome, Italy. She has honored member of, uh, of Georgian Academy of Forensic Science. She is reviewer of Forensic Science International Genetics and Egyptian Journal of Forensic Science. Thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation. Now I request my chairperson, uh, Dr. Aina Barber, ma'am, to introduce our uh, panelist jury member of uh, this professional category paper presentation. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation to chair this session. I'm going to present members of the jury for the professional category. Dr. Naresk Kumar is working as a senior scientific officer in biology division of the Forensic Science Laboratory Government, NCT Delhi. His area of research is DNA profiling of forensic cases. He has deposed as an expert witness in more than 1,000 cases before the various courts of Delhi. The very famous case of serial killer Chandra Kant Jam and where the accused was sentenced to death by Rohini Court Delhi. He has published more than 25 international papers in Scopus Indexed and Web of Science Indexed journals. Dr. Jahangir Imam is currently working as forensic scientist at the DFSS Ranchi. He has been a research associate at Indian Institute of Natural Resins and Gums, ISAR, and a senior research fellow, ICAR and Harhar Al, Central Rinfed Hapland Rice Research Station. He has served as a lecturer at Venoba Bavi University. He has various researches in the field of DNA, published in journals of repute. Dr. Hila Gautam has been serving as a scientific officer at the Biology Division FSL, Orissa. She has been assistant professor at the Bandorkland University, Jansi. She has numerous works published in journals of report to her credit. She has given opinion in numerous DNA cases. Dr. Nadim Mubarak is currently serving as in charge of DNA division FSL, Jammu and Kashmir. He has completed his PhD in cytogenetics from Punjabi University, Pariala. He has participated and delivered talks on various topics related to DNA technology in different workshops. He has many publications under his name related to DNA technology and allied fields in both national and international journals. He has successfully examined the different number of cases and has been working as head of the division for the last three years. He has also been involved in supervising numerous DNA cases. Welcome! to all jury members, and thanks again for joining the conference. Thank you. Me. Thank, Thank you, you so much, so ma'am. Ma ma Thank you very much. 
thank you nareesh sir thank you ila ma'am thank you nadeem sir thank you ma'am sir uh, as we have uh, seven presentation in this session thanks so sir. i request uh, presenter one by one uh, akansha dikshit anjali malik dr rupa bapat dr sukriti rawal dr soumya jain dr ritika sharma dr ruchi pande as uh, we have a four jury member over here so uh, jury member uh, whatever the question you have you can uh, ask to the participant once they will and uh, uh, they are talk so i request participant as uh, we already given the instruction that uh, you have 8 uh, minute to make your presentation concise so that 2 3 minutes jury member can ask the question so uh, now i am just uh, inviting akanksha dikshit so akanksha are you going to present from your side or should we present from our end akanksha can you unmute good afternoon sir Hey, good afternoon akanksha so yeah. are you going to share the slide from your side or should we do both sir yeah so now you can go ahead akanksha good afternoon chairperson of the session all jury members and all the listeners who are here i akanksha dikshit is here to present my topic as a study on different extraction protocols for better lysis in sexual assault cases as we all are aware of dna a genetic material which is present in each and every living and dead cell of an individual the sequence of dna is almost all human beings is 99.9% same and only 0.1% of dna sequence shows variation due to this dna profiling play an important role in the outcome of the case study in forensic science especially in the offenses like sexual assault cases rape murder etc as this may provide an important lead in the investigation process at the present scenario the statistical data of crimes estimate that males commit 95% of sexual offense and approximate 80% of violent crimes approximate more than 50% of biological evidence submitted and processed in laboratory for investigation for the analysis of evidence in sexual assault cases a standard differential extraction method followed which include a mild cell lysis step that allow the recovery of male dna which is generally suppressed by female epithelial cells these are the objectives of my study they to modify the process of differential extraction protocols for better lysis to compare the differential extraction protocols by using different concentration of lysis buffer that i used i will uh, show you in the next slide so as we all uh, this is the introduction part of dna uh, into the next slide dna profiling which is also known as dna typing or dna fingerprinting or genetic fingerprinting and the first person who discovered this is sir alex jeffrey which is in 1984 it is a technique used to determine an individual dna characteristics and the main role play dna profiling is to identify the uh, on identity individual identity to reveal family paternity cases and for the kinship relationship now we discuss the uh, problems that is arises through the sexual assault cases in the next slide these are the various techniques which are employed much advancement with time since its discoveries as rflp restriction fragment length polymorphism vntr variable number tandem repeats pcr polymerase chain reaction str short tandem repeats and snp and upcoming is ngs next generation sequencing next slide uh, next So this is the importance of DNA examination in sexual assault cases. While sexual assault cases, DNA evidence can reveal or break the final results that it can provide justice to the victims of sexual assault cases, and through this, the forensic scientist can identify suspect that the victim doesn't know or isn't familiar with. Uh, now we can go to next slide. the biological evidence that is recovered consists of a mixture of male and female body fluid the process of differential extraction could yield a sperm fraction that is more suitable for detecting male str alleles 
when these samples are to be analyzed, it results into higher concentration of female DNA profile and low concentration of male DNA profile. If there is an excess of epithelial cells, it may be impossible to deconvolute the sperm profile or no male profile may be obtained. And if no sperm profile is obtained because of an excess of epithelial DNA, then the DNA evidence is not useful as sperm recovery is not that much that we want to help the case. Now, to meet with the identify objective of study, following materials are used as append of tubes. And these are the materials and chemical reagents used to commit the study. These are the instruments to use to meet the uh, identified objective of the study. And next is the methodology, which we used is sample collection. Almost 16 mock samples of blood, semen, male saliva, female saliva, and menstrual blood were collected randomly from the region of Sagar, which is located in Madhya Pradesh, India. Samples are simulated in the lab in the ratio of dilution factor of 1 is to 50 and 1 is to 500. 16 mock samples and 16 swabs were isolated with four different lysis buffer with different concentration. Uh, next slide. These are, this is the sample collection and sample preparation procedure. Next slide. Lysis buffer. Four types of lysis buffer were prepared by mixing chemical reagent at different concentration as lysis buffer A, which is forensic buffer, generally used in CDFD. Lysis buffer B, stain extraction buffer, which is used according to the research paper of Timken et al. And lysis buffer C and lysis buffer D. This is the laboratory analysis of followed. First step is the DNA extraction. It is the process by which DNA is separated from proteins, membranes, and other cellular materials contained in the cell from which it is recovered. It was carried out through differential digestion and separation phase and second one is phenol and chloroform extraction phase in this approximate phenol and chloroform is process involved second one is dna quantitation which is done through the applied biosystem 7500 real-time pcr system all samples were quantified using this it consists of five power point calibration standards and calibration buffer it quantitates the total human dna and y dna both separately it is based on the tech man probe based chemistry so third first step is pcr amplification few samples were genotyped using verifiler plus pcr amplification kit this kit is a six die str multiplex assay that amplifies dna strain this kit was specifically developed to maximize sensitivity to enable maximum information recovery from the samples. It includes two phase pre PCR amplification and post PCR amplification. Last phase is STR typing. The PCR products were detected by capillary electrophoresis using POP4, performance optimized polymer 4. It analyzes 4 die, 5 die, and 6 die data. It interprets and stores data in .fsa and or .hid files. Uh, the results and discussions in the next slide. These are the results showing total human DNA and Y DNA observed in different mock samples with lysis buffer A, B, C. And STR genotyping is in the next slide. This represented verifiler plus electrophorogram results for lysis buffer A. Panel 1 shows female fraction profile while panel 2 shows male fraction profile. Here, x-axis displays the computer length of PCR in base pair, and y-axis displays the fluorescent intensities in arbitrary unit. Here we can see in panel 2, x in lysis buffer A, lysis buffer B, lysis buffer D shows that x amylogenin has higher peak due to higher concentration than y amylogenin. But in panel 2 of lysis buffer C, x amylogenin has lower peak due to lower concentration than by amelinogenin. And the final discussion we uh, discuss is 
in lysis buffer a the this results explained that the lysis buffer a was unable to lyse the female epithelial cells completely or their cellular materials had collected in the sperm pellet which led to low amount of male dna but in case of lysis buffer c the resulting str profiles of the male dna has high peak height than female dna which indicate that both female and male dna was present but amount of male dna is more than the amount of female dna which proves that the standard differential extraction method has a direct effect on the amount of male and epithelial cell component in the sperm fraction and which shows that the lysis buffer c is effectively uh, effectively differentiate the male male dna conclusion in the next slide this is the pre uh, present study which supports both clean and bjorn christiani and timken et al paper which shows that the standard differential extraction method has a direct effect on the amount of male and epithelial cell component in the sperm fraction conclusion the final conclusion we obtain is the result which we obtain from the qpc pcr has clearly showed that lysis buffer c affects the female fraction by reducing their amount of dna by reducing their suppressing effect and from the above study it was concluded that the uh, it shows best result for effectively lyse both epithelial cells and sperm cells and also maximizes the amount of male fraction and minimizes the amount of female fraction the lysis buffer reduces the uh, dna isolation process time also and among how huge number of sexual assault cases are registered in all over the country so this buffer plays a important role in leading the cases and also help in seizing this uh, sexual assault cases thank you all the listeners thank you so much agansha now i request jury member if uh, they have any query from the uh, participant uh, presenter uh, should i ask the question first yes please uh, akanksha will the, the female fraction uh, means this is the pull proof technique for the differential extraction can you pardon sir please a uh, female fraction will give, give the complete female profile in uh, sexual assault cases or it will give the mixed profile sir mixed profile in female fraction also uh, no sir only female fraction if there is a only uh, there is no semen present then uh, how can we be uh, why profile generate in mixed okay. in cases of mixed profile both epithelial hmm. cells and sperm cells are there okay and what what should be the quantity ratio which is being uh, had been seen in the sexual assault cases when female fraction will cover the male fraction okay hello uh, yes akansh uh, are you getting uh, no sir that's not audible okay uh, i want to ask if you have quantified the dna yes Uh, as per your opinion, how much ratio of the male fraction or female fraction will affect the DNA profiling? Uh, uh, male ratio. Male means how much quantity? Like uh, if male is one uh, nanogram and female is thirty nanogram. Yes. What will the result? Sir, we have to uh, do the quantitation of the DNA. Actually, it uh, okay. varies from evidence to evidence. Okay. So through RT PCR we can generate the quantity of DNA. Okay. Over to next jury member. Uh, uh, can you listen, Akansha? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, just one more thing. This is a very very common issue and problem we yes, all forensic lab are facing actually. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Many times, uh, uh, what I Uh, while doing the case, well, we feel that uh, we have a PSA positive, which is a presumptive test. It is okay. Yes, yes, sir. And uh, it is a very clear band, intense band. It is giving, but still we don't get the DNA profile. You know, even yes, after sir, quantitation, yes, we are getting the male DNA, but not getting the profile. Yes, sir. 
So from your A, B, C, D, whatever the uh, license buffer. buffer you have shown. Yes, sir. So buffer. how you relate with that, you know, uh, and how you go with the, you know, uh, uh, reporting stage. The biological report uh, is uh, positive, but the DNA report, uh, since it is positive, it should come as a DNA profile. Generally, court will say, yeah, DNA is, uh, PSA is positive, semen is there, then why DNA profiling is not coming? So from your uh, slide, it is showing that your uh, buffer C, license buffer C is working. Yes, sir. But uh, even I think, like uh, what sir said, uh, if the quantity is uh, variable, you know, yes. female is more and male is less, it will mask it. So what I want to know, how to get the male fraction, just male fraction, without uh, too much of female, you know? If suppose male is the fraction is one nanogram or female is two nanogram, then at least or three nanogram, then at least we can do something. But uh, one or 30 is ratio is very high. So how have you, uh, while doing your experiment, have you uh, feel something about it or uh, get it? Uh, no, sir. Actually, I just compared the lysis buffer and I just found that the quantity of buffer, that's it. That's it. You haven't uh, you haven't seen anything like this, have you? Uh, see, a mixed profile is so you can sort it out, or it can be, or you cannot sort it out. That is the thing on. Clear I, cut yes, male profile is really important. Yes, sir. Hmm. Yes, sir. So Actually, quantity I, matters a lot here, and yes, the ratio. Quantity matters a lot. Actually, so, uh, uh, if. Uh, like what a uh, male uh, profile generates from the control samples of male one. So if there is a mixed one, then uh, the epithelial cell uh, maximizes the amount. Okay, yeah, that is differently. Uh, okay, There's, still this is a lot more to be done. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank next you. story. Yeah. So eleven, do you have any question or Nadim sir? With the... Yeah, can one question. Uh, this technique is only for the semen sample present in uh, uh, in stain or other epithelial cells. I I want to I mean, if the epithelial cells contributed by the male yes. present in the sample, then this technique won't work. Ma'am, this is only for the uh, female epithelial cells and the, uh, and male sperm cells. Just pumps, yeah. Epithelial cells are common. When you digest the cell, whether yes. it is of male or female, yes, it works like it works in the same manner. Yes, yeah, so it, it separates it is both. Only, it is it only for the samples. You can Pardon. you can do differential if only semen is present there. No, ma'am. Uh, semen or male saliva. Male saliva, so it is not male saliva the epithelial. Cell. Is the male yes, fine, fine. Yeah, this is interesting. One actually, in, uh, in many cases, you know, uh, uh, just one observation, nothing questions. So, yeah, male sir, uh, epithelial just, cells, uh, you know, like yes, yes. also go into that. So, yes, so when you separate. Semen separate uh, separately or uh, epithelial cells, you know, epithelial cells of male and female comes together as a female fraction. And then uh, that's that, how you will get the mixed profile. Yes, sir. I have simulated all the uh, collected samples to make the mixed profile. Okay. To make the mixed profile. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll see. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Jodi uh, I have a suggestion. Yes, yeah. ma'am. Yes, please. No, it's not to you. I'm talking to uh, sir. We also do differential. It yeah. feels by seeing the stain, we have to see that stain material is comparatively less. We go the differential, and it is not always, but sometimes it happens with us also. We get purely female profile from the female section and purely yeah. male profile from the male section. Yeah. That is, that is, uh, we also get many times, but uh, what uh, uh, now we are facing actually, uh, many times we are facing, even though it is cement positive, intense positive, it is coming as uh, no DNA profile yeah, yeah. is getting there. 
even trying to get yeah. a, a repeated uh, differential extraction with multiple cuttings from the garment or whatever vaginal swab even it is not coming with vaginal swab also so that is a tricky one i know uh, forensic is not a one line uh, shot it is a tricky one uh, you it need expertise and you know different uh, process or a little bit of uh, you know mindset is also scientific to put yeah, yeah. every every okay. every every exhibit uh, vary differs and that's why it is challenge samples but for um, normal sample it is okay forensic sample it is a challenge so good observation ma'am thank you thank you ma'am sir i just focus on next study what you said yeah so, uh, yeah definitely yeah thank you sir. this is very important you know you are what you are doing with normal samples try to do strike a balance with challenge samples also because forensic sample is always challenge no sample yes. is uh, yes, uh, come as a in, as a plate serving uh, sample it's okay good one we can move next thank you sir remember now i request the next presenter kritika yeah so our next presenter anjali malik on the topic determination of stability of dna in stored in stored blood stain samples anjali are you ready yes thank you good okay. afternoon all the jury members and all the participants who are listening uh, my topic is basically a review study it is based on the determination of stability of uh, dna samples that are being stored in the blood uh, in the form of bloods and blood stain samples basically the store uh, the study is being conducted uh, under the supervision of dr selly lucos she is dean in chadha university kindly move to the next slide please these are the contents through which my study will move forward basically whenever we talk about the crime scenes and its uh, collection of physical evidences from the crime scenes when we talk about the biological evidences the basic evidences will actually they correlate the crime scenes with the suspects and the victims the biological evidences out of which blood and blood stains are quite important with the perspective of the dna collections or forensic dna analysis which is actually they were dependent on the basis of collections from the persons and bloods from the crime scenes in the liquid states or uh, wet blood stains to be collected or dried blood stains from the crime scenes <clears throat> sorry basically it's the storage and transportation of blood or ho of whole blood samples and the blood stain samples are quite important and uh, there are many storage and transportation patterns as well as after the storage and transportation of the blood samples and uh, the samples to be collected for the forensic dna analysis the dna extraction is quite important method to be done and to be undergone that is basically the general process or steps to be followed are cell destruction cell lysis then removal of protein and other cytoplasmic contents and then the storage of dna solutions the theme of my study on which my study was being based is basically the whole blood samples or blood stains that are being retrieved from the crime scenes they act as important source for dna for any any purpose any uh, short tandem repeat analysis or many other forensic analysis basic several biological evidences wherever we collect the biological evidences they undergo various changes and shows various uh, degraded dna samples on the extraction when the extraction is being conducted another factor is the there is the influence of the collection and the storage conditions of blood samples that are being retrieved from the crime scenes on the dna degradation part another important part is the methods that are being used for the purpose of dna isolation it is also having an impact on the extractions of dna the objectives of my study is if we'll see the the objectives were basically the reviewal studies that we have encountered for the study is to assess the impact of collection and storage methods that what are the impacts of cell collections and storage methods of whole blood samples or blood stains for the dna analysis and the, to evaluate the effect of storage temperatures and storage durations on the of whole blood samples and blood stains on dna degradations then to assess the impact of different preservatives that are being used for the whole blood samples collections 
on the DNA extraction yields and also to compare the best commonly used geno genomic DNA extraction methods that is quite useful for all the sort of uh, extractions and useful for DNA analysis that fulfill all the basic needs for it. Next. The methodology, if we'll talk about the methodology that were actually were for, uh, followed by the uh, researchers for this purpose were sample collections. I have basically segregated it in the form of collections, temperatures, durations, and extraction methods, and then the analytical techniques on the basis of which they have proved their results. Next, please. Yes. First of all, talking about the sample collections, the study showed that the sample collections were basically conducted by three different forms. That is, the blood-soaked cotton gauges were used for the purpose of collections and forwarding it to the forensic laboratories. Then it was collected from wherever the samples were collected from directly from the people. It was collected in the heparin and EDTA tubes. And another factor where it was used were used was FTA cards. FTA cards are basically the flinders technology associate cards that are quite useful for the storage of uh, DNA samples and uh, for the, the transferring of DNA samples for the for further forensic analysis. Next, please. Yes. The storage temperatures and durations that were found it to be evident, it was found that temperatures that were used for the purpose of these studies were the storage at room temperatures, at four degrees Celsius temperatures, at minus 20 degrees and at minus 80 degrees Celsius temperatures. Also the storage durations were encountered the, there was I, I have encountered many studies where it was found that the storage short term storage durations work were quite evident in the field and literature was there for two to uh, for one to two years or six months to one month two months of studies but there were less long duration studies and the extraction methods that were commonly used were the phenol chloroform extraction methods and the silica gel based extraction methods that were quite used in the studies. Next, please. The analytical techniques, analytical techniques that were being used for the purpose of identification of uh, concentration and priorities of the sample extracted using these above mentioned uh, methods were UV visible spectrophotometry and spectrofluorometry. And the integrity of the extracted DNA samples were measured using the agarose gel electrophoresis techniques. Now, talking about the results and discussions, it is quite evident that the extraction methods that were used for the purpose of uh, extracted DNA, to, for the purpose of analyzing the purity of the extraction DNA, it was found that the silica-based as well as the phenol chloroform method that were used for the extraction method, it was found that the uh, amount or the value of the extraction methods of this ratio, A260 and nanometer to 280 nanometers, as well as a260 nanometers to 213 nanometers ratio was around 1.8 for the uh, DNA samples and it is to be considered as the purity purest sample for the DNA and it was found that the extracted DNA from silica based and phenol chloroform methods uh, they provided the good quality or good pure uh, pure quality of uh, DNA from the extracted from extracted with this process then the storage conditions, EDTA basically gave good percentage of integrated DNA at four degrees Celsius. Although when we talk about the heparin tubes used for the same purpose, they gave the results for uh, the good uh, integrated DNAs for at least for only nine to 10 days. It was evident that for the heparin tubes, used for more than 10 year, 10 days at 4 degrees Celsius gave less pure, pure like the less extraction yield and integrated uh, DNA. On the other hand, ETTA for 130 days when stored for uh, at 4 degrees Celsius, it gave quite good evident results and was stored. One study I have presented the result in the form of graph where Urta et al. in his study, he actually used biostabilizing techniques using DNA stable blood and DNA guard bloods, which was indicative that the storage of uh, storage temperature of the human blood was quite evident for two months and it shows the purity and uh, good quality in the extraction yield of DNA sample when, when the biostabilizing techniques were used with EDTA tubes, not with the heparin tubes. The EDTA tubes were actually correlated, uh, were added with the DNA 
biostabilizers and it provided the good quality of uh, DNA samples. Next, please. Yes, Hara et al. basically is a scientist. He, pro, uh, he worked for in this field for 20 years and he provided the study where he had actually conducted the study for blood stains as well as for blood samples. For blood stains, he stored the sample at room temperatures 4 degrees Celsius, uh, minus 20 and minus 80 degrees Celsius. On the other hand, the blood samples, the whole blood samples were stored at minus 20 as well as minus 80 degrees Celsius. And the uh, when the uh, studies, yeah, I want the previous slide. Please. Yeah, when the study is being conducted, it was found that the 129 ratio with 41 base pairs and uh, 305 uh, to 41 base pairs, it was found that the EDTS tubes used for this study and showed the blood stains as well as whole blood samples showed quite good results in the minus 20 as well as minus 80 degrees Celsius. Next, please. Yeah, this is the study conducted by Cor et al. in 2020 itself from Forensic Science Laboratory. She has uh, presented the good quality of storage and preservation of samples, as well as the bad quality of uh, storage samples that are being collected by the police officials and transferred to the forensic laboratories. In the above diagram, in the above figure, you can see clearly that A260 and 280 ratio is basically 1.78 that is approximately 1.8 and that's why the collected samples were considered as the good quality stored and preserved samples on the other hand the samples in the, the below figure we can see the average of ratio of a262 to 280 ratio was around 1.2 and this was quite evident that these samples were bad quality collected and they were not collected preserved properly by the police officials and was not reached at the uh, forensic laboratory at the time and uh, it, when it is reached and the analysis was done they found it the fungal growths the contaminated samples and many other forward things next please Yeah, talking about the conclusions on my of my studies, they were based on the, the samples that must be called, uh, properly air dried before the packaging and transported to the forensic laboratories, as well as whenever the stabilizing techniques could also be used for uh, at the room temperatures for immediate storage of DNA samples whenever it is collected and retrieved from the uh, crime scenes, because the biostabilizers are quite useful for uh, storing the samples samples with the EDTA tubes. The EDTA was actually founded to pro provide good quality of uh, DNA com uh, comparative to heparin up to 50 to 130 day, uh, sorry, up to 50 days. It was found the EDTA is quite evident, useful. And whenever the, for the purpose of preliminary blood examinations and for the purpose of forensic DNA analysis, the Hara et al. basically was a scientist. He considered the blood examinations for preliminary. He found it that dried blood stains stored for the sampling were quite useful for the preliminary examinations as well uh, when compared to the whole blood samples stored. Another is the phenol chloroform extraction method was also useful for the purpose of extractions. Now, if we'll talk about this further studies, the collection of blood samples from the crime scene, it can uh, many times found to be difficult using the gauze pieces. Then the cotton swabs can also be considered for this purpose and for the purpose of preliminary examinations. Impact of adding the biostabilizers also to the blood sample stored in EDTA tubes before the storage period. It could also be the matlab, these studies could also be done on for the purpose of studies of forensic DNA analysis, as well as phenol chloroform extraction method is time taking and bears various sample transfer, which can cause contaminations as well. So there are many uh, modified extraction methods that could also be used for this purpose. Another thing is many studies that I've also mentioned earlier that there are many studies that are based on the short term durations and extraction methods the study should also be considered to be done on the for the purpose of long storage methods of uh, dna solutions and blood storage so that the less degraded amount of dna could be utilized or examined whenever we talk about the reexaminations part in the forensic next please these are the references for our studies
Yes, thank you all. Thank you so much, Anjali. Uh, now thank I request the jury member if they have any query from the presenters. Jury member. Uh, just one thing. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, uh, whatever the study she has done, it is uh, already in the domain, I, I think. And uh, uh, because she has done with, uh, she has taken the reference with earlier studies of someone. So forensic samples is always challenge, which I said earlier. So EDTA, we, it is worldwide known, it is the best uh, method to store the blood samples. But many times it is not a liquid blood, you know. Many times it is, uh, it is blood stained um, from earth, from different sources, you know, solid blood. So I think uh, this work needs to be elabor elaborated uh, and goes with more uh, challenge for in six hours. What I mean to say, it's just a suggestion to continue your okay, studies, sir. try to take more challenge samples, try to expertise yourself on that because Yes, a normal sample, it is okay to store the blood, but for challenge samples, you know, and uh, to make these things to understand the police officials is working day and night uh, for in the, at the crime scenes is really difficult. It's very challenging for a forensic scientist uh, to bring them to this notice. So it's okay for us to know. We all know this, but uh, for, for police officials, it is difficult. Yes, sir. Yeah, so challenge samples try with the uh, more challenge samples. Yeah. Sure, sir. Thank you. Anjali? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I can't hear you a voice. The presentation. This, this is based on review article. Yes, ma'am. This is actually based on review article. Yes, so have you ever done any kind of that this is your security of the examination and approach you have any? Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. I guess. Hello. Any practical security of blood? Hello. Ma'am, I think there is some uh, network issue. Uh, yes, yes. And we, I think ma'am is uh, asking for any practical work or any research you have done on, on the topic. If I'm not wrong, Ila, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Ma'am, actually, this study is quite based on the review articles. And further, I'm going to do my work on the basis of that uh, Sir has mentioned the, on the challenge uh, samples to be collected from the crime scene. My further plans are for, the, for doing those samples on it. Yes, great. Fine, fine. Yeah. We wish you all the best for your further study. Thank uh, you, sir. With the permission of jury member and the chairperson, we request to invite our uh, uh, next speaker, Dr. Ruta Bapat. Uh, Madam is going to talk on the topic, going to pay, pay, present a paper on the topic, uh, maximum cranial breadth in section of crania, medical legal importance. And uh, uh, although this is somehow uh, related, uh, uh, somehow related to DNA, but not uh, in a full. So, Madam, uh, over to you. Uh, Dr. Rupa Bapad. Uh, Ma'am, you can unmute, please. Yes. Good afternoon, all. Am I audible? Yes, Madam. Yeah. Good afternoon, all the juries, all the listeners. I'm going to present the topic which is named Maximum Cranial Breadth in Sexing of Crania with the Medical Legal Importance. Myself, Dr. Ruta Bapat, Associate Professor in Dr. D. Bai Patil Medical College, Nehru. Next. Coming with the introduction, the sexing is a common and critical problem in identifying the deceased person from the bones. The record of organic evolution is largely written by the hard parts of the body, that is bones. Hence, the skeleton remains have been used for sexing of the individual in almost all the bones of the human skeleton, showing some degree of sexual dimorphism. 
this is about the introduction the cranial measurement which give the simplest and fairly accurate way of judging the similarity or the differences when comparing the skulls from different racial groups the correct sex determination is a critical requirement in physical anthropology and medical legal cases next please aim and objective of the present study to study the sexual dimorphism in adult human crania by using the two parameters one is the maximum cranial breadth linear and the other parameter is maximum cranial breadth curve next please material and methods total 310 adult human crania of known sex as a male or female were studied for the present study only fully ossified adult crania were included in the present study crania showing wear and tear any fracture or pathology were excluded the measurements means which used were spreading caliper scale thread chalk and marker next these are the measurements means which were used in the present study next coming to what is the option after checking all the parameters the range mean standard deviation of these major means were calculated the identification point for each parameter was taken out from the range demarking points were worked out from the calculated range and finally the difference observed between the means of male and female to know whether it is statistically significant that is the value of p was calculated by applying z test next please coming towards the metrical parameters which were taken the maximum cranial breadth linear which have taken at the right angle to the mid sagittal plane it was taken at the level of midpoint of the supramastoid crest with the help of spreading caliper while the maximum cranial breadth curve have been taken with the same points with the help of thread next now this is the observation table which is showing for the maximum cranial breadth linear uh, where you can see the observation table in that the number of bones which have given 155 male 155 female range have been calculated the mean all the values have been taken in the centimeter standard deviation then there is a identification point percentage of identified bones calculated range demarking point was calculated and finally it has been concluded that the sex difference in the mean values of maximum cranial breadth linear of male and in female cranial is statistically highly significant next please so this uh, you can see uh, this is the maximum cranial breadth which have been uh, studied in the present study and it has been compared with all the other scientists too so this is about the maximum cranial breadth linear next please this is the maximum cranial breadth curve there again the same observation table has been prepared and again the number of bones range mean standard deviation identification point percentage of identified bones calculated range and demarking points were calculated again the sex difference in mean values of the maximum cranial breadth curve of crania is statistically highly significant next please so here uh, we have compared the uh, linear uh, breadth with that of the curved breadth but you can see the difference in case of male and female crania so when we see about the maximum cranial breadth linear and maximum cranial breadth 
uh, we can see uh, there is a difference is there in the curved lens because of the variation in the vault of the crania which give the variable results in the curved braid next please so actually all the studies have been taken with that of the linear braid but in our study only we have taken the curved braid because in this method the curvature of the cranial vault is considered so that's why we have taken specifically the curved braid which is the new study which we have been take next coming towards the summary and conclusion are uh, the 155 male and 155 female cranial were studied metrical data of cranial braid linear and curved were collected the univariate statistical test were applied to the metrical data the sex overlap is observed in both the parameters as it is uh, always sex overlap is there and uh, finally it has been concluded that the maximum cranial braid which is found to be the best discriminating parameter in sexing of crane i have all the references and lastly thank you so much for listening thank you so much thank you so much dr rupa uh, rupa bapak ma'am now i request jury member all this topic is not completely related to the dna but yes, yes. this is important topic uh, which is uh, nowadays uh, Used for the invest in the investigation. So, jury member, if you have any query from Dr. Ruta Bapat, any jury member? Ma'am, I want to ask one thing. Y yes, ma'am. Uh, your study is based on uh, skull you found whether they are of a minor age. or they are adult skull no all the fully ossified cranium ma'am all of they were adult only okay okay fully ossified ma'am yes 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 ma'am so rather than this presentation i want to ask you can we go yes. age estimation on the basis of the cranium in minor cases yes. yes yes ma'am actually actually i have done the uh, you study in that i have studied the sex also uh, at the same time i have studied on the age also and at the same time i have studied the racial differences in uh, the skulls also means i have compared with all the indian skulls with the other how we can able to identify whether it is of indian or whether it is of what age so that is a, a you study i have been used but as for the time limit now only i have been taken this uh, sexing uh, one parameter for the sexing only but i have studied ma'am age related changes too okay thank you ma'am ma'am one question yes yes sir please uh, ma'am you have collected 155 sample male and uh, 155 female it's a very Correct. large in numbers uh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yes 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 you have done this work they really it, it is a, a great work yes thank but, you so but uh, one question is uh, one question is that uh, uh, how it can be uh, what is the percentage and it can rely the accuracy of the result sorry sir what is the So what is the accuracy of the result if we want to determine the sex on the basis of cranial also only on the basis of cranial no on the basis of cranial sir we can give uh, at 90% accurate result sir 90% we can show not only with the breadth but with the other parameters are also involved for example maximum cranial length is there circumference is there and a uh, lot of other factors are there uh, which are the non metrical parameters uh, like uh, superciliary arches and all with mm. those medical legally we can uh, surely 90% we can tell this is a male and this is a female but again at the same time there is a 10% chance is there where the sex overlap is observed means sometimes we can see one female skull which is having the male characters too so that sex mm. overlap is there means we cannot conclude about 100% uh, for any but if we found complete skeleton then yes may may we can give the maximum result sir but only skull we can found according to the literature it is 90% okay thank you thank you thank you sir thank you uh, dr ruta thank you so much thank you
Okay. Now, uh, with the permission of the jury members, let's move forward to our next presentation by Dr. Sukruti Rawal on forensics and periodontia. Uh, Ma'am, can I share my uh, uh, share my screen? Yeah, sure, sure. Give me a moment. Go ahead. Ma'am, is it visible? Uh, not now. Ma'am, now? Uh, yeah. <coughs> Keep it on uh, slideshow mode. Yeah, great. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Sukriti Rawal, MDS third year PG from Department of Periodontology, Manavrachna Dental College. My topic for today's presentation is forensics and periodontium. <coughs> These are the contents. Okay, coming to the introduction, forensic dentistry is a challenging and fascinating branch of forensic science that involves the application of dental sciences in the identification individuals through the comparison of anti- and post-mortem records. The establishment of forensic odontology as a unique discipline has been attributed to Dr. Oscar Amida, who is the father of forensic odontology, who identified the victims of a fire accident in Paris in France in 1898. So the recent terrorist attacks and natural disasters in which there have been multiple fatalities has reinforced the need of trained, experienced forensic odontologists who have undergone training in mock disasters in order to coordinate the response to such events properly. So periodontics is a science which deals with diseases of periodontium. The study of periodontal structures uh, post-mortem can help in the identification of time of death, sex, of the decrease. So here is uh, an example uh, where for forensic odontology has played uh, an important. In this, uh, the uh, the highly traumatic uh, the the accidents, uh, the uh, the fire fire accidents, and as well as the road. Uh, for example, in this case, as you can see, uh, whether where the entire soft tissue is decomposed, but still the denture is remaining. And in this, the road accident case, where, uh, where there's mandibular fracture seen, but still this, uh, the teeth are intact and the soft tissues are also intact. So we can, we can uh, identify the decreased from, uh, from these evidences. And this is the fire, fire case from, uh, from which the uh, dental extracts can be taken and the decrease can be identified. Materials and methods. So a PubMed search was done and uh, last 10 years articles were taken. Uh, with the keywords forensic dentistry and DNA analysis and this uh, re research was done and the presentation was prepared. So interrelationship of periodontics with forensics. These are the, these are the examples from which uh, we can uh, actually correlate periodontics with peri uh, forensics. For example, gingival morphology and pathology. Uh, the recession, the gingival recession, for example, uh, can, uh, can uh, we can identify the age of the patient, like uh, recession is mo mostly seen in the patients with, uh, with periodontitis and periodontitis is most commonly seen in the middle age patients. So if there is more recession, uh, uh, so we can identify the patient as a, um, as a middle age patient and also the plaque in calculus deposits. Calculus deposits are generally more uh, in males compared to the females. And uh, the period similarly, periodontal ligament morphology and pathology, the thickness and widening, and uh, the periodontal abscess, these are also mostly evident in the uh, middle age patient or the older age patients. So the status of alveolar bone, similarly, the bone loss. Bone loss is, a, is another, uh, is another uh, uh, symptom or let's say, uh, let's say symptom of perid periodontal, uh, periodontal diseases. So it is also in uh, older patients rather than in the younger patients. And then cosmetic surgeries. So we can also identify a patient depending on the cosmetic surgeries. He has already periodontal cosmetic surgery. He has gone uh, undergone before his death. For example, crown lengthening procedure or hemisection. 
So age estimation can also be done uh, with the uh, gingival dissection, as I have told earlier. Then the estimation of gingival epithelium, cell death occurs by apoptosis. Liberation of uh, tissue fluids causes cell uh, autolysis, summing up to the cause of decomposition of the corpse. So <clears throat> histological examination of gingival, gingival tissues procured the post-mortem and anti-mortem samples at different time intervals revealed that decomposition process is initiated within 10 hours after the death and uh, other cellular changes occur subsequently. So this is how we extract the uh, gingival tissue. At gingiva, this is the attached gingiva. And we take a interdental brush and we scrape it off to take the cells. And then these cells are ident uh, the cells are identified uh, by PCR method and we can estimate the uh, age or uh, the sex of the patient by determining the sex determining region by the SRY gene amplification. Similarly, immunohistochemistry can be done uh, to uh, identify the distribution and expression of hypoxia inducible factor, uh, which is also found in gingival tissues in order to establish a correlation between protein expression and the post-mortem interval. So uh, we can say that HIF1 degrades when the uh, post, when there is the uh, long post mortem interval. So we can do, do this by uh, using light microscopy uh, cells as well. And then the rugoscopy. Rugoscopy is another method for the identification. Uh, Ryuge are also known as plica palatine. Uh, they are the asymmetrical connective tissue located on the anterior third of the palatal palatal region behind the incisive papilla. This is the incisive papilla and uh, here the rugae are located. So we, uh, according to the number of rugae, we can identify the age of the patient. We can take click the pictures and we can identify whether the patient is a younger patient or older patient as rugae decreases with age. Then after that, gingival connective tissue undergo several morphological changes in, uh, involving both cellular components and extracellular uh, matrix. So uh, particularly collagen type 1 is present more in the gingival connective tissue that is 90% of the total human collagen. And with time, the type 1 collagen uh, degrades. So in uh, as the post-mortem interval uh, in, uh, exceeds, the type 1 collagen degrades. So post-mortem intervals depending on the tissue retrieval. So there are three types of post-mortem intervals. First is the short post-mortem interval uh, where the tissues are obtained within three days after death. And then uh, the second is the mid post-mortem interval where the tissues are obtained four to six days after the death. And uh, long post-mortem interval tissues obtained within seven to nine, uh, seven to nine days after the death. So here is a study by, given by M.C. Mezzotti in 2019. He did a study combining uh, morphological and immunohistochemical uh, uh, analysis where he extracted the, extracted the cellular components, uh, that is the connective tissue, extracellular matrix of gingival tissue, and collected at different post-mortem interval. And then he, and, uh, he did his analysis using the transmission electron microscopy with combination with the immunohistochemistry detection. And he detected collagen type 1 and collagen type 3. So uh, he basically used 10 cadavers and divided them into three intervals. That is the uh, short post-mortem interval, uh, then mid-post-mortem and long post-mortem interval. And he took the control as well. So the result showed that there was gradual degradation uh, degradation of the extracellular matrix in the connective tissue in relation to different time of death. So th this is the pictorial uh, description. This is, uh, th this is the um, oral epithelium. The green part is the connective tissue and the red part is uh, the oral epithelium. So as, as you can see in the short, short post-mortem interval, uh, the colors are still there. But uh, as the, as the post-mortem interval, it shows the degradation of the tissue and this is the control. So uh, similarly in connective tissue, uh, the collagen type 1 was seen. So uh, in the short, as, as you can see, there is uh, the degradation of collagen type 1 from short post-mortem post interval to the long post-mortem interval and this is the control. 
also cementum can be a very good marker for the age estimation of the deceased as the the uh, cementum is a connective tissue and a part of periodontium that surrounds the tooth and is deposited throughout the life so there are incremental lines on the cementum you can see here uh, there are incremental lines these are the incremental lines and with each incremental uh, each incremental line is deposited every year so of the patient by using this formula number of incremental lines uh, is equal to the total width of the cementum from the uh, from the dentino cementum junction to the width of the cementum so number of incremental lines can be estimated and with the number of incremental lines we can estimate the age of the patient or the or the decay so um, uh, this this phenomenon is uh, basically this this test is known as dental cementum incremental analysis so uh, also the season can be uh, estimated because uh, weddell in 2007 he did a study and he showed that opaque bands were seen in uh, the that is in the early october and the incremental lines in the uh, in april showed the translucent bands so we can uh, by the, by this we can also estimate the uh, the season of the uh, dickies the death of the dickies so uh, gingival margin the marginal tissues uh, rec recession of periodontium has been used as one of the several indicators of age in methods of age estimation gingival tissue change uh, so given uh, a study given by guru raj in 2004 he uh, studied that the post mortem changes in gingival tissues gingival section from the de uh, dead individual showed vacuolation of the nuclei in the spinous layer of the epithelium and also La langerhans cells can be seen uh, the count of langerhans cells and the frequency of oral mu uh, mucosal langerhans cells varies inversely with the degree of keratinization then and alveolar bone in age the measurement of alveolar bone level the voice is not clear no ma'am so the bone according to the bone loss and the alveolar resorption also we can estimate the age of and then also the uh, melanin pigment uh, the pigmentation the, the basically the stains on the teeth so the more stains are seen in the patient the male patient rather than in a female patient so we can identify the patient according to the stains present on the teeth so coming to the co conclusion forensic odontologist identifies a person by determining the sex age and uh, using the gingival tissue bone all the forms of dental treatment and uh, dental records and uh, preserves so um, the periodontists also actively participate in this research as you have seen taken by the gingival tissues and the periodontium these are the thank you uh thank you dr sukhi now uh we request the jury members uh, if we have question for dr sukruti uh one question if you allow it oh, yes yes sir please uh ma'am uh, as you have said the stain can help in determination of that is there any study on the on this issue this uh, this is also taken from an article only sir uh, basically stay uh, sir in uh, sir in perio what what happens hmm. is mostly uh, the male patient smokes more, more than the female patient so the stains are uh, more prominent in the uh, male teeth than uh, rather than a female teeth so but ma'am this is hypothetical uh, nowadays uh, women also smoking so you can't yes. say on the basis of the stain yes sir <laughs> Yes, sir. So, but I think this was this also is, taken from a study. Okay, ah, so this may be taken as an additional point of view. Yes, sir. Okay, ma'am. Ma Next, ma'am. Uh, how many samples you have taken for your study? Sorry, ma'am. How many samples you have taken for your study? 
ma'am it's it's a review study ma'am actually uh, i i have just reviewed the articles ma'am the last 10 years articles since you are in field you are from field of odontology that's why only i asked Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, but I have reviewed uh, the ten years articles, and then I formed this presentation. Okay. Whatever you have given in your presentation, have you ever seen actually in your when you go through the practice? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, the uh, all of these things, ma'am. Ma'am, we see in the daily basis only, ma'am. But but we haven't done, ma'am. Uh, particularly, we haven't done it in our college yet. Uh, but I'm looking forward to do it, ma'am, because I'm really interested in forensics. and definitely this required forensic odontology is a field where lot of work is required to do yes ma'am yes ma'am especially in the cases where road accidents ma'am where we can't uh, identify the case and uh, we, we are still we have still remains of the uh, gingival tissues in periodontium there it is very useful for the skeletal remains in the accidental road you get other things also from which you can get the profile So from the skeletal remains, hardly we get bone or bone part, sometimes tooth. So at this stage, it is very helpful for the forensic. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, um, Dr. Sukruti. Now we have our next presentation, and uh, by Dr. Swamya Jam. The topic is. जी मानव रचना डेंटल कॉलेज एंड आई बी टॉकिंग ऑन द टॉपिक पेरियोस्कोप इन डी एन ए फॉरेंसिक्स दीज आर दस ऑफ द प्रेजेंटेशन coming to the introduction periodontitis is a chronic inflammatory disease of the periodontium and its advanced form is characterized by loss of periodontal ligament and destruction of surrounding alveolar bone although dysbiosis of the local microbial community initiates local inflammation over activation of the host immune response directly activates the osteoclastic activity and alveolar bone loss next slide ma'am cytokines are the key modulators of both homeostasis and inflammatory processes that act in the first wave of responses against pathogens and stimuli at barrier sites and connect tissue cells with lymphocytes and accessory cell populations so this is the representation of a diagram in which how periodontitis happens is being explained now we know that in healthy state the local challenge and mild host immune response are balanced whereas in this state there is an appropriate number of infiltrating neutrophils in gingival sulcus as well as the resident immune cells are present in the gingival tissue which includes helper t17 cells and the lymphoid cells so when the immune pathogenicity of the local microbiota is elevated by uh, colonization of the keystone pathogens as we can see there is colonization of the keystone pathogens uh, in the dysbiosis of microbia community it over activates the host immune response so the immune pathogenicity of the local microbiota is elevated by the colonization of keystone pathogens and it further leads to the cytokine secretion which mainly participates in the amplification of pro inflammatory cytokine cas cascade and the uh, lymphocyte production so basically there is a destruction of tissue and it leads to periodontitis which is inflammation of periodontium which includes four structures gingiva cementum periodontal ligament and the alveolar bone next slide ma'am coming to the deoxyribonucleic acid analysis identification of humans by dna isolation from several biological samples is one of the most sought after approach the prospective sources for procuring dna from the vicinity are the crime scenes though whole blood is considered as a prolific cache for dna its collection and storage requires high level precision aseptic environment and a professional approach next slide ma'am so this is the uh, diagram which is basically showing the dna fingerprinting in this these are the short tandem repeats which are the basically micro satellites which are the allele repeats at specific loci in dna between two or more samples and these are 2 to 7 base pairs in length repeats next slide ma'am 
Coming to the saliva in forensics, use of saliva and mouth swabs as sources of DNA show some technical advantages over the use of blood, which includes the following. First, collection will be easier. Second, painless method in collection. Third, it can be done on children and elderly subjects. Fourth, does not have any religious implications which are present while using blood. And it is a safe method as compared to the blood which has higher potential risks of contamination. Now, these are the bite marks. Bite marks are also very useful in DNA forensics, as we can see in the case of sexual assault, murder, or any child abuse. Now, there are some programs which are commonly used in victim identification, such as Odento Search, then Automatic Dental Identification System, which is a computer-aided software for post-mortem identification of deceased individuals, which are based on dental characteristics, especially radiographs. Third is the computerized assisted post-mortem identification system, which is used to facilitate the rapid identification of human remains by chart screenings. Then is the dental profiling, which includes extracting a triad of information, first descendants, ethnic origin, then the gender, and then age. And last is the age determination. Coming to the review of literature, a search was conducted and various databases were used such as PubMed, Scopus and Embase and many articles were seen and evaluated. Many of the search articles were the review articles in which some were case control studies and some were RCTs. Uh, these number of articles were searched in which around these articles showed the studies that are related to the role of periodontics in DNA forensics. Next slide, ma'am. After studying many articles, it was seen that though blood is a prolific cache for DNA, storage and collection of it requires high level precision, as a result of which non-invasive methods such as saliva has come into limelight since many years. Periodontics, which is the branch of dentistry that deals with health and disease of periodontium, in that role of DNA is that it is responsible for all the cell activities, yield the valuable information in both the healthy and diseased individuals, and periodontology can help in forensics in unfolding mysteries related to any criminal investigation. So how basically perio is related to DNA forensics. As we all know, the cell death occurs by apoptosis, necrosis, or autolysis. So the liberation of tissue fluids, um, which causes the cell autolysis, runs to cause evident decomposition of corpse. Although cementum, also cementum, which is a connective tissue and a part of periodontium, surrounds the tooth and it is deposited throughout the life. So this deposition occurs in the form of concentric incremental lines, and each line corresponds to one year of life. And these incremental lines can be calculated as x by y, where x is total width of cementum from dentinocemental junction to the cementum surface upon y, which is the width of cementum between two adjacent incremental lines. Coming to the conclusion, further research in the field of periodontics can add a new horizon to the scope of forensics and multiple discoveries pertaining to the field of forensics can be seen. Thus, there is seen that there is a scope of field of periodontics in DNA forensics. Next slide, ma'am. These are the, my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Soumya, uh, for the presentation. Now, I request uh, jury members, do we have questions for Dr. Soumya Jan? Uh, Dr. Soumya, one question. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, will you help me, uh, tell me how the DNA, uh, I mean, teeth can help in determination of ident uh, identification of uh, individual? So, uh, DNA in teeth, sir. Hmm. Sir, actually, uh, right now the studies are going on and on how whether the uh, teeth, how they are related, sir. First of all, there are various factors like uh, if I'm talking about the periodontium, then gingiva, cementum, this is very related. As we know that cell death can occur by apoptosis, necrosis or autolysis. So when there is liberation of tissue fluid, it causes the cell autolysis, which can lead to the evident decomposition of corpse. And sir, cementum, which is a connective tissue and a part of periodontium, it surrounds the tooth and is deposited throughout the life. So sir, this deposition can occur in the form of incremental lines and each line corresponds to the uh, one year of life. So we can calculate it as 
x by y where x is the total width of cementum from dentino cemental junction to cemental surface and y is the width of cementum between two edges and incremental lines okay what is the role of uh, bite mark in identification of an individual uh, sir the role of bite mark is that bite marks are useful in the case if there is a sexual assault case or any murder or in child abuse those still studies are being compared that whether dna finger uh, like the dna fingerprinting is very useful uh, still the teeth uh, the studies related to teeth are still happening that if they are like quite useful like the dna fingerprinting in the criminal investigation cases sir I mean, uh, do you think it is reliable uh, bite mark on the basis of identification is reliable? Um, so, uh, uh, though the the bite mark is being considered, but it can also get uh, uh, faded over period of time, and so uh, bite marks is basically a physical evidence, like for some period mm -hmm. of time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Samia. Just, Samia. Just yes, one. Ma just one. Bite appear they can be casted or not uh, sorry ma'am i'm not able to hear if white marks are physically appear yes they can be casted or not. from the casted tooth can you influence any forensic info information um i'm like if we cast it on the tooth then uh uh, because bite marks can get faded over a period of time, so that can be used as a future reference for the uh, identification of the victim. Uh, um, no, you are not getting my point. Yes, you sir. are getting bite marks on any object or on the body of the victim. Okay, we are able right now. Are we able to cast it or not? Ma'am, I don't know regarding it, right? Fine. But ma'am, that will not serve the purpose related to forensic, I think, casting of uh, right. mark. It just lead to uh, haphazard identification. I think it is just a presumptive, uh, like I suppose uh, uh, we have talking about so many things about it, a uh, bone. We in forensic the most reliable is DNA, and uh, with all these, this this can be a present, yeah, this can be a presumptive one, but I think uh, it won't happen. But in foreign countries, they have a cast, and when they got the deceased having yes, any physical appearance, like that is uh, that is cast. a casting like shoe mark, tire mark, uh, it is uh, it is it casted, is, and then that is compared. That is. That is very. Uh, that one aspect needs to be you know, studied, uh, dedicate. That is what I am saying. If you are for DNA, then it's nothing to do all these things. Yeah, when you have DNA, nothing to do. But uh, all the these are parallel things. We should uh, go on along with DNA. I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is also a part yeah. of uh, part of an investigation. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samia. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Judy members. And uh, now uh, we have our next presenter, Dr. Ritika Sharma. Uh, Dr. Ritika, can you please? Good afternoon, ma'am. I want to share my screen, ma'am. Yeah, sure. Sorry. Ma'am, is it visible? Yes. So my topic is on salivary signature in forensic profiling. These are the contents. So basically, uh, saliva is secreted from the three major glands that is parotid, submandibular, and sublingual. And the comp and the composition of saliva is basically when uh, CO two is infused in the uh, in the gland, in the gland, and uh, with a uh, combination of uh, water, uh, hydrogen carbonate is released, in which uh, hydrogen and sodium ions are released. 
uh, and in the composition of saliva there is uh, there are organic and inorganic uh, substances in which enzymes are also there in or in organic substances like amylase maltase lipase lysozyme and uh, some uh, other organic uh, organic substances are proteins bl uh, blood group antigen free amino acids and uh, in inorganic there are sodium calcium potassium bicarbonate bromide chlorine and oxygen carbon dioxide and nitrogen so how do we collect uh, how do we collect uh, cal uh, saliva first is stimulated uh, expectoration every 30 seconds as in we uh, have to spit it and uh, by gustatory acids as in the stimulation of the saliva and mechan uh, and mechanical chewing by uh, chewing of paraffin wax uh, band or chewing gums unstimulated saliva is in uh, uh, draining method spitting suction swab method how is it better it is better because it is in uh, non non invasive easy and cost effective saliva does not clot population based screening risk stratification prognosis recent advances in salivary biomarkers for di uh, diagnosis of many disease salivary concentration better uh, represent circulating levels of uh, free hormones so how the dna extracted is extracted from saliva first the D, uh, saliva sample is taken uh, then lysis lysis is the basically breakdown of saliva and binding buffer is uh, induced in uh, this by cmac dna particles in buffer uh, the extracted they extract the dna basically they act like a magnet so that is a cmac is uh, uh, in uh, introduced in the uh, saliva uh, salivary solution and uh, after that the dna is uh, Uh, DNA is ex extracted from the saliva. Material and method. A literature search was per uh, performed on electronic databases, PubMed, Scholar, and other keywords with salivary bi microbiome uh, forensics. And uh, in May two thousand eighteen, which revealed three articles from PubMed and seventy eighteen seven eighty nine art uh, results from Google Scholar. Uh, relevant articles from databases and references tracking were uh, were shortlisted on the basis of inclusion criteria pertaining the role of saliva in reconstructive forensic identification so basically why salivary signature any traces that uh, of saliva left behind in bite marks or lip prints which gives information about age gender personal identification health status of the individual is used to create salivary signature shown diagrammatically following are the details of component of salivary signature so what happens when uh, when we why why do we need salivary signature in case of any crime so for one there is comparative identification this is when we know a suspect if we know a suspect we can take the saliva we can take uh, extract G, uh, dna from it and we can uh, and we can uh, compare the uh, suspect if they are two sub, uh, suspect we can compare in uh, in from them and if we don't know any uh, identification or anything in salivary signature we can uh, we can get uh, personal characteristics health status age and gender in personal ca characteristics salivary microbiome like gene location is there health status salivary biomarker is there if there are any uh, health issues in the uh, human like uh, oral disease or any uh, type of cancer or any uh, inflammatory disease can be extracted from the salivary dna age by methylation gender by hormones that are uh, that can be uh, that can be get, uh, get the information from the saliva like testosterone or anything salivary microbiome uh, so in saliva in dental biofilm there are many bacteria so salivary bio, uh, microbiomes like mogi bacterium streptococcus gamella p uh, provetella campylobacter are the main uh, salivary uh, microbiome that exist in the saliva and as well as in dental film biofilm so how the analysis of the salivary uh, by microbiome is done first the collection of the sample is taken then the uh, directed or undirected uh, se sequencing is done uh, by ta uh, taxonomic uh, distribution taxonomic distribution is the family uh, in which we uh, get the species of the uh, like if we have species species uh, genus 
family and they are the many taxonomes when where we can uh, distribute them then analysis of the dna or rna is done in the sci uh, salivary microbiome and the identification is done on the basis of uh, basis of forensics so what actually uh, in forensics it is a sample collection that is saliva dna extraction tax, uh, taxonomic uh, classification in which species genus family order class phylum kingdom or domain we identify refraction library uh, preparation amplification then statistical uh, data analysis uh, taxonomic profiling and differential analysis is done in which alpha diversity and beta diversity is gained So time of collection, uh, bacterial taxonomic data vary with different time points, hence may be linked with uh, to time of death based or post-mortem interval in estimation. However, more than salivary microbes signature, mm -hmm. gut, bones and skin are majorly researched during the decomposition. Personal identity, on the basis of fingerprints in saliva, uh, of the victim, the sexual assault case may link to the suspect to the crime. The microbial DNA also relate to the categorically to the ancestral genomic uh, background, identifying the ethnicity of the uh, suspect. Literature holds the uh, prospect of the fingerprint bacteria, especially Streptococcus salivarius or of viridin group, present in saliva in association with the suspect's saliva, collected from the bite mark. Variation of age. So basically. Uh, before six hours, there is a sterile environment of during the birth. After six hours, uh, six hours of birth, the uh, bacterial uh, bacterial colonization begins. The early colonization is marked with the presence of staph Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, Entero, Ent Enterococcus, Micrococcus, and Velinula. This slowly transform uh, transforms into S. salivaris in infants uh, found in the tongue. Diverse Streptococcus species and Actinomyces dominate the bacterial flora with the interruption of teeth and formation of dentine plaque. The flora becomes com uh, comparable to adult from the age of five years with the absence of spirochetes and P. vertella, uh, uh, prevotella melangio, uh, melanogenic, uh, melanogenic uh, as exception. However, loss of teeth can cause marked decrease spirochetes, streptococcus, sanigenis, lactobacillus. Age by methylation of DNA from saliva can yield the age of the person within the five years of uh, five years uh, approximately. Persistence. So basically, our human DNA is a eukaryotic cells and uh, prokaryotic cells are the bacterial DNA. So more uh, the eukaryotic DNA, eukaryotic cells DNA that is linear DNA can be destroyed easily rather than prokaryotic DNA that is uh, that is uh, protected by a cell wall and not easily destroyed. Salivary biomarkers. There are many salivary biomarkers, just like prostaglandins, in until you can uh, six alpha, beta, TNF, MMPs. These are the inflammatory biomarkers that can uh, give us the uh, give us the details about any uh, disease in the human body, uh, like uh, Jogren syndrome or any leukemia or any uh, deficiency uh, of the vitamins or any deficiency in the body, like anemia. This can be given by the salivary biomarkers. Gender, unstimulated whole saliva, flow rates, as well as the salivary constitute of testosterone, etc., are different in males and females. NA from saliva can yield the age of the person within five years approximately. Potential scope, a scope of salivary signature in forensic dentistry. Forensic dentistry is inevitable uses teeth for reconstructive profiling of individual by age and gender assessment. This can be further strengthened by analysis of oral fluids like saliva for its constituent and hence salivary signature to uh, ascertain the complete biological profile of the individual. The forensic dentist can uh, prove instrumental in initiating the oral microbial data banks, which are geographical location and population specific. Further, multiple systemic and oral condition can be explored for uh, specific uh, gel, uh, salivary genomics or biomarkers, which invariably hold the great research potential in forensic dentistry. Conclusion. 
Salivary signature can be useful in for forensics once the technique of collection and storage of saliva are made more robust. In the branch of dentistry, a periodontist plays an immense role in collection of oral microbiota as salivary biomarker, which can add in da uh, data banks depending on their geographical location and demographics, and therefore it can provide a scope of uh, comparative geological and personal identification. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ratik. Now I request my jury members. Uh, do we have questions for Dr. Ratika? Ritika, yes, yes ma'am. Yes, yes, ma other than DNA forensic, it is very useful. Thank you, ma'am. Other than DNA forensic, because forensic odontology very much needed in India. No much work is done. Yes, you go through the you go through the prior um, odontological data. There is no data found as such in medical colleges. Yes. Yes, ma'am. So, there is a lot of scope of research. Go ahead, all the best. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Ritika. Now, with the permission of uh, jury members, I'll move forward to the last presentation in the professional category uh, by Dr. Ruchi Pandey. Good afternoon, all. Uh, good afternoon, jury members and whosoever is attending this uh, conference. So I like to introduce my topic with the thing that it is a review article and it is in under the review category only. My topic for the day is gene polymorphisms in periodontitis. So as we all know that long back around 20 years back, the human genome project had started and it, the entire human genome was decoded in year 2003. But still there are a lot of single nucleotide polymorphisms and mutations that do happen. And ultimately the human passwords keeps changing. So we need to decode it every time to find out where the single nucleotide polymorphisms are happening in different races and to find out that how uh, a domain or a, uh, like any disease is being linked to this uh, polymorphisms. Next slide, please. The Human Genome Project, which was the first international scientific research project, and it was one of the world's largest collaborative biological project, started in year 1984, and by US government, it was funded in year 1990. Entire human genome was decoded on 14th April 2003, and approximately 22,300 genes were decoded after this. We came to a conclusion that 3.1 billion base pairs do exist in the human genome. And finally, the, after this entire project was over, there was a lot of race among the humans to find out that which gene is being or what are the candidate genes which can be linked to the various diseases. And we can enter a new era where a gene therapy can be given. Next slide, please. I will like to talk about the genetic polymorphisms that what actually are they. It refers to the occurrence of two or more genetically determined phenotypes in a certain population in proportions that are the rarest of the characteristics cannot be maintained just by recurrent mutations. So actually it is 1% of the population, whatever changes we can see. And mutation is something which is very less and sudden in onset. Next slide, please. I like to talk about the disease since this disease I am trying to link with the different single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is a periodontitis disease and how it occurs. So whenever there is a bacterial attack to the periodontium, periodontium includes four tissues. That is the gingiva, alveolar bone, <coughs> periodontal ligament, 
so whenever there is a destruction which happens because of the plaque accumulation there is a breakdown of the periodontal ligament and there is a loss of bone therefore you can see that instrument penetrating and leading to the clinical attachment loss next slide please <coughs> the periodontitis is a multifactorial in nature it is related to the microflora it is related to adipose adipocyte inflammation production it is related to the various dietary factors and most importantly it is related with genetics and the environmental factors above all uh, i will like to stress on this point that recently our periodontitis which was previously it was categorized into chronic and aggressive and periodontitis manifestation of systemic diseases actually there are three categories for periodontitis but now everything has changed to periodontitis in year 2017 by a author tonetti and the various uh, periodontists across the world they collaborated and they came to a conclusion that periodontitis can only happen because of the pathogenic microflora so here you can see that uh, there is a pathogenic oral microflora that is nothing but the plaque which keeps accumulating for over the ages and that leads to the inflammation and the host inflammatory factors also play a role in the periodontal destruction next slide please so together everything will lead to the periodontitis that means the breakdown of the periodontal ligament so the new this is the new classification which is based on the staging and grading it all it's been divided into severity complexity and the extent and the distribution of it the periodontitis it is divided into stage 1 2 3 and 4 depending upon the clinical attachment loss radiographic bone loss depending upon the local uh, local uh, things like the probing depth and also it also depends on the number of the teeth which are involved i will not like to go into the details of it because there are other things which also needs to be included next please uh this is a single nucleotide polymorphisms i need to explain over here that actually what happens in the single nucleotide polymorphism this single nucleotide polymorphism is actually whenever there is a single like adenine or a guanine gets replaced by another like supposing adenine is replaced by guanine then guanine always pairs with the cytosine so cytosine will come into the place so ultimately what happens is once the base pair changes protein that is the gene which is coding a particular protein will also get changed so for because of this one polymorphic change the entire protein can get changed and it can affect the phenotype so this is how a genotype can affect a phenotype of an individual next slide please so these are yes since this is a meta analysis which i am uh, which has been done by different authors therefore they have done on the basis of the previous classification only and here you can see the analysis done by silva et al who had demonstrated at the position minus 889 that a cytosine replaces the thymine polymorphism was significantly associated with a higher risk of chronic periodontitis another thing which they also found which is which is actually linked with the periodontitis so far excuse me uh, th that was plus 3954 in interleukin 1 beta gene excuse me the slides are changing uh can i share my own screen am i audible uh yes i'm really sorry uh, give me one second ne can i share my own screen that will be fine I, or like uh yes you can just a second although if you are comfortable uh, is uh, this came again yeah it is now uh, is it visible 
Yes. Hello, now is it visible? Yes, yeah. you go ahead. It is visible okay. and audible okay. also. You go, go ahead. ahead. Thank you so much, sir. So plus 3954C by T in interleukin 1 beta gene is not significantly associated with the risk of developing either chronic or aggressive. But these all changes are actually depends on the ethnicity of an individual again. Coming to the interleukin 4, which is actually a pro-inflammatory cytokine, is capable of inducing apoptosis of osteoblast and thus contributing to the progression of alveolar bone loss. Here again, minus 590 and minus 33 uh, C by T uh, is related to the, these are the single nucleotide polymorphisms. And in the German, Brazilian, and Chinese, uh, these populations were found to be associated with the disease that is periodontitis. Interleukin-6 is a potent mediator, again, for the bone resorption and is capable of stimulating macrophages and osteoclasts with increased tissue damage in both types of the periodontitis. That means the chronic and aggressive both. Coming to another, that is the interleukin-8. In the meta-analysis, it was found that the risk is still controversial whether it can be linked or not, because in one population it was more, that is in the Brazilian, and in Asians it was found that it is more. Uh, this was a meta-analysis done by the Chen et al. Interleukin-10, which is a suppressor cytokine that regulates negatively the immunological response of monocytes and macrophages. So when minus 592 C by A polymorphisms was found. It was found that it was associated with high risk of disease development in the population. Coming to interleukin 18, the meta-analysis done by the Lee et al. He also found that there was a significant association of polymorphisms with a high level of cytokine in the plasma of the patients with the disease when compared to the controls. Next slide, please. Now we are coming to something called as a FC gamma R receptors, which are very important for us as a periodontist, since these can these are being linked to the disease. FC gamma R receptors, which are of three types: one A, two A, and um, three A. So here they have found that these are also related to the uh, periodontitis. However, FC gamma R three A receptor was not found associated with the periodontitis. Coming to the inflammatory mediators, that is COX-2 and MMP-2, MMP-3, 8, and 9 genes. The meta-analysis was done and there was no significant association which was found between the COX-2 gene and periodontitis. However, they have found that still the more studies and the long-term studies uh, or genome-wide studies needs to be done to found and find an uh, appropriate association. Recently, there was a meta-analysis done by Shao in which he tried to find out that whether beta defensin 1 can be linked to the periodontitis. So the meta-analysis says that, uh, which is actually, it is the gene is located on chromosome 8. It was found that it cannot be linked to the periodontitis. Next slide, please. So how are these single nucleotide polymorphisms can be linked to the forensics? There are microsatellite repeats, polymorphisms, which are actually four to five nucleotide repeats through genome, used frequently in forensic genetics lab. Forensic genetists need additional markers in some conditions where STR analysis are insufficient, such as a DNA degradation after environmental exposure, paternity analysis or kinship analysis after close relatives marriage and absence of suspect for comparison after criminal cases. SNPs are broadly used in clinics for genome-wide association studies of complex disorders and linkage analysis studies of a single gene disorders. So the presence of millions of SNPs in our DNA sequence means that SNPs can be used for distinguishing people in forensic cases because of the amplicon length in the short, that is 100 to 200 base pairs is only required. And after PCR reaction of SNP analysis, SNPs can provide more information than STR analysis, especially in the presence of the degraded DNA. Next slide. Next slide, please. So these are my references. And um, 
I thank you all for your patient listening. You can change the slide, sir, further. That was the last slide. Uh, sir, there were two more. Okay, thanks. Uh, that was the two uh, reference slide. This was, uh, this is and this one. Then, the, yeah, 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 two. In case if anybody slide. wants to see the After references. That, uh, and sir, my name is Dr. Somehow the Ritika Sharma name is being entered at uh, the footer. Okay, we will correct it. Thank you, sir. members. So thank you, uh, all the presenters. We have uh, today seven presenters, those who have uh, presented. Now I request my co-host Kritika to take over the session further. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you to all the presenters. And uh, also, in uh, I request the jury members, do we, do we have any questions for Dr. Ruchi Pandey? Uh, okay. So, okay, thank you, sir. So I guess we have uh, no more questions for uh, the presenter. Now, also, I request the presenter, if they are still available in the uh, conference, kindly answer uh, your uh, queries in the chat session because some of the uh, participants are actually asking for some queries related to your presentation. So every individual presenter, kindly revert on the uh, chat session as well. Thank you. With this, we have completed our uh, all the pre presentation of professional category uh, paper presentation. And uh, now, best of luck to all the presenters. Uh, the results will be declared tomorrow. Now, let's with this. I want to uh, want to speak a thankful note to all the jury members. And I request before this, Dr. Anna Ma'am, to kindly give a concluding remark on the on all the presenters for all the presenters. Dr. Anna Ma'am. Yes. Thanks to our presenters for their interesting presentations about a wide range of methods currently studied for forensic applications. Each method has its own advantages and limitations, and each is at a different state of technical development, such as we have seen. Forensic DNA Laboratory has to deal with a wide range of challenging forensic samples due to the exposition to varying environmental conditions, variable degradation, presence of PCR inhibitors. Due to this, the choice of an adequate analytical method is the most critical step in order to get final results useful to assist the forensic investigations. Because of this, research in forensic DNA typing is always in progress, and I sincerely appreciate the efforts of the today presenters to give their contribution to this way. So thank you again, and please go on um, with this way. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna Now, we move forward. With, uh, and I'm thankful to all the jury members. With this, I will request Dr. Uh, Dr. Anna Ma'am to kindly accept the certificate of appreciation in sincere acknowledgement for the outstanding service as chairperson for paper presentation of the panel at second international e-conference on theme DNA forensics. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Thank you again for your kind invitation. I hope to contribute again to other conference and uh, many congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Also, we are very we are very much thankful to all the honorable jury members. And with this, we request Dr. Nadesh Kumar sir to kindly accept the certificate of appreciation in recognition of their earnest contribution as jury member for acknowledging the outstanding paper presentation professional category at second international e-conference on theme DNA forensics.
Thank you, sir. Thank you to Dr. Jahangir, sir. And please accept our certificate of appreciation in recognition of their earliest contribution as jury member for acknowledging the outstanding paper presentation professional category at Second International E Conference on Theme DNA Forensics. Thanks, Thank sir. you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Ila, ma'am, and kindly accept our certificate of appreciation in recognition of the earnest contribution as jury member for acknowledging the outstanding paper presentation professional category at Second International E Conference on Theme DNA Forensics. Thank you, ma'am. Also, thank you to Dr. Nadeem, sir. Uh, kindly accept our certificate of appreciation in recognition of their earnest contribution as jury member for acknowledging the outstanding paper presentation professional category at Second International E Conference on Theme DNA Forensics. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you to all honorable jury members. Thank you to all chairperson and uh, jury member for uh, giving your valuable time. Uh, hope we are going to get the best paper out of your uh, uh, point which we are going to share. And uh, tomorrow we will announce the uh, of the result of this uh, paper presentation in professional category. With this, uh, with the permission of the present chairperson and the jury member, we are uh, about to move the next session. That is a e-poster category, professional category, e-poster presentation. And uh, in this e-poster presentation of professional category, we have uh, our chairperson as uh, Professor uh, Ma Teresa de Guzman from University of Philippines, uh, Manila. Uh, Professor Teresa, over to you. Okay, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me introduce the members of the jury uh, in this session. Um, Dr. S. K. Paul is currently working as the Assistant Director in Biology and Serology, Division State Forensic Science Laboratory, Junga Inja. Dr. Paul is the head of the Biology and Serology Division. Dr. Paul was the Media Officer, Nodal Officer, Disaster Victim Identification Cell of RFSL, Daramashala, he is currently the spokesman of the State Forensic Laboratory and Directorate of Forensic Services, Himachalal Pradesh, and had been the Public Information Officer for the RTI Act of RFSL for two years, and he also visited and examined about 100 scenes of crime spots. The next, ju uh, the next jury is Dr. Um, uh, Nirad. Niraj Nataneja. He is the project manager, consultant of Mobico Komodo Limited. He had been a professor with 16 years experience in dental colleges. His specialty areas include clinical research, oral medicine, and radiology. He has published more than 30 scientific publications, has had more than 50 papers presentation to his credit. He has a keen interest in clinical research, pharmacovigilance, clinical trials, forensic odontology, and oral cancer. The next juror, Dr. Kamlesh Kayetola. Uh, Kamlesh Kayetola currently works as a scientific officer at the DNA Fingerprinting Unit State Forensic Laboratory, Madhya Pradesh, working under criminal investigation Department, CID, Government of Madhya Pradesh. Currently, his research work is going on the population genetics. And our last juror, Dr. Nadim Mubarik, Subdashi Shahu, is currently serving as the head of the Department of the DNA Profiling Unit in the State Forensic Science Laboratory, Bhubaneswar. He has done ME in biotechnology from BITS Pilani Goa and has BM Farm from Biju Patnaik University of Technology, Odisha. He possesses technical skills in the cell culture of handling of CHO cells, maintaining primary cultures of A549 human lung cancers, B16410, and A375. He is trained professional in the applicability of various instruments and chromatographic 
techniques. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome the members of the jury for the EPOS representation professional category. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for introducing our honorable jury members. And with this, I would like to introduce you all to our to our chairperson, Ma Teresa D. Guzman. She is currently serving as Associate Dean for Planning and Development at College of Arts and Sciences, University of Philippines, Manila. She is also working as a consultant in cultural anthropologist at Newfield Technologies. She was also worked as department chairperson at Behavioral Sciences College of Art and Sciences, University of Philippines, Manila. She had enormous working experience as an associate professor, instructor, and senior lecturer. She has completed her doctorate in anthropology from College of Social Science and Philosophy, University of Philippines. She has membership of professional associations of, uh, and uh, and Philippines Anthropological Association. She has conducted and was involved in various training for the betterment of the society and development of student growth. Thank you so much, ma'am, for accepting our invitation and being the chair, chair panel and being in the chairperson of e-post representation professional category. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, uh, Professor Teresa, for introducing our honorable jury member. With the permission of the jury member, uh, we are going to start the e-post presentation uh, professional category and today we have a 13 presentations so i request the presentation presenter to be available on the uh, chat and if uh, they are not present over there i'm going to make them a co-host so they can unmute and uh, kritika will uh, share the screen from the side so kritika over to you sure sir With this, with this, we start with our e-poster presentation in professional category. And we have our first presenter, Dr. Swati. Dr. Swati. Um, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. A very good afternoon to the respected jury, my fellow presenters and the members of the audience, and a very good day to those joining us from the other parts of the world. I'm Dr. Swati Kumareshwa. Lecturer and Course Coordinator for MSc Forensic Orientology Program at the JSS Dental College um, and Hospital, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research, located in Mysore, India. The topic for my poster presentation today is Non-Destructive Dental Pulp Extraction for DNA Fingerprinting. I'm going to be discussing about a research study on dental DNA extraction for DNA profiling and my inputs on this method for DNA extraction. But before we move on to the study, I would please could you move to the next slide? Uh, white teeth are a good source of DNA. Teeth and bones are frequently the only sources of DNA available for identification of degraded or fragmented human remains. As in cases such as, as we can see, mass burials, disaster victim identifications after natural and mass and um, man-made disasters like plane crashes, severely decomposed bodies burnt bodies and ancient and prehistoric remains. The unique composition of the teeth and their location in the jawbone provide additional protection to the DNA compared to the bones, making them a more pre preferred source for DNA in many cases. And they are also more stable even after putrefaction of the bodies. Next slide, please. The various oral sources for DNA analysis our teeth, saliva, and biopsy material. We are going to be focusing on teeth. Uh, the various sources from teeth are um, pulp, dentin, cementum, and bone fragments. Enamel is acellular and thus does not contain uh, any significant amount of DNA for analysis, but dentin in addition to the pulp contains cells and vessels, which in turn, prote um, which in turn protected by the cementum and enamel, thus serving as one of the best sources of DNA in tooth to aid in identification. The various methods from which um, dental DNA could be um, rec obtained are vertical or horizontal splitting, crushing and grinding of teeth, endodontic axis, and ultrasonic wash. Uh, the amount of DNA available in a tooth depends on the pulp volume majorly. So in molars, Madam, previous slide, Madam. 
please. Previous slide. Slide, yes. Slide number two, yes. Yeah. Slide number two, please. In molars, nearly 15 to 20 nanogram of DNA can be recovered. Certain variables that affect the amount of DNA are the type of tooth, incisor, canine, premolar, or molar. As we know, the number of roots and the size and the shape of teeth vary, and so do the, so the morphology varies. And with the bigger the size of more root canals and more pulpal canals, uh, the DNA availability is more. Degree of decay, which is the condition of teeth prior to extraction. And then degree of tooth following trauma, as in degree of fracture, loss of tooth structure following trauma, et cetera. The period of time from extraction to DNA isolation and age of the individual. The study I'd be focusing on today is a comparative study of two methods of dental pulp extraction, that is the crushing and or grinding method and the endodontic access method for the genetic fingerprinting by Francois Tilota and others. Next slide, madam. Next slide, please. Um, the materials obtained were the study was conducted. Um, can you please go to the fourth slide? We'll come back to the third slide. Fourth slide. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, you are audible. Um, Madam, may I request you to go to the fifth slide. The study was conducted on 32 pairs of teeth. Each pair was made up of the same type of tooth, except for two pairs consisting one molar and one canine. Um, these teeth were extracted from the same patient at the same time, and the patient's range, age range from 14 to 104 years. Ma'am, if possible, please, fifth slide, madam. And the inclusion criteria for these teeth were that the teeth are mature and living, and that was verified by pulp vitality test, that the teeth are non-restored and extracted, only for orthodontic, periodontic, or prosthodont prosthodontic reasons, and not for a treatment option. Okay. Is it possible, sir, if I can share my screen? Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, the methods were the teeth were randomly assigned to two groups. Group A would be complete crushing of tooth, and group B, standard endodontic access. Before cleaning the uh, pulp removal, the teeth I think you have muted yourself. Please check. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, now audible. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So from where do I need to continue? Uh, from uh, You can continue from now. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, the, there were two, the two methods uh, that were used for, for comparison were complete crushing of tooth and standard endodontic axis. But before subject to pulpal removal or crushing, the teeth were cleaned for con to remove contaminants and tissue debris. The group A, the tooth was completely crushed until a very fine powder was obtained and stored in a sterile tube at 20 degrees, minus 20 degrees Celsius for DNA extraction and then subjected to decalcification and washing. In group B, an occlusal cavity was made using a file, um, using a small spherical bird. The pulp was removed using a barbed brooch. It was then placed in an append of tube. In the, this DNA extraction, these two groups were digested for DNA extraction by protein ASK with tissue specific reagents from the uh, chiagen kit and then genetic fingerprinting was followed. Um, the DNA, the quantitative and the qualitative DNA yield, um, as you can see in the table, from, from group A, the results of DNA collected range from zero to one nanogram. For about, uh, out of the 32 teeth, for 24 teeth, less than 0 0.4 nanogram DNA was collected, and so the analysis could not be performed. For seven teeth between 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 nanogram DNA was collected and was concentrated uh, twice before use. And for one tooth, more than 0 0.5 nanogram of DNA was collected and one complete profile was obtained. In cases of um, the seven teeth, 
four partial profiles and one failure and two complete profiles were obtained. Uh, in group two, if that is endodontic approach, the result, the quantity of DNA collected ranged from 0 0.04 nanogram and nine nanogram. Analysis uh, of the 10 teeth, 10 teeth in the DNA collected ranged from 0 0.04 to 0 .0, 0 0.5 nanogram and DNA was concentrated twice before use. For these 10 teeth, six partial profiles, three complete profiles and one failure. For 22 teeth, the quantity of DNA collected exceeded 0 0.5 nanogram and complete profiles were obtained, except for one sample that gave a partial profile. Among these 22 teeth, for 11, the quantity of DNA collected ranged from 0 0.5 to 3 nanogram and the DNA natural state was used. Uh, the statistic analysis showed that the quantity of DNA obtained was significantly higher with the conservative method, that is group two, group B, that is trepanation, that trepanation, which means endodontic access cavity and then removal of pulp, uh, were higher in the conservative group. I would like to conclude this study. It is simple that in group A, it is a very simple, it is simple to perform and can be done on all types of teeth. But the main disadvantage is that it completely destroys the tooth, pre preventing further radiographic anomaly radiographic, anatomic, or biochemical examinations. Moreover, it does not take account to the exact location of the DNA within the tooth, adding a dilution factor to the material with poor DNA. Next slide, please, madam. But in case, case of trepanation of a occlusal cavity using files, I'm, I'm sorry. This yeah, technique yeah, yeah. is used by dental surgeons to gain access to the root canal for pulp tissues. It is more conservative since the tooth can be left in situ on the dental arcade. Uh, must be performed under air and water spray to prevent heating that may damage the genetic material. The method is simple but requires knowledge on the morphology of the pulp chamber in different types of teeth. It reduces the risk of contamination and can be applied to all tooth. It may be difficult to perform in elderly subjects because of the reduced pulp volume due to the physiological layer of dentin and a dental uh, and a dental surgeon should perform this technique. The advantage is, as I just said, that you totally preserve the radicular morphology, partially preserve the coronal morphology, enabling so as to enable the data to be kept for, for, for further identification, better results both qualitatively and qualitatively. Um, in many cases, Teeth happen to, when teeth happen to be the only evidence for that case and destroying that. Uh, as, as, as I would just like to say that uh, I, I had an opportunity. Um, am I audible? Because I feel like there's a problem, sir. There was uh, some <laughs> breaking, I think, uh, some network issue. Uh, I'm, I'm, I sincerely apologize for that. May I continue? Yes, please. Uh, I, I had the opportunity in 2019, um, in the month of July, uh, to go and intern in the Defense POW Accounting Agency in the United okay. States, Hawaii. Huh? So there, they provide the fullest possibility account, possible accounting for missing personnel to their families and nation. So what they do is the soldiers they've lost in, in the past wars from in Vietnam War, Korea War, uh, Berlin, Guam, from those places, they um, exhume um, the, the soldiers that were, you know, um, buried in those places. They bring them back, do an ID and repatriate them. I had an opportunity to assist in, assist in the odontological department. And the technique they used in the forensic odontology department in Hawaii, instead of it, completely crushing the tooth or just removing the pulp because it will not be able to remove the pulp because these teeth are from 40 years ago, 50 years ago. The pulp are completely necrosed or damaged. So they do an endodontic cavity preparation and uh, the powder DNA is obtained instead of removing the pulp. The pulpal cavity is also all the contents in the pulpal cavity. And as far as the root, I mean, the small burr can reach the root canal. They, they do not destroy the uh, tooth or the morphology is obtained as powder and then it is sampled for DNA. And since this powder, uh, you know, it can um, 
fly away and all that it is done under a vacuum hood so i had an experience and but we've not been practicing this method and i suggest that uh, we can learn from them and start um, uh, practicing that method uh, thank you so much and these are my references thank you so much thank you so much dr uh, swati now i request jury member if they have any query from the present uh, poster presentation Yeah, very nice. Uh, hello, Dr. Swati. Thank you, sir. I would like to apologize for the um, network issues and uh, the change of slides. I'm like to apologize. Sorry for the inconvenience. Yeah, no problem. We can understand that uh, we sometimes we face some technical errors. So uh, it would have been better like uh, if you were doing like some picture representation of that the uh, group B. You are saying the procedure group B. So it would be better to see like how the pulp cavities are being extracted and. Uh, Sir, uh, slide because, uh, number two, madam, if you could please move to slide number two. And another point is uh, like uh, what about the other teeth? Like I will check for the, or it is for molar teeth only, or it can be. Sir, for this study, only the molars and the canines were taken, but it is possible in every every uh, tooth, sir. So this is, is I don't I probably this picture was not shown, sir. Okay. So I, I, as a forensic, uh, yeah, I, I'll say that uh, uh, because as a challenge sample, we may get some kind of different kind of uh, teeth sample. So not only the molar teeth or the canine. So yes, sir. If you can just uh, uh, consider on all type of teeth and. Uh, Some data can be put up, and that will be. This is a this is a study, sir. This is a review of a study, but I would uh, maybe when we do a study, we'll I'll consider all those uh, components, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Swati. Thank you, ma'am. Um, do we have any more questions for Dr. Swati's presentation? Okay, so uh, with the permission of the jury members, we'll move forward to the next presentation. Amandeep Kaur. Amandeep Yes ma'am uh, good evening everyone uh, my name is Amandeep Kaur I am a research scholar at the department of forensic science doing phd under the supervision of dr mukesh kumar thakkar in the punjabi university only uh, i uh, i feel uh, obliged to be the part of this conference thank you for providing me such an opportunity uh, i am here to uh, Uh, to tell something about personal identification from examination an answer sheets which is a major challenge these days uh, a number of uh, frauds or impersonation cases are going on so uh, i would be uh, telling all those aspects how we uh, done, how we did dna profiling from the examination answer sheets uh, um, i will be covering in this poster so uh, as we all know that uh, The documents are, such as those of answer sheets can be found in the cases of impersonation fraud threats kidnapping and extortion uh, and many of the researchers they are working hard to uh, get something out of these documents the question document examination is also going on the right track but we need to find something which is admissible ad ad admissible in the court and uh, so uh, in 2019 we conducted a pilot study in which we came to know that uh, 80% of the uh, population which we studied they have a habit to apply saliva onto the documents uh, for for that if we are getting the salivary stains from the documents along with the latent prints if found so we would be able to get dna out of that and we all know that saliva can be the best source of dna so a uh, dna it can be used uh, so dna has been used successfully to identify the perpetrator in past uh, 
in past studies or in the previous studies, but they were done from the stamps or in well flaps uh, where the saliva has been deposited frequently. But uh, here we worked on the uh, saliva which was deposited by chance or with the habit. And uh, for the same, uh, we uh, took uh, examination sheets which are used commonly in schools, colleges, universities and in various other examinations. Uh, for that, uh, we uh, tested the presence of saliva first uh, using iron fuming method and then confirmed it with the uh, use of salivary amylase test. We got very good results. We were able to detect the stains on the documents and that stayed for, uh, for at least two to three days. And that was also a very good uh, finding, which uh, we were able to get. Uh, the portions where we found the salivary stains, we collected those portions by substrate cutting method. We uh, cutted the paper. We, uh, we take a, a small piece of paper from the area where we were able to find the salivary stain and we cut those portions and put that in the vials. The DNA uh, extraction was done using commercially available magnetic bead maze method using Kaijin EZ1 advanced Excel uh, method and then uh, after extraction procedure uh, we quantified the dna using two percent agarose gel which was then further amplified using parplex 21 system kit as per manufacturer protocol in gene m pcr system 9700 and we then analyzed the samples which were amplified samples uh, and that were profiled via capillary electrophoresis using abi 3130 genetic analyzer and evaluated using gene mapper id 3.2. So the results concluded that 87% of the population studied in the present study applied saliva onto the document, uh, which were provided them to shuffle uh, the pages through. And this uh, finding was uh, a little bit uh, more than uh, what we started in our pilot study. That study provided us 80% results, but when we uh, conduct that study on examination answer sheets, we, ga we came to get a a uh, hike in the percent of the population studied who applied saliva onto the documents. Uh, I need to mention uh, for this study, we used 200 uh, examination answer sheets which were collected from different individuals and half of them were females and half of them were males. And females were uh, found to apply uh, saliva uh, more than uh, the males uh, and the complete DNA profiles were generated from the collected paper substrates even uh, when we kept the uh, examination papers for some days or weeks and uh, complete DNA profiles were, uh, were generated from the same substrates even. And that is also a, a finding which would help uh, if the, because examinations are held at a certain time and the analysis of that uh, substrate is done after a long time. So we, if, we are, if we were able to get the DNA profiles after days and weeks, so this, is, this could be a, a good result. Uh, so uh, the conclusions uh, conclusions made were the searching method used that is the iron fuming in the salivary amylase uh, test we uh, applied on the documents before going for DNA extraction didn't interfere with the successive DNA extraction and quantification process. It didn't uh, bother any of the further DNA analysis. Good quality DNA was extracted from the samples collected from the present study. Further, we are still working on the getting DNA profiling from the aged and soiled examination sheets. These are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Amandi. Uh, now I request uh, the jury members. Do we have questions for Amandi? Yeah, hi, Amandeep. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, like, you got uh, all single profiles from the documents or it is a mixed profile you got? So we were able to get single profiles from the documents. Okay, but practically, if you see, like, uh, any document or postal stamp, there will be, like, a lot of handling from the other person, I think. Yes, sir. Because we, practically were... we have seen in a, in a, in a case uh, in our state. So it was a yes. letter from an uh, accused person. So yes. it was a mixed profile and it is very difficult to separate out the uh, accused from a mixed profile. So what is your take on this part? So we are still How working. So we are still working on this. Uh, 
at present we are just finding out the dna profiles from the document by simulating the documents as one of the case cases but as you said mix profiles will be found so we are still working uh, to get the uh, dna profiles of the mixed uh, mixtures so that we would be able to distinguish between the persons who have handled or who would be the last handler who would be the first handler so we are still working it's it's a challenge but we are still working on that and uh, if it if could be done so we will uh, like exactly yeah that that will be a great thing if that is yes sir yes sir yeah. thank you hello yes sir uh how much dna is extracted uh, what is the quantity of uh, dna uh, you are uh, extracted in uh, from so can, i mean uh, 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 your uh, quantitative uh, your dna by gel yes sir gel basis huh? so yes sir how uh, how much dna quantity so it was around 1 uh, uh, microliter quantity nanogram nanogram picogram i just asked okay so it was uh, around um, could you have uh, using power plus 21 kit yes, so oh, yes. minimum how much uh, minimum input dna required uh so that was uh, point uh no that was not a uh, point sorry sir i didn't remember I, actually i think 0.5 per nanogram is the ideal for profiling huh? i think so we use 0.3 nanogram i according to my 0.3 is okay yes, sir. it's it's 0.3 it's near about 0.3 oh. okay ma thank you amandi thank you jury members now uh, with the uh, permission from the jury members uh, i'll move forward to the next presenter Dr. Vitkal. Dr. Vitkal, are you ready for the presentation? Dr. Vitkal, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Hi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Go ahead. <coughs> Sir, I am Dr. Vital Karad, working as a junior resident in service at uh, Medical College Ambazogai, Maharashtra. My today today's presentation is fetal scrotal trauma, a rare case report. Uh, under guidance of Power Saran Kachre, sir. Next slide, please. Yes, madam. Next slide. coming to introduction <coughs> trauma to scrotum is relatively uncommon because uh, scrotum has inherent mobility and uh, the cremate due to the cremation triplex so so scrotal trauma is uh, rare now causes of uh, trauma to scrotum may be direct uh, blow vehicular accident direct fire forced sexual intercourse sport activities self mutilation iatrogenic blunt trauma may cause hematoma hematocele testicular rupture epididymitis torsion contusion or hemorrhage in the scrotum may be missed because the scrotum has dark pigmented color of skin testicular rupture is a rare event but it is serious and it is identified by tear in the tunicular vision scrotum has a rich blood supply uh, from paired testicular arteries 
directly from aorta and collaterals from primastic artery and artery to ductus deeptus and rest of the scrotum is supplied by internal pudendal artery branch of internal leg artery next slide sir next slide now coming to case report in this uh, case i have uh, met a 30 year uh, male truck driver by occupation was assault, assaulted by unknown people while he was parking his truck near the side of petrol pump and the upon accompanying person <coughs> brought him to nearest sub district hospital and from there referred to the tertiary care center where he declared as brought dead meanwhile the police were inqu- uh, informed and the panchanama was made and body was sent for post mortem examination on external examination injuries like abrasions and contusions were present on the body parts which were not sufficient to cause the death on examination of external genital penis was intact seminal area visualization present scrotum enlarged contused bluish red in color with loss of rugosities on left side as shown in this figure on palpation scrotum is firm in consistency on opening the scrotum hematoma covering the whole scrotum on left side tunica alveolar was disrupted tunica vaginalis hemorrhagic blood infiltration was present in left testicular parenchyma as shown in figure now cause of death was attributed to blunt trauma to scrotum coming to conclusion blunt trauma to the scrotum poses a clinical challenge for management because majority of the cases of blunt trauma are managed conservatively on oil minimum cases uh, which uh, like uh, testicular rupture and large hematocele may require surgery so it is a clinical management challenge for management testicular rupture if it occurs should be diagnosed promptly and treated energetically scrotal exploration is needed in cases of large hematocele and testicular rupture in cases of blunt trauma blunt trauma to scrotum may be missed during routine autopsy examination so careful examination of genital area needed during autopsy especially in cases of assault accidental death cases and broad death cases now these are my references thank you thank you dr vitsal thank I, you ma'am i request you remember do we have questions for uh, dr vitsal presentation yeah hello dr vitsal yes uh, sir yeah my question is like what was the report in the post mortem report it was the only cause for the death or uh, was there any other cause nay <clears throat> other injuries like abrasions and contusions were present but they are not sufficient to cause death the uh, injury mentioned in scrotum is sufficient to cause death so specifically it was written in the post mortem report like uh, the uh, uh, yes, the sir. injury yes, to the scrotum yes sir so what was the like uh, principle or what is the mechanism behind like how it is affected any any idea like how it uh, like leads to death by sir it uh, leads to uh, scrotum is rich in blood supply so uh, there occur shock sorry shock sir shock okay okay thank you sir thank you thank you thank you dr vitsal uh, thank ma'am now with this uh, with the permission of the jury members will uh, will continue to the next presenter uh, dr elvin good afternoon ma'am uh, am i audible ma'am yes you are audible uh, my name is dr alan bogis i am a junior resident in the in the department of forensic medicine toxicology uh, in gurugobind singh medical college faridkot uh, my poster presentation topic would be 
uh, non suicidal self injuries with malefit intent uh, talking about uh, the background non suicidal self injuries or nssi refers to intentional destruction of one's own body tissues without suicidal intent and for the purposes not socially sanctioned and is also referred to by various authors as self inflicted self suffered fabricated injuries etc now the textbook discuss self inflicted or suffered injuries as superficial multiple parallel and often overlapping usually localized to one part of the body and there are often uh, presence of tentative cuts or hesitation cuts in close proximity and also symmetry is often found other features of nssi would be uh, they are mostly incised wounds and sometimes contusions stab wounds and burns uh, these are usually present on accessible parts of the body and not in sensitive areas uh, such as eyelids genitalia or nipples the classic picture of nssi as discussed in textbooks is uncommon especially where the perpetrator has had a professional help uh talking about uh, five cases which were uh, which came to our uh, which came to emergency of our college the ages of uh, these uh, five cases ranged from a minimum of 32 years to a maximum of 44 years out of these four were males and one was a female four belonged to rural areas and one to a semi urban area out of these two were laborers one was a housewife lady was a housewife and two were unemployed important thing to note here was the time interval between the alleged assault and their arrival in hospital varied from a minimum of 5 hours to a maximum of 10 hours uh, on average more average was more than 6 hours number of suspect injuries uh, were one in case 1 2 and 4 and two in case 3 and 5 body parts involved were left hand in all the cases and right leg in case 3 and case 5 nature of injuries was grievous in all cases the bones involved were metacarpal bone in case 1 and all cases just all cases showed phalangeal uh, phalanx uh, which showed comminuted fracture and also uh, tibial fracture in case 3 and 5 specifically unicortical fracture of tibia the alleged weapon in all cases was kappa which is usually a Uh, sharp and a moderately heavy weapon along with it uh, a gandasi which is a sharp and a heavy weapon and a uh, soti which is a, a blunt weapon was used clothings in case 1 and 2 were blood stained if you see case 3 there was a corresponding cut present over the cloth uh, corresponding to the injury but there were no blood stains present uh no uh, discussion all the cases presented with incised wound to the affected part along all these cases presented with uh, uh, incised wound to the affected part along with vague vague complaints of pain over different parts of the body in case if you see clothing uh, as uh, earlier discussed clothing exhibited cut corresponding to the injury but the clothes were not blood stained in all cases there were inconsistencies between the pattern of injury and patient's own history own version of the and external injury to conclude uh, it is important that the forensic practitioner should identify and note the precise precise site of injury on the body describe the total number of injuries their dimensions the direction and depth thoroughly examine the clothes and take into account the medical and psychiatric history uh, i would like to suggest that fabricated firearm and fabricated grievous wounds are a gray area which were which are not made considered in the literature authors need to incorporate these in the textbook medical practitioners preparing mlrs in the periphery need to be educated about the same in the absence of relevant literature registered practitioners dealing with medical legal work should document all the injuries in detail and if they are unable to report 
that these are fabricated, they need to direct the police to take into account the circumstantial evidence. Active cooperation with the investigating agencies is, is essential and latter should register cases only after thorough investigation and having regard for the detailed content of the medical legal report. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Elvin. Now I request jury members, do we have questions for Dr. Elvin presentation? Uh, Dr. Elvin, can you hear me? Uh, could you please tell me what is the main cause for self-inflicted injuries other than suicidal thoughts that you uh, have come across? Uh, sir, to uh, to charge enemy uh, with assault or uh, or attempted murder to make uh, to make any simple injury appear serious uh, by uh, by the assailant to pretend self-defense or to charge. Uh, by policemen and to frame, uh, others, to frame others, you mean? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, Any other psychological cause you have come across? Uh, sir, like uh, by policemen and watchmen uh, acting in collusion with uh, robbers to show that they were uh, defending the property, uh, all these things. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you, good. Uh, yeah, hello, Dr. Alvin. Uh, my question is like, uh, uh, was there any uh, psychiatric history for these cases? If I'm seeing the uh, third picture, uh, I think there is a hand, I think. So yes. this much of depth of a uh, injury, uh, like by the self, uh, like the same person. Uh, what was the cause? Any any cause behind that or any psychiatric history behind that? Sir, uh, specifically, uh, we didn't take psychiatric history. Like it was like, in concluded like we should take psychiatric issue like that okay you didn't uh, got any yes sir. in these cases yes sir okay i think the main reason was to charge uh, charge the enemy i mean with assault i mean that is the same. still then uh, this much of a depth of our injury and uh, for charging someone is like uh, without any psychiatric uh, history and, uh, and uh, the like study, like we should be taking psychiatric history, it was like that, sir. Okay, okay. yeah, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Elvin. Now, with the permission of all the jury members, we have uh, our next presenter, um, Chyoti. Jyoti Gulaya, are you ready for the presentation? Hello? Uh, yes. Yeah, am I audible to everybody? Uh, yes, you are audible. Yeah, so good afternoon to all of you. Uh, the topic of my today's presentation is sexual assault and their analysis, the drugs which are used in sexual assault and their analysis. Uh, I'll just come to the, my next slide. As the extract states that the drug facilitated sexual assault are the voluntary or the involuntary ingestion of the drug by the victim without the knowledge of the victim. Uh, basically, we need to know what is a sexual assault. It, sexual assault is any act which is carried out with the victim without its will, uh, with the use of uh, violence, coercion, or the intimidation. Uh, they are also known by the various terms such as date rape, drug rape, or the drug in the alcohol facilitated rape or encapsulated rapes. Uh, the drugs which are usually used in such circumstances uh, include the effects of uh, uh, sedative, hypnotic, uh, dissociative, or maybe the amniotic effect. And these uh, drugs are probably colorless and the orderless so that they get unnoticed by the victims. Uh, the most common drugs which are uh, generally used includes the GHB, the alcohol, then um, flunitrazepam, roifenol, and ecstasy, etc. The matrices which are generally used for such drugs to detect them includes blood, urine, saliva, then 
uh, they include uh, any uh, hair sample or maybe a vitreous humor sample of the vaginal or the rectal uh, samples, etc. Uh, the problem lies in the fact that these drugs are not detectable for a very long period of time. time. Some are detectable for a period up to one day or uh, maybe up to four days, uh, depending on their nature uh, and the confirmation and the screening method. So we need such a method which uh, include the de detection of such method with a rapid screening and the more reliable test. So I'll just move on to the next slide. Uh, drug facilitated sexual assault. So they are basically a subset of drug facilitated crime because they are basically done under the influence of any drug, which might be alcohol or anything that I just described in the previous slide. So they are basically a sexual assault in which a person is incapacitated or unconscious and they don't know what is happening to them under the influence of such particular drug. Uh, these drugs are very dangerous, powerful and illegal. Basically, because they are colorless, they are odorless and tasteless, a person doesn't know whether they have been uh, given such a drug. So they just take it and they are unaware of the fact that they have been ingested such kind of a drug. I just move on to the next slide. Day rape drugs. Ingestion of a drug by a victim that result in an act of a sexual activity. So these drugs are basically classified into two types, the opportunistic and the proactive drug. The opportunistic DFSAs are those in which a victim voluntarily ingested a drugs and the uh, alleged assailant takes the advantage of the drug that he ha she or, he or she has ingested the drug. In proactive the predatory DFSAs, uh, intentionally the uh, assailant uh, person gives the drug to a victim so that he or she can take advantage of, a, of, a, of that particular person who uh, she or he has ingested a drug. The most common drugs which have been used and which have been found in the literature includes Royphenol. The Royphenol is the free name for the Flunetrazepam. They come under the categories of Benzodiazepines. They are sold in the market with the names of uh, street names such as um, Roach, Rib, Rufis, Rofis, etc. Then comes the Ketamine. The Ketamine is one which is widely abused for hallucination and it has dissociative effects in the humans. In street name, it is, it is known as K-hole, K-Kit-Kat, purple, etc. It comes in the form of liquid as well as in white powder. Even the Royphenol comes in the form of white powder in the white tablets. Then comes the alcohol, which is a very prevalent drug because it is widely accepted and socially accepted. So people just take it for granted and it is commonly associated with other, other drugs which are used in drugs of, uh, drugs of sexual assault. Then comes the GHP. GHP is also cited as one of the most common drugs and it has been cited uh, very commonly in the literature. It is a depressant that has urophic and the relaxation effects. Then ecstasy, which is also known as MDMA, is 3,4-methylene deoxymethamphetamine. And it's third most commonly drug used, which is used in the Australia after the GHP and the ketamine. And they have different uh, screening and the confirmation methods. I'll just move on to the next slide. So the matrices which are used for the detection of day prey blood include urine, blood, saliva, the hair sample or a mouth rinse or a swab or maybe other sample which have been used by the victim to have a drink or uh, some food. Then the methods which are usually used to detect such drug include the UV spectrophotometry, the gas chromatography associated with the mass spectrometry, which is MS, then liquid chromatography with MS, then capillary electrophoresis with MS, and magnetic resonance spectroscopy. The many advanced techniques that have been developed now, which include the UPLC uh, along with the MS. I'll just move on to the next slide. Here's a flow chart which shows the toxical analysis of the drug in cases of uh, drug or facility sexual assault. First of all, uh, uh, information is collected about the case. Then it is transferred to a lab in which it's seen whether the case meets the lab case acceptance policy. If it's met, then it's um, seen whether a particular drug is suspected or not. If it's not, then it's transferred or maybe declined to the, the case is completely declined. If it's expected, then it's seen whether we have a particular kind of drug or not. If it's not, then a urine sample is collected. 
if in case the urine sample is not available, we do collect a blood sample. And then, and just in case the blood sample is not available, we do collect a screen and blood biological specimen such as here, which is also available after four to six weeks. Then when we do screen urine, we do see that uh, a confirmed significant finding is available. In that case, we do analyze for the confirmed drug of the metabolite in additional useful specimens. And after screening of the blood, urine, or saliva, or maybe a biological specimen such as here, we do confirm the report findings of a case. So that is all about the presentation that I wanted to present. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jyoti. Uh, now I request the honorable jury member. Do we have questions for Jyoti's presentation? Yeah, hi, Dr. Jyoti. <coughs> Hello, sir. Uh, so, uh, so you have uh, shown like uh, these are the typical methods like screening urine and all. So uh, are you proposing any new technique or something that uh, uh, can easily identify the drug in the uh, sexual assault cases? Because many of the cases in our country like will be reported or reported uh, after a very long time, actually. So yeah. in that cases, it will not be possible for screen the urine or blood sample. Right. So sir. what is your take on that? Like, how do you... So, so actually we are working so any, on... Any, any new technique or your... So, so as of now, as a research Sorry. scholar, I'm working on the techniques which are based, uh, which are based on the uh, thin layer chromatography. We are basically testing the basic techniques as of now. So as we will get the good result, then we'll proceed towards the MS, sir. Um, thank you, sir. Or uh, thank you, uh, Jyoti, for the uh, for the presentation. Now, uh, mm -hmm. with, uh, with the permission of jury members, we move forward to our next presenter, Mrinal. Uh, Hello. Uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I will be presenting a case report for my uh, poster. Uh, it biogenic meningoencephalitis in a case of traumatic brain injury. So this was a case of a 32 year old male with a history of road traffic accident for which he was admitted and treated in a local hospital and then discharged. Sometime later, he developed rigidity of his limbs, irritability and altered sensorium. For which he was uh, subsequently he was brought to Ames and treated, where he died during treatment in a tertiary level center. Uh, his body was given to the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology for an autopsy. Next slide, please. So, on external examination, we found two surgically sutured wounds of size two centimeter, one on the right frontal region of head. 9 cm above medial end of right eyebrow and another 2 cm lateral to it. Multiple abraded contusions in the area of 7 cm by 5 cm over the right side of upper chest just below right clavicle were also found. Next slide please. On internal examination, we found diffuse scalp edema a subscalp contusion with a fracture of frontal bone from lateral part of left orbital roof towards the right with extra dural hematoma along with it. A subdural flattened glistening layer of apple green color pus over left frontal lobe, diffuse yellow green colored pus was also found at the base of brain adjacent to optic chiasma, optic tract and cavernous sinuses. Pus was also found on both hemispheres of brain in foramen magnum and lower part of medulla. One half of the cerebral hemisphere was compressed at places, showing cupping effect with areas of contusion necrosis on frontal lobe. On removal of brain, a flexure line with extension towards anterior cranial fossa and cribriform plate was also evident. Other internal found findings included uh, lung and pleura were 
adherent to the chest wall mild fatty changes uh, next slide please mild fatty changes and partial occlusion of left anterior descending coronary artery was also seen in the heart recolits were present in the colon and liver was yellowish uh, without nodularity slide please opinion for this death was opinion for this case was given as death due to anti mortem head injury and its complications including a widespread infection of brain and meninges findings were consistent with a history of road traffic accident a hospitalized case and signs of surgical intervention evident in conclusion this case was an excellent example outlining the gross pathology seen in case of pyogenic meningoencephalitis which this particular man uh, sustained more than 6 weeks prior to his demise and uh, i would like to okay uh, it's over okay thanks uh, that will be it i guess thank you so much mrunal uh, uh, uh... Now I request duty members. Do we have questions for Munal's presentation? Yeah, hello, Doctor Munal. Hello. So, sir. Uh, what could have been like uh, the uh, measuring effect? Like, uh, what should have been the steps should have been taken at the DHS level to yes, treat sir. this kind so, of cases? They did a CT. Uh, before discharging him, and uh, that okay. greenish yellow flash uh, pus in the flattened. Uh, can you go back to the third slide, please? Hello. Okay. Uh, so that greenish pus, uh, that greenish pus that, uh, that we found on autopsy, uh, the, uh, when they discharged him, they did a CT. In the CT, it was uh, thought to be a contusion and. Uh, the patient was discharged okay the, prior to that previous slide so was there any chance to save him like if it uh, yeah so it would like that bit can we go back to one, can we go one slide back yeah so in the leftmost picture we see a hole in the uh, vault that hole is for yeah. extra uh, uh, extra cranial uh, ventricular drainage that was given for to reduce intracranial pressure so at this time uh, they could have uh, any aspect that was obtained that could have been sent for culture uh, which i'm sure they did but uh, uh, it, along with it they should have sent it for analysis of through dna techniques or analysis of uh, any antimicrobial resistance because he developed it after more than 6 weeks Uh, he collapsed in the in the six weeks. Mm. We had so much time. Mm. Had we gotten any indication, we could have switched the antimicrobial sepsis on. Okay. Thank you. Um. Thank you, uh, Mrinu. Uh, thank you, jury members. Uh, with this, uh, can we move forward to the next presenter, uh, jury members? Yeah, okay please thank you sir with this i request our next presenter dr pooja dr pooja can you hear us yeah. yes ma'am i'm here am i audible to everyone yes you are audible thank you so i'll start my presentation with your permission good afternoon respected jury members organizing committee members and my fellow participants The topic for my presentation is hot food, the inequality and quantity assessment in incinerated food. I'm trying to change the slide. Please. Various events can lead to burn shelters in him, which may include transport accidents such as aircraft and rail accidents, suicide, and terrorist attacks. These events may display variable results on human remains. Conventional methods of identification, such as visual identification and fingerprint, have been rendered redundant in cases where the body is found beyond recognition. Teeth and bones have a good fortune of surviving really high temperatures. Teeth are excellent sources of genomic and mitochondrial DNA because of its location and dental bulk. 
yeah, being surrounded by hard tissues is preserved from extreme environmental conditions. Hence, the DNA, which is presently abundant in the pearl, also remains preserved. With the advent of PCR, that is polymerase chain reaction technique, even small amounts of DNA recovered from the tissues can be characterized and be used for DNA fingerprinting. This technique can be valuable in identification of victims of crime or disasters when conventional methods fail. Stable isotope analysis of the tested light of the mineral heat is only possible up to a heat exposure of 300 degrees Celsius, while the isotopic signal from strontium remains unaltered even in heat and bone exposed to very high temperatures. DNA analysis is theoretically possible up to a heat exposure of 600 degrees Celsius, but cannot be advised in every case because of the increased risk of contamination. While the macroscopic color and UV fluorescence of cremated teeth give hints of to temperature exposure of bone outer surface, its histological appearance can be used as a reliable indicator for the assessment of the overall degree of burning. Heat is extremely destructive force that changes not only the architecture and morphology, but also the elementary and isotopic composition of the thing. Recovery is possible only after stabilization of the sample. The incinerated sample is very fragile and needs the external support from acrylic or natural glue. Lab procedures begin with recording the radiographic, photographic, and scans data. Color changes ranges from lower to higher temperatures we will see in the next slide and texture changes ranging from flaky appearance to the husky appearance. Well, dehydration, decomposition, inversion, and fusion are the phases which describe the stages of heat modification process which occurs in the tissue. DNA is considered to be one of the primary identifiers by Interpol itself. Commercial cremation occurs at a temperature and duration that destroys all organic materials, including DNA and chemical analysis is rather used to determine the elemental composition of the cremation. C coming to the colors now, we see that it is a systematic change from the lower temperature to the higher temperature, which starts in the typical light yellow of the unaltered dentine to black, to brown or olive, to gray, and lastly, it becomes completely white. The dentine exhibited the greatest amount of change, turning, a, turning to a dark reddish brown color. Coming to the destructive versus the non destructive method. Initially, we had seen already how a non destructive method can be helpful. But here, I'll tell you non destructive method certainly has great advantages. But in this particular case, where the remain is incinerated, it is seen that the destructive method was more useful and gave better results as compared to the non destructive one. The main aim of this poster was to understand the effect of heat on the quality and quantity of DNA, and if it is possible to assess the results from colorimetry. So yes, color changes due to heat are quite static and can surely help in assessing the results. The color and the mass analysis can be assessed more technically using different techniques, namely the thermogravity method technique, which even analyzes the mass of the remains. Please change to the next slide. There are certain limitations that I came across when I was just studying the different studies published in the uh, journal. The protection provided by the alveolar socket is nowhere replicated in the lab atmosphere. The destruction caused by heat is variable and cannot be specified always. A variety of factors influence the quality and quantity of DNA present, all of which is not reproducible in the lab setting. Within the limitations of the study, it could be concluded that in case of fire disasters where bodies get charged, by knowing the temperature and also the duration of exposure, it is possible to estimate the quantity of DNA that can be obtained from the dental skull. This can determine whether amplification could be carried out with the amount of DNA retrieved, because insufficient DNA may provide only a partial profile or a no profile at all. Thank you so much for your patient hearing. That's all for my presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pooja. 
Now, uh, I request jury members. Uh, do we have questions for Dr. Pooja presentation? Yeah, hello, uh, Dr. Pooja. Hello, sir. Yeah, my question is like, uh, so how to handle these uh, incinerated teeth and uh, because many times we face like these kind of uh, samples, there is no DNA actually. Absolutely. So, yeah. Right, sir. Right, sir. So, sir, like I said, the main thing is stabilization of the remains because in these type of cases, we are not always sure that if we are going for the analysis, we'll get the DNA or not. So, in that case, if we can access to the color or to the mass of the body, like I said about the thermogravimetric technique, we can actually assess if we are going, uh, how much liable we are to get the quantity of DNA. In that yeah. case, we can proceed with the technique or we can stop the process there itself. So based on the physical characteristic, you can say like whether the DNA would be there or the... Yes, yes. Sir. Based point, on yes? the color and the mass technique, because I have gone through a lot of literature, which does say okay. that the color is consistent with the temperature range. And if we can correlate like for 400 degrees Celsius, we can get this much. But sir, like I said, so there the, is a limit. The coloration for the... Uh, the root part or, or the enamel part you think? So they have given the a general like the CET or the root part specifically. The enamel part is slightly excluded in few of the studies. Yeah. But sir, there was one limitation I had already mentioned about that the protection given by the alveolar socket in a real scenario that cannot be replicated in a lab, lab situation. So when we are doing right. the study outside, so it's not always right that, yes, when I'm saying that 400 degrees Celsius to correspond to this much of DNA, is always replicated in a real scenario as well. So these are the limitations okay. of this kind of study. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. Uh, thank you, jury members. Now, uh, with the permission of the jury members, um, we move forward to our next presenter, Dr. Georgia. Dr. Georgia, are you ready for the presentation? Uh, Dr. Georgia, please uh, unmute yourself. Yes, now go yes, ahead. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Hello, sir. My, am, I, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Please go ahead with the presentation. Uh, uh, sir, hello. Uh, yes, Georgia, you are audible to us. Uh, please continue with your presentation. So can I start my? Yes, you can start your presentation. Uh, sir, I think there is some um, network issue. At uh, yes, ma'am, I'm not able to see the. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I can see the screen now. I'm sorry, ma'am. I have some network issue here. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry, ma'am. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Georgia Benita. I'm doing my postgraduate in uh, Savita Dental College in the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery. And uh, this is uh, my study that is prevalence of root, uh, root dilaceration and permanent incisors. Coming to the background of the study, as we know, root dilaceration is a dental anomaly characterized by an abnormal curvature of the root dental root which can cause problem during eruption and complication. And um, as we know, this can play a very important role in identification. The main aim of my study is to determine the root dilaceration and permanent incisors by using an orthopantomogram. So the objective is to assess the prevalence of uh, root dilaceration in the permanent incisors among Chennai population. Next slide, ma'am. Um, 
next slide. We have changed. Please see the slide. Yes, ma'am. Uh, like coming to the materials and methods, and this is a cross-sectional study, a descriptive study where I obtained 520 OPGs from the radiology clinic of Savita Dental College in the city from Chennai uh, from the date of January to the month of January to May 2020. So I got approval from the ethical and OPG was retried. And uh, I took OPG of 520 and uh, I examined 230 patients, including the maximally left and right central incisors, lateral incisors, and missing was observed for about 50 days. The angulation was measured using software angle meter and each tooth was examined for the occurrence of dilaceration According to the Santa, Cantaldo, and Talbot, uh, in his previous study, the classification of the dilacerated root was given to be as mild for up to 20 to 40 degree and moderate for 41 to 60 degree and severe uh, curvature degree would be greater than 61 degree. And the root third was segregated as mesial third, apical third, and the medial third. And the root direction was uh, separated into mesial and distal direction. So deviation greater than 20 degree for the root in the relation to the wrong axis was considered to be as dilaceration. Next slide. Now. So the figure one, this indicates the angulation which is measured and uh, by using the angle meter software. And in the figure two, this is a demographic data uh, for, the retrieval, uh, for the retrieved OPG. And I segregated the data like uh, according to the age group of uh, zero to 20 years, 20 to, the, 20 to 40. 40 to 60 and 51 to 60 and 61 to 70. And uh, about 53% was male, uh, male cases and 46 patient was female cases. And coming to the results, the results obtained was obtained uh, using a so SPSS software version 11. The prevalence of root dilaceration in the sample study was up to 105T with a higher incidence in the female was about to 73% 70, with the maxillary lateral incisors of the most affected teeth, that is 60.8%. And the most prevalent type of root dilaceration was the mild type, that is the mild type having a degree of uh, 20 to 40 degree of up to 89%, that is involving 79 teeth and occurring more in the apical third region, that is 92.1%, with a distal direction of 82.8%. So this figure three indicates a tabular column, the count of the tooth dilaceration. So the count was more in maxillary lateral incisors and then uh, coming to the mandibular lateral incisors and maxillary central incisors and mandibular central incisors. So in conclusion, considering the results, it is emphasized that the importance of performing a diagnostic radiographic examination for each individual, which can provide a good evidence of antemortem record in future. As we know, human uh, dentition is never the same in any two individuals. Some author have discussed that the study, the dental anomalies has been uh, missed out in the, during the examination. So from this study, I wanted to prove that there is some amount of prevalence in uh, dilaceration, which can provide a good identification for the DVI team. So the future scope would be as a forensic odontologist are playing a major role in DVI and other medical legal cases. There is an urgent need to improve the specialty. The initiative such as sensitizing the dental science graduates towards a speciality and mandating the dentist with related casework experience and encouraging to be a part of identification. And DVI team can help in odontological to provide a speciality under the forensic science. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Uh, Georgia. Uh, now I request jury members, do we have questions for Dr. Georgia's presentation? Uh, okay, so uh, I think we have no questions for uh, Dr. Georgia's presentations. Thank you so much, Dr. Georgia. Now we, with the permission of all the jury members, will uh, move to the next presentation by Dr. Sangamitra S. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Sangamitra. I'm doing post graduation in oral natural facial pathology at Savita Dental College. Um, my topic uh, for today is cytomorphometric analysis of 
oral exfoliated cells for age estimation. Uh, as we know, uh, the, uh, the epithelial cells have their own uh, turnaround time uh, with which uh, we can estimate the age, which is said that we can estimate the age of the patient. The aim of the study here, uh, uh, can you please go to the last slide? To the first slide, now, please. Okay. So the aim of the study is to estimate the age of an individual by comparing the average cell size of their oral smears using image analysis morphometric software. Next slide. So as we know, in forensic pathology, one of the most primary requirements for, uh, is the identification of the age of a person. Basically, a John Doe or a Jane Doe whose identification is yet to be confirmed. So with, uh, in this matter, we know that there are various methods to find to uh, tell the approximate age of the patient. And uh, with which I think uh, this uh, cytomorphometric analysis could also play a hand in identifying the disease person. Uh, so for this study, uh, in the sample size, I took 30 individuals uh, of uh, various age groups, 36 age groups. Age group, uh, group 1 is 10 to 20 years of age. Group 2 is 21 to 30 years of age. Group 3 is 31 to 40 years of age. Group 4 is 45 to 50 years of age, group 5 is 50 to 60 years of age, and group 6 is 61 to 70 years of age. Uh, in each of these patients, I took buckle smear, I took oral smears from uh, uh, six sites, namely right buckle mucosa, left buckle mucosa, junction of hard and soft palate, dorsum of the tongue, floor of the mouth, and lower baby history. Among these six sites, I took, three, uh, I took samples in three sites using cypher brush and other three sites using the uh, wooden spatula. After which, I did the panicular spray, and after which, uh, I, um, I saw these sites on the microscope, and then I took the average cell size of 10, uh, 10 uh, individually identifiable cells to each of the slides, after which, I calculated the mean the standard deviation through the daily features. Now, coming to the results, it was uh, through cytochromatic analysis. We were revealing that there was a decrease in the average cell size with the increase in age. And to see the uh, average size, the, the amount of uh, size that is decreases, the mean cell size difference was 0.0808 mm with the standard deviation of 0.0153. As you can see from the graph, there is a steady decrease in the average cell size uh, of the uh, people, starting from uh, 0 0.11 to 0.0617. And I think that this data can be used to identify, uh, to at least to tell the approximate age of the diseased person in which no other data is available to estimate the age of the patient. Uh, so I know this uh, is a bit short, so I, I, I was hoping to make it a, a lot more crisper actually. So with this, I would like to conclude that, uh, next slide please. That the automatic evaluation of the exfoliated oral cells can become a reliable tool for age estimation. Because of the oral mucosa, it can serve as a potential alternative or non-invasive procedure in evaluating the age of an individual compared to other screening modalities, which are usually either expensive or invasive. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sangamitra. I request you, jury members, uh, do we have questions for Sangamitra's presentation? Yeah. Hello, Dr. Sangamitra. Uh, so, the samples you have taken, like the reference samples from the different age groups, right? Yes, sir. Uh, so, what about the postpartum? Like, how you are, uh, how you can say that it will be in, uh, in the forensic field when? Uh, if you can study with the postmortem part, like with the saliva sample, or uh, so I, how it is, because main thing is like in forensic, we need to uh, you'll get so many dead bodies or uh, in postmortem if you can find out the age estimation. But for the sir. reference sample, how it is very helpful in the forensic my question. Yes, sir. The hope for the study is that uh, when we find a deceased person or deceased body, immediately after that is hope that these uh, these values can be correlated with them. But this was just a base study, sir. Uh, we are hoping to improve on it further with the postmortem analysis sir, of the same. You were saying it will be like uh, for the phrase dead bodies, it will be. Yes, sir. We are. Uh, the result the same or. 
maybe immediately after the season it might be similar sir but we are hoping to improve our study with the post mortem uh, analysis of the same uh, of the same sir in future yeah yeah so you can uh, for future perspective you can do that part of uh, study like how it is behaving in the post mortem of dead body yes sir sure sir Thank you, sir. Hello, Dr. Sumitra. Yes, sir. Uh, one of the, my questions, uh, you saw the cell size difference uh, yes, is sir. overall, but uh, age-wise, you saw uh, 0 to 10. So what is the standard deviations in uh, age-wise, each group, in okay. six groups? Yeah. Uh, actually, I haven't put that on the poster, so I just put more or less. So only overall. Uh, uh, please. Yes, sir. We have the slide. Visual... Uh, this one. Uh, this one. Uh, this one. Yes. I mean, what is the uh, um, standard deviation in uh, twenty to thirty years? Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is a merge with uh, at 20, uh, 10 to 20. Uh, yes, sir. Um, we have uh, standard. Size, uh, yes, standard deviations. You show the standard deviation of overall the standard deviation uh, here. Uh, uh, the mean cell differentiation was 0.0. Sorry, sir. What is the um, standard deviation in different uh, age groups? Uh, yes, sir. So the uh, for, for for ten to twenty years to twenty to thirty years, standard deviation was around zero point zero one four. Sir. After which everything it was zero point zero one zero point zero. At a point it was like very very less. From thirty to forty years to forty to fifty years, standard deviation was very negligible, sir. But compared to that, uh, in the difference between forty to fifty years to fifty to sixty years, it is appreciable. Actually, sir, we have the data of each new standard deviation, but for the poster sake, I, I, I have only added the oral main and standard deviation, sir. It is a statically significant variation? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sangamitra. Uh, now, we move forward to our next presentation by Dr. Dinesh Vai. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, dear jury members and attendees of this e-conference. My topic for presentation is Ameloglyphics of Primary and Permanent Dentition Using Staining Method. The, in, in forensic odontology, ameloglyphics is the study of enamel rod and patterns, and these rod and patterns are unique for individual tooth of same and different individual. Enamel is being the harder, hardest tissue and has the highest resistance to environmental effects like fire, acid exposure, and decomposition, etc. And it, thus, enamel patterns can be used as a tool for forensic investigation. The aim of my study is to find out the utility of several stains and staining methods for studying this ameloglyphic pattern under stereo microscope. So the rationale of doing this study is that there is a need for studying the personal identification uh, of the skeletal remains rather than the DNA forensics under any other anthropological methods. The tooth which is being the hardest part and the enamel which is more resistant. Uh, I would like to uh, study in the uh, enamel patterns and that is the rationale. And, uh, and the null hypothesis being stated is that ameloglyphics pattern cannot be studied using stains and staining methods. Previously, Manjunath et al. in his study analyzed efficiency of cellulose acetate method, uh, film, cellophane tape, light body impression method in recording these enamel rod and patterns and found that cellulose acetate film was reliable. But the drawback is that they used etchant in the extracted tooth, so uh, it cannot be used in a live patient. So it was a drawback. Next slide, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, in
the phases in the first phase the objective was to compare three different staining methods for ameloglyphic pattern under stereo microscopy using hematoxylin and toluidine blue stain in maxillary premolars so for this 12 maxillary premolars were stained using hematoxylin and toluidine blue stains and three different techniques were studied under three uh, stereo microscope so the labial surface of the premolar is separated into uh, nine sections based on the distal mes middle and mesial surface and the, the based on the thirds of the tooth and the technique uh, used for staining was placed for two minutes like uh, the soak method the tooth was soaked in the stain for two minutes the cotton method the cotton application for two minutes being done and the micro tip application of two minutes of the stain is being done and the surface score of out of nine was being given uh, for individual pre maxillary premolars and found that both the hematoxylin and toluidine blue showed superior results in the soak method when compared to the other two methods in objective two the to compare 15 different stains for studying the ameloglyphic pattern under stereo microscope now we found that soak method was superior when compared to the other two methods we need to find whether which stain would be a more appropriate one to study the ameloglyphic pattern so for this 15 maxillary premolars were stained used by soak method for two minutes and studied under 15 different stains uh, under stereo microscope and we found that hematoxylin and toluidine blue showed superior results when compared to other stains with a score of seven surfaces out of nine next slide ma'am in the objective three to compare the hematoxylin and toluidine blue staining in the primary and permanent dentition 50 freshly extracted tooth were stained using hematoxylin and toluidine blue by soak method and studied under stereo microscope for this five prime primary maxillary central incisor three permanent maxillary central incisor two permanent mandibular central incisor three permanent maxillary canine two permanent mandibular canine five permanent maxillary premolar and five permanent mandibular premolar was being included in the study and stained by soak method and found that maxillary central incisor was poor in uh, reading the ameloglyphic pattern when compared to that of the other tooth especially the deciduous tooth showed good results in taking up the stain and showed uh, superior results in the ameloglyphic pattern uh, and both the hematoxylin and toluidine blue stains showed the mean and standard deviation value of uh, 6.4 and 6.5 respectively. When comparing the uh, parity test of hematoxylin and toluidine blue, both were no, non, no significant difference was found between the hematoxylin and toluidine blue. So both the stains can be used for studying this enamel, uh, ameloglyphics pattern. So the result of this third objective is that except in permanent central incisor, remain dentition was for, found to be uh, good in uh, studying the ameloglyphics pattern. And the results and conclusion is that ameloglyphics pattern can be studied by using staining method that uh, or staining the tooth under stereo microscope. The hematoxylin and toluidine blue stains can be used for studying these ameloglyphics pattern. Soak method of staining can be done uh, for the to study this ameloglyphics pattern. Permanent cent primary central incisor, permanent canine, permanent premolars can be used to study this ameloglyphics pattern. Ameloglyphics pattern can be used as a valuable tool in personal identification using staining methods and shows a promising future in the forensic odontology. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dinesh. Um, I request jury members, uh, do we have questions for Dr. Dinesh's presentation? Okay, so with this, thank you, Dr. Dinesh. No thank you. Now, we move forward to our next presenter, uh, Dr. S uh, Dr. Sandra Sagar. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my topic for presentation today is comparative evaluation of latent fingerprints using titanium dioxide nanoparticle powder and herbal powder on different surfaces and observational study. Next slide, please. Uh, so first, let's see what latent fingerprints are. Latent fingerprints are traces of sweat, oil, or other natural secretions on the skin, and they are not ordinarily visible. So the uh, application of powders to visualize these fingerprints are necessary. 
fingerprints serve as an excellent evidence as well as helps in DNA extraction. DNA profiling can also be done on fingerprints left on different substrates. So various methods have been described so far in the uh, literature for the development of latent fingerprints. So for my uh, present study, I have selected two herbal powders in comparison with a nanoparticle powder. So the powders used are arrowroot powder, raspberry powder, and titanium dioxide powder. So arrowroot, as we all know, it's a white flavorless powder, most often used to thicken food and is comprised of starches extracted from tropical tubers like Marinta arnesia, the arrowroot plant, and raspberry powder, Rubus idius. It's also a commonly used food product, mainly used for flavoring purposes. Next slide, please. Uh, so, coming to the object of my study, uh, the main uh, aim of my study is that uh, we have to implement simple, simple non-toxic powders for the development of latent fingerprints that can be employed on different substrates for latent fingerprint identification. So, in this study, I have used three powders, namely Maranta Ordinesia, Rubus EDS, and Titanium Dioxide Nanoparticle Powder. And I have evaluated the efficiency of these powders on six different surfaces. Next slide, please. Uh, so coming to the materials and methods, of my study. So I have uh, shown in the picture on the side, the three powders that I have used, that is the raspberry powder, titanium dioxide powder, and the arrowroot powder. So the latent fingerprint analysis was done using the dusting method. Uh, for successful development of the latent fingerprint, powder was first applied to the surfaces by sprinkling powder uh, with the help of a brush, and then lifting the developed prints with the help of a tapping method. So the rich patterns uh, stood out from the contrasting background. And from this, uh, we were able to analyze the fingerprint by dusting off the remaining powder to visualize the clear fingerprint. Then a comparative analysis was done to check which powder was more effective for the development of latent fingerprints on the selected surfaces. Next slide, please. So coming to the results of my study, uh, you can see the results of my study on the site. I have given the pictures. Uh, the below one is the use of raspberry powder on a black surface that is on top of a cardboard sheet. And then you can see the use of arrowroot powder as well as the titanium dioxide nanoparticle powder on boats as well as on slab. And from my study, I have found that titanium dioxide nanoparticle powder as well as rubus EDS, that is the raspberry powder, showed better results while visualizing the latent fingerprints compared to the arrowroot powder. Also, the main advantage of using this uh, herbal powder is that it remains stable and it also had uh, traces remaining stable even if they were subjected to removal. So the main advantage is that uh, this analysis with the help of herbal powders can be used in scenarios where multiple latent fingerprints are required uh, for conclusion. Uh, the, uh, from the results of my study, I can say that easily commonly accessible and less expensive reagents like the household kitchen powders like raspberry powder, arrowroot powder, can act as a beneficial substitute for decrypting the latent fingerprints and can also help in DNA extraction. Thank you. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Sandra. Uh, can we have questions for uh, Dr. Sandra's presentation? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> so have you checked for any DNA profiling, how it is affecting or no? Like the oh, no, I have, I, so far I have done my study, I have uh, evaluated the efficiency of these powders in development of latent fingerprints. So future studies can be done. How far these herbal powders are helpful in DNA extraction, sir? And how, how do you see, like, there are many digital methods already being uh, there, like Forenscope and those instruments, uh, where you can directly take the photographs and of the fingerprints. So how do you see your powders uh, as compared to those digital methods? 
semester, but still in many scenarios in India, like we are using the powders only for developing the latent fingerprints in many crime scenes. So like when we use herbal powders, uh, we can effectively uh, see the latent fingerprints more uh, with a less expensive method than compared to digital methods, which are more expensive for developing the latent fingerprints. Uh. Okay. It will be cost effective too. Uh, thank you, jury member. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandra. Now, uh, with this, we come to the uh, last presentation of uh, professional category e-poster presentation uh, by Dr. Munish Kumar. Dr. Munish Kumar. Hello, ma'am. Ma'am, am, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, you are audible, sir. A very good evening all. Myself, Dr. Manish Kumar, PG resident in the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, VMMC Sabdajang Hospital, New Delhi. Today, I am uh, presenting a case report of choking in aluminum phosphide poisoning. Coming to introduction. Next slide, ma'am. Aluminum phosphide is a widely used pesticide in India. In North India, it is the most preferred chemical utilized to commit suicide. After the ingestion, patients have uh, gastrointestinal mani uh, manifestations like nausea, vomiting, and epigastric pain, cardiovascular symptoms like bradycardia, hypotension, myocarditis, uh, pulmonary edema, and neurological signs and symptoms uh, like headache and dizziness can be seen. A very high mortality rate of 50 to 90 percent has been reported after the ingestion of this poison. Fatal dose has been reported as 0.5 gram in 70 kg adult with mean time interval between poisoning and death being 3 hours with a range of 1 to 48 hours. Generally, a 3 gram, uh, 3 gram aluminum phosphide tablet liberates uh, 1 gram of uh, phosphine gas which results in the interaction and inhibition of intracellular enzymes uh, uh, involved in the metabolic process. Uh, the most important enzyme be, uh, being the cytochrome C oxidase, resulting in the release of hydrogen peroxide and other free radicals. Next, next slide, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, previous one, sorry. Coming to case history, a 28-year-old female presented in the casualty in unconscious and unresponsive state with alleged history of suicidal ingestion of cellphos, which is uh, aluminum phosphide tablets, after a quarrel with her husband, uh, where she was declared broad dead and sent for autopsy in our, in our mortuary. Magistrate inquest was done under the CRPC uh, 176. So, uh, although uh, suicide note was found at the crime scene, and no sign of struggle was found on the body and history of uh, and no history of attempt or episode of vomiting was given uh, given by the relatives after the ingestion of po this poison next slide ma'am coming to case findings on external journal examination uh, the asphyxial sign, uh, findings was was seen like uh, uh, Particular hemorrhages in the sclera and sclera and conjunctiva, congestion over the over this over the face and cyanosis of uh, e lips and the ear lobules was seen. On on opening of the abdominal cavity, a mass of uh, three hundred gram coated with silvery white uh, white color layer and was. Uh, was present in the stomach and was sent, sent for chemical analysis after the confirmation confirmed to be uh, aluminum phosphide by chemical analysis. Stomach mucosa was uh, also very deeply congested and showed brownish black discoloration with garlicky odor into it. On opening of the trachea, four fragmented particles present in uh, uh, along the mucosal lining extending from the epiglottis up to the level uh, up to the level of bifurcation of trachea fragmented uh, particles also sent for chemical analysis which confirmed to be aluminum phosphide lungs was uh, pinkish in color and slightly airless and non crepitant 
these are the uh, autopsy findings of this case uh, as we can see blue arrow showing the epiglottic opening and uh, yellow uh, four yellow colored uh, arrow showing the uh, four fragmented particles of of aluminum phosphide which is uh, which completely occluding the lumen of the trachea and second image showing uh, congestion uh, deeply congestion of wall of stomach and third image showing uh, the march which we recovered from the stomach stomach next slide ma'am coming to conclusion and discussion uh, due to severe gastric irritation which is consistent uh, consistent with the stomach mucosal uh, mucosal wall discoloration as depicted in the picture there was anti peristaltic movement occurred occurred and fragmented particles reached the trachea against the gravity and got stuck as told by relatives the patient uh, patient died within uh, 15 minutes of uh, ingestion which is comparatively smaller uh, smaller than its usual period uh, so we conducted the cause of uh, cause of death uh, as asphyxia due to choking in aluminum phosphide poison, poisoning so uh, uh, while uh, while giving the autopsy uh, 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 while giving the autopsy report we uh, uh, it is very difficult to uh, to give the cause of death as choc choking choking because we we can also consider the amount of aluminum phosphide uh, ingest amount of aluminum phosphide ingested in this in this uh, this case uh, so the final cause of death death we gave the asphyxia uh, asphyxia as a result of antimortem ingestion of aluminum phosphide and uh, aluminum phosphide uh, phosphide also have have some relation some, some relation with the uh, with the dna dna damage as uh, it uh, in uh, in a study barbosa et al in uh, study showed significant increase in mononuclear and, uh, erythrocytes uh, frequency in the bone marrow and uh, spleen lymphocytes in mice and in vitro stud stud study of HEPA 1C, 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 7 cells and determined that uh, exposure of aluminum phosphide causes increase of 8 hydroxy guanyl level, uh, which is a major uh, pre mutagenic lesion generated from the reactive oxygen species. And uh, uh, and aluminum phosphide also uh, also indu induces the uh, induces the uh, chromosomal uh, cr chromosome abrasion and sister chromatid uh, chromatid ex exchange uh, according to the study um, uh, study by Hassan Turker and um, uh, Basak Tagar in the Department of Molecular Bi Molecular Biology and Genetic Faculties uh, and um, and Faculty Science published in uh, like aluminum phosphide induced genetics and oxidative damage in vitro. Uh, thank you, Arvind. Thank you, uh, Dr. Manish. Thank now, uh, we request the jury members, uh, we, do we have questions for Dr. Manish's presentation? So as we have come to the uh, closing of this day one, and uh, today we had a good paper presentation in professional category, as well as the e-poster presentation. I thank you all jury member for taking out their time from a busy schedule and also the chairperson, Professor Teresa. Now I request Professor Teresa to, uh, to accept this token of appreciation from our side. Kritika, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you to all the honorable jury member and the chair uh, and the chairperson for e-poster presentation for your valuable time and handling the sessions. With this, we request to accept our certificate of appreciation to Dr. Uh, to Ma Teresa Day. Guzman, in, in sincere acknowledgement for the outstanding service as chairperson for e-poster presentation at, uh, of the panel at Second International e-conference on the theme DNA Forensics. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. 
also with this we are we are thankful to all uh, honorable jury members uh, with this certificate of appreciation is presented to dr surinder kumar pal sir in recognition of their earnest contribution as jury member for acknowledging the outstanding e poster presentation professional category at second international e conference on theme dna forensics thank you sir thank you dr neeraj neeraj sir in recognition of their earnest contribution as jury member for acknowledging the outstanding e post presentation at professional category at second international e conference on theme dna forensics thank you sir thank you dr kamilesh sir in recognition of their earnest contribution as jury member for acknowledging the outstanding e post presentation professional category at second international e conference on theme dna forensics thank you sir Thank you, Subhashi sir, in recognition of their earnest contribution as jury member for acknowledging the outstanding e-poster presentation professional category at Second International E-Conference on Theme DNA Forensics. Thank you, sir. Thank you, all honorable jury members. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, all the jury member and the chairperson. And now we are coming to the end of the day one. Tomorrow we will start the session again at the same time as per the schedule. uh and uh, with this i like to thank you all my advisory board member dr harsh sharma sir dr rajesh sharma sir dr sanjeev sir chain uh, dr chain dr rakesh koria sir professor emilio dr michael uh, professor nasimul sir dr ev unturo dr maria uh, dr kevin uh, cloyd uh, terry and dr ashwas sir thank you for being a, such a supportive advisory member and giving their input for improvement of uh, all our conferences uh, which we plan for the year your uh, all the suggestions are very valuable for us and uh, by your suggestion we are trying to improve day by day in our upcoming conferences as well uh, i like to thank you my scientific uh, core committee member as well uh, dr ankit sivasa sir uh, dr ritesh shukla sir dr himrata Ma'am, Dr. Somit Sir, Dr. Asis Badiyar, uh, Dr. Sulbi Mathur, Dr. Richard Hathagi, Dr. Niti, Nitin Pandey, Dr. Teresa, Ramandeep, uh, Dr. Kanchana, and Hansi Bansal. These are the uh, members, those who are giving their constant support for development of uh, content related to the forensics, uh, so that we can reach more and more with a more and more quality content to the, all the participants. Thank you, all the core committee member. with this i like to thank you all my scientific team members uh, those who are giving their input uh, on our every uh, conferences and they are uh, spreading the word to the students participants and other people those who are uh, coming to uh, as a participant in our conferences uh, all the scientific team members the list is very long but yes i thank you everyone Uh, uh, professor mukesh takkar sir uh, dr ena bar uh, ena ma'am dr sk pal sir dr ila ma'am dr dennis dr nareesh sir dr jahangir sir dr akhilesh sir dr uh, vivek sehwal sir uh, dr nadeem sir uh, subhashi sir uh, sushmita ma'am uh, vichar sir dr pooja puri dr kritika rajesh uh, dr kamlesh sir dr anush singla ma'am Dr. Vijay Arora sir, uh, Dr. Utsav Parekh uh, sir, uh, Mehbin, Dr. Neeraj sir, Dr. Ruchi Sharma, Seema Patel, uh, Dr. Pragnesh sir, Manish Gupta, Dr. Malvika, Mayank Kumar, Dr. Neeraj sir, Raja sir, Dr. Shweta, uh, Dr. Jayasinta Pillai sir, Dr. Uh, Gurmanti ma'am, uh, Jitendra uh, sir, Dr. Janita and Dr. Preeti Singh sir all the scientific team members your contributions and your suggestions are always valuable for us and uh, we have as i told the, our list is uh, for the scientific member increasing day by day so i like to thank uh, more member like uh, vinish sharma ankesh sahibar dr mukesh sir madhuri dr lalit uh, dr kalpesh jinli vijay kumar uh, yadav sir uh, george dickson and dr jagdish guru Uh, all scientific members uh, thank you for your support and sending more and more present from your organizations and uh, giving your uh, insight full for the improvement of the this with this i like to close this uh, day one and uh, i uh, thank you all the participant all the presenters uh, along with my uh, convener chief uh, mr vijay fanender and i dr rajit singh I thank you all my organizing team member uh, Mahesh Sharma, Sajjad Zain, Afridan, Vaishnavita, Vipratika, 
and our team. So our, although our team is very small, but we are trying to uh, solve whatever the query all the participant and other people have. Organizing team members, uh, uh, like uh, the, those who are the pillar for reaching to the different people on the different platform. So I like to thank you, uh, Thomas sir, uh, Dr. Pooja, Prerna, Ruchika, Tanya, Priya, Palak, <coughs> Pallavi, Aditi, and Sheetal. They, <coughs> they are the one who is reaching to the all social media platform and by that, more and more people are getting connected with us uh, and getting benefited with the knowledge of uh, esteem, the keynote speakers, and getting the idea about the new and new researches going on in the world. Thank you, team. <clears throat> Thank you, my team. And with this, I welcome you all on day two. And uh, tomorrow we have a uh, good uh, presentations as we have the insightful presentation today. And tomorrow we are going to have the Professor Gyanis Ashobe, Dr. Vijay Vivek Sahaspal, sir, Dr. Nira Sai, sir, Robert Green, and uh, dynamic uh, DC Saga, sir. So with this, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, you